Have you read the rules for Warhammer the Old World? Well, if not, you're in luck because today I'm going to sit right here. I'm not going to go anywhere and I'm going to read this entire rule book from cover to cover. I've already taken a dump, so I don't need to leave. I can stay right here and read the whole thing in one video. One sitting, all 353 pages of the Warhammer the Old World rule book. And I'm going to break it up into chapters when I upload this video. I've just opened this book. Literally just opened it. It comes with a reference sheet, but we're not going to read this, okay? Because this book has 353 pages, I'm guessing each page will take me one and a half minutes to read, so that's approximately... 11 hours. The time is 4 p.m. I'm guessing this video will be finished by 3 a.m. tomorrow morning. Let's get into it. That can go over there. And we're ready to rock and roll. I have water and an energy drink with me just in case I get too tired or thirsty, which I'm already feeling a bit thirsty. And I don't want to get up and have to have a leak later on. So here we go. Let's get into it nice and fast. Warhammer the Old World. Fantasy Battles in the World of Legend Rulebook. A lovely little map there. Warhammer the Old World. Prepare yourself to enter a world of battle and death, of violence and madness. Chaos infects this world like a malignant disease from which there can be no recovery. Logic, reason and sanity have no place here. Even the land and the air are suffused with raw magic. Ancient trees come alive. Men devolve into monsters and mysterious citadels rise from the earth at dusk, only to fade away by dawn. In this blasted realm, you will see wonders and horrors alike that you shall carry to the grave. From the north, tribe upon tribe of barbarians and ironclad immortals come, bringing death and destruction in honor of their dark gods. Under the heat of the southern sun, skeletal legions and armies of living statues rise from the desert sands to war eternally with their neighbors and reclaim their lost lands from hosts of Plate armored knights. <clears throat> Across the old world, bestial and nameless things pour out from endless forests to besiege, burn, and topple fortress cities. Orc warlords lead vast mobs of raucous warriors, slime skinned trolls, and ramshackle war engines to endless wars from mountain peak to distant coast. In the earth below, goblin hosts class, clash with unyielding shield wars of grim dwarf tunnel guards who fight daily. For the survival of their cavernous dominions. From the far off lands of the elves, great fleets of elegant ships sail to war, the skies above alight with the fire of legions of dueling dragons. Yet amidst all of the fire, flame and fury, it is a world of mighty heroes, of bold deeds and of great courage. These few champions stand against the encroaching darkness, rallying their warriors with acts of valor and the hope of victory. The deafening roar of battle rises above them all, the sound of a thousand times a thousand brave soldiers crashing body, blade, and shield against the endless hordes of enemies. The fate of the world, be it damnation or salvation, hangs in the balance. This is a world of eternal war and fleeting glory. This is Warhammer, the old world, the game of fantasy battles in a world of legends. Sounds like a lovely place to live. Contents. Oh, here we go. Warhammer the Old World. Introduction. Page 4. What you need. Page 6. The Old World of Legend. In the beginning. Page 10. War Unending. Page 20. Times of Legend. 22. War and Conquest. 31. The Rise of Men. 33. The Coming of Sigma. 40. The Land of Chivalry. 47. Southern Kingdoms. 50. The Enchanted Wood. 57. Lords of Ulthul 1. 61. The Ancestor God. 65. A Green Menace. 69. Tomb Kings of Khemri, 73. The Lost and the Damned, 77. The Beasts of the Forest, 80. The Wolves of the Sea, 82. Land of Ice and Snow, 84. Ruled by Dragons, 86. The Rules. Overview of the Game, 91. General Principles, 92. Measurement, 92. Dice, 93. Templates, 95. Model Profiles, 96. Characteristics Profile, 96. Split Profiles, 97. Characteristics of Zero, 97. Characteristic tests, 97. Other model information, 98. Forming units, 100. Formation types, 100. Close order formation, 100. Removing casualties, 102. Single wound models, 102. Multiple wound models, 102. Removing casualties from units, 102. Model and unit facing, 103. Line of sight, 103. Troop types at a glance, 104. Categories of troop type, 104. Troop type table, 105. Unit strength, 105. Magic, 106. 
Wizards 106. Casting spells 108. Dispel 110. Spell resolution 111. Core rules 114. The turn sequence 115. The strategy phase 116. The movement phase 118. The one inch rule 118. Movement in detail 123. Basic movement 123. Maneuvers 124. The charge move 126. Unusual situations charging 128. Accidental contact 131. Flee, 132. Give ground, 134. Fall back in good order, 134. Oddball stuff. Movement, 134. Terrain in movement, 135. The shooting phase, 136. Oddball stuff, 130, 143. The combat phase, 144. The combat phase sequence, 144. 1. Choose and fight combat, 145. 2. Calculate combat result, 151. 3. Break test, 154. 4. Follow up in pursuit, 156. Oddball stuff, combat, 158. Terrain in combat, 159. The psychology of war, 160. Panic test, 160. Thanks to Creative Assembly for the cafe art on pages 86 to 87, which apparently we're not getting anymore. Warhammer the Old World rulebook. Copyright Games Workshop Limited to 2023. Warhammer the Old World Citadel Forge World Games Workshop GW Warhammer The Winged Hammer. Warhammer logo and all associated logos, illustrations, images, names, creatures, races, vehicles, locations, weapons, characters, and the distinctive likeness thereof are either R or TM and or Games Workshop Limited. Variably registered around the world, all rights reserved. No part of this publication may be reproduced, stored in a retrieval system, or transmitted in any form or by any means electronic, mechanical, photocopying, recording, or otherwise without the prior permission of the publishers. This is a work of fiction. All the characters and events portrayed in this book are fictional, and any resemblance to real people or in incidents is purely coincidental. British Cataloging in Publication Data. A catalog record for this book is available from the British Library. Pictures for illustrative purposes only. Games Workshop website, www.warhammer.com. Forge World website, www.forgeworld.co.uk. Advanced Rules, 164. Special Rules, 165. Unusual Formations, 182. Open Order Formation 182, Skirmish Formation 184, Troop Types in Detail 188, Infantry 190, Cavalry 192, Chariots 194, Monsters 196, War Machines 197, Command Groups 198, Champions 199, Standard Bearers 200, Musicians 201, Characters 202, The General 203, The Battle Standard 203, Characters and Troop Type 204, Mounted Characters 204, Characters and Formations 205, The Lone Characters 206, Characters and Units 207, Challenges 210, Weapons of War, 212. Combat Weapons, 213. Missile Weapons, 216. Armor, 220. Unusual Armor, 221. Additional Equipment, 221. War Machines, 222. Bolt Throwers, 223. Stone Throwers, 224. Cannon, 226. Organ Guns, 228. Mortars, 228. Fire Throwers, 229. Battlefield Terrain, 268. How Much Terrain, 268. Placing Terrain, 268. Categories of Terrain, 269. Special Features, 272. Warhammer Armies, 276. Points, Values, and Size of Game, 276. The Muster List, 276. Army Lists, 277. Percentages, 278. Number of Units, 278. Mercenaries, 279. Allied Contingents, 280. And Regimental Units and Detachments, 282. Warhammer Battles, 284. Setting up your Battlefield, 285. Deployment, 285. First Turn, 286. Game Length, 286. Victory Points, 286. Pitch battle scenarios 287, the plane of Langui 288, the doom of Odo Todmeyer III 290, the battle of Pine Crags 292, the Drac World Forest Incident 294, the battle of Gisoro Gap 296, the Lonely Tower 298, campaign battles 300, campaign trees 300, league campaigns 301, narrative battles 302, open play 303. The Games Master, 304. Forging Narrative, 305. Linked Battles, 307. Example Narrative Scenarios, 307. Realms of Magic, 316. Laws of Magic, 319. Battle Magic, 320. Demonology, 322. Dark Magic, 324. Elementalism, 326. High Magic, 328. Illusion, 330. Necromancy, 332. Wow, Magic, 334. Magic Items 336, Using Magic Items 336, Magic Weapons 338, Magic Armor 340, Talismans 341, Magic Standards 341, Enchanted Items 342, Arcane Items 343. Quick Reference 344 to 349, Index 350. Introduction. Welcome to the Old World. Sound the trumpets and beat the loud drums of war, for the weighty tome you hold in your hands is key to entering a dark and bloody land. It is a world of demons and sorcery. A brutal era of warfare and conquest, Warhammer the Old World, the game of fantasy battles, brings all the action onto your tabletop. You command 
Armies of miniatures in a game that promises bold maneuver, daring riposte, and untold slaughter. The old world is land torn asunder by strife and conflict. From the fertile farmlands of civilized nations to the arid wastelands of the untracked wilderness, armies march to the beat of drums and the blaring of horns beneath a canopy of resplendent banners and gleaming standards. All across the old world, the nations of men, dwarfs, and elves defend their borders against the hordes of armored warriors and marauders that flow from the north, worshippers of the dark gods that seek only to topple civilization. From within, they are beset by tribes of orcs and goblins, yet endlessly raid and make war for war's sake, and by the corrupted beasts of the deep dark forest, the children of chaos. Across the oceans of the world, the high elves of Ulthuan fight a bitter, centuries-long war against their twisted kin, the dark elves. To the south lie the sandy realms of the undying tomb kings, who guard the riches of their necropolis cities from plundering raiders and threaten the lands of the living with their eternal might. The Warhammer Hobby. Warhammer, the old world, is a game unlike any other because it is so much more than a game. It is an engaging and engrossing pastime, a hobby with a host of different aspects. There are armies of citadel miniatures to collect and paint, fantastical battlefields to create, a rich history to explore, and endless gaming challenges. It is a hands-on hobby limited only by the bounds of your imagination. If all this sounds like a lot of work, it is. But glory won lightly is no glory at all. How this book works. This book contains everything you need to know in order to play games of War Warhammer The Old World on your tabletop. For ease of navigation, the book is divided into the following main sections. The Warhammer World. The Warhammer World is a strange magical realm full of battle and strife. This section provides histories tales of the major epochs and a glimpse at the many realms and nations of the world during the era in which the action is set. The rules. This section lays out the full rules for how to move, shoot, cast magic and fight with your models. In addition to the core how to play rules, you will find advanced rules for monsters, heroes, weapon types, allies, army selection rules and of course how to go about fighting a battle. Miniatures Showcase. This glorious section shows off a fantastic assortment of Citadel miniatures from the Warhammer range. There are examples from many armies displaying lavishly painted models from the talented members of the world famous Heavy Metal Team. Looking through this section should inspire anyone. Warhammer Battles. The final section is all about putting the rules, background of them and the models together. In addition to tips about setting up and playing your own games, you'll find a range of exciting scenarios to play, along with advice of running your own campaign and recreating or inspiring legendary battles. What you need. Between yourself and your opponent, you'll need the following items to recreate the bloody battles of Warhammer the Old World, of the Warhammer world. Armies of Citadel miniatures. Both you and your opponent will need an army to lead in the battle. Warhammer the Old World has many armies to choose from, and each force is different and characterful in its own right. But best of all, each army can be built in countless combinations. Players can choose their favorite models, exploit a favorite game tactic, or collect as their whims dictate. No two armies need be alike. When first learning how to play, you will find yourself consulting this very rulebook often. But fear not, after a few games the bulk of the rules will become second nature and you will soon find that you only need to look up an occasional reference or find a clarification for an unusual situation. Take measure. The bounce of a cannonball, the flight of a griffin, the charge of a regiment of knights, or the range of a wizard's fireball are all measured in inches. Ugh. This is heavy. A tape measure or ruler marked in inches is therefore a necessity. Battlefield. A battlefield. Any flat surface can become the battlefield for armies to fight over. A dedicated playing space is ideal, but a kitchen table, flat workbench, large desk, or even the floor will do. To do this, you might wish to add a number of terrain features, making your tabletop better resemble a field of battle in a fantasy realm. Terrain. For games of Warhammer the Old World, you will need only a few choices. Choice pieces of terrain, such as forests, rivers, or the heap skull totems of a barbaric race. Warhammer armies, consisting of tightly regimented formations, prefer to do battle across open fields where possible. However, a wise and cunning general will use terrain to their benefit. 
protecting a vulnerable flank with defense, dense forests, advancing skirmishes through rough ground, and so on. Templates. Some weapons, such as stone throwers, affect a large area and can destroy many models at once. By placing a template, players can determine how many models are hit. See page 95. Dice. Warhammer the Old World uses six-sided dice to work out effects such as combat and shooting. A few differently colored dice are handy to work out specific roles for heroes. You will also need an artillery dice and a scatter dice to work out certain spell and war machine effects. See page 95. Pen and paper. In the midst of battle, it is easy for, to forget small details. Having a pen and paper handy on which to jot down how many wounds have been inflicted upon large monsters, or which unit has been cursed with an ongoing spell, will allow you to get on with the game instead of trying to remember minutia. No idea what that means. The World of Legend. The War... The world of Warhammer is a battle-scarred and dangerous place. Around every corner, down every darksome alley, and behind the bowl of every twisted tree lurks deadly threats and evil things. For the unwary, the opportunities to encounter a sudden and gruesome end are plentiful. Across the old world, mighty kings and powerful warlords raise glorious armies and grim hordes without number. These rival hosts march to unceasing war, feet stomping, to thunderously beating drums, heads held high beneath glittering pennants and ragged banners. Bold heroes stride forth to battle the evil creatures that lurk in the wilds and drive back the forces of chaos and destruction. The pages that follow explore rich stories and dramatic rivalries that lie beneath, behind the many conflicts enacted upon the battlefield, setting the scene for your own battles and offering a taste of each of the races and factions you may encounter. In the beginning, the world has not always been ruled by the races that battle over it today. It was once a cold and desolate place, a home to great beasts of forgotten legend. For unknown millennia, these creatures vied for supremacy, and for millennia more, this might have continued. Alas, when an enigmatic race of starfarers rode down from the heavens aboard flaming chariots, the world was set upon a new path. The Time of Dragons. The history of the world began long before men forged their empires upon the land, before dwarfs carved their cavernous domains beneath the mountains, even before elves first plied the ocean waves. An epoch ago, as it turned slowly under a cold and distant sun, the world was populated by gigantic beasts. Cold-blooded gargants stalked the mountain peaks. Great blind behemoths tunneled beneath the earth. Segmented leviathans swam beneath the waves and more besides. Far from unthinking, many of these elder creatures held their own domains and ambitions. And for long aeons, the ground shook as titanic monsters warred. Of all these strange breeds, it was the intelligent and articulate, vicious and ruthless race of dragons that ruled supreme over the primal world. They soared between the mountain peaks, bringing war to the gargants, made their colossal lairs within the underground realms of behemoths, and hunted above the ocean waves preying upon the leviathans as they preyed upon one another. Yet despite their preeminence, dragons were ill-prepared for the arrival of, of beings beyond their boundaries of their own meager reality. The age of dragons was not to last, becoming the old ones. Mysterious in origin and near omnipotent in nature, the race known only as the old ones had plied the depths of the cosmos in magnificent silvered ships since time itself began. They had looked upon the world from above and found it to be good. By their reckoning, this world might play an important role in destiny, a place where great powers would vie for supremacy. They saw in the world the seed of something unknown and as yet unknowable, ripe with the promise of new realms and realities that might in some distant future erupt from the fires of destruction and chaos that would come to ravage this reality. For how long the old ones watched and studied their prize from afar, laying plans that would irrevocably change the very stuff of reality no one can even guess. Perhaps mere moments passed between their discovery of the world and the commencement of their great works. Perhaps they hung unseen in the heavens for eons, watching the great beasts far below make endless war on one another. Whatever the case, when the Old Ones stepped into the world, it was as if the gods themselves had set foot upon the soil. Their mere 
presence, proving a catalyst to changes that would spell the doom of the creatures that walked the world before them. Reforging the world. At the poles of the world, great gates were constructed through which the servants of the Old Ones rode from realms unknown upon Zephyrs of magical power. They brought with them great machines of arcane science, world-building engines with which they would reform the lands and the seas into more pleasing geometries. I'm a, they're a poet, and they didn't know it. The first of these servants were the Slan, corpulent and toad-like, yet possessing profound knowledge of matters both philosophical and scientific. The Slan were the chief engineers of the Old One's plan, and it was they who interpreted the Old One's will and committed their instructions onto sacred plaques, crystallized from pure thought. At the bidding of their masters, the Slan manipulated the world engines and steered the planet's path toward the warming light of its distant sun. In the turmoil of this great undertaking, mountains were shattered and rebuilt. Land masses were moved upon their foundations in accordance with ancient prophecies and patterns, and oceans were drained and created anew. The Slan, in turn, were severed by multitudinous legions of lizard men, spawned in their millions to serve as laborers and warriors. Vast armies of lizard men marched across the swiftly evolving face of the world. They felled forests, shaped rock, and raised vast temple cities towards the heavens, majestic monuments in which the Slan would reside. And they battled these monstrous denizens of the prehistoric world that had survived the coming of the Old Ones, driving the gargantuan beasts into desperate flight to cower in the deepest and darkest corners of the world, lest they face utter annihilation. The young races, as the lizard men labored, the old ones turned their attention to populating the paradise they were creating, bringing many new races into being. Some believe they hoped to determine which traits were the most important for a successful and long-lived civilization. Others suspect the young races were created only to protect their paradise realm from some, some unknown threat. First among the young races were the elves. Blessed with dexterity, intelligence, and grace, they easily learned the skills of civilization and showed tremendous aptitude for controlling the constant flow of magic that entered the world through the polar gates. The elves were soon joined by the dwarves, beings in many ways their opposite. Dwarves were doughty and stalwart folk, resistant to magic, but skilled workers of metal and stone. Surging in great numbers from the barren wastelands of the world came orcs and goblins, crude creatures more interested in fighting one another and hunting prey than in the ways of civilization. They had come to the world aboard the mighty vehicles of the Old Ones, stowed away in secret, and they had prospered greatly upon the warm and lush world. Later came the race of men, adaptable and prolific, so vital and in ingenious they would easily adjust to almost any environment. Lastly, were perhaps the most unfinished of all the Old Ones creations, the somewhat vulgar races of the halflings and the ogres. Radically different in size and strength, but remarkably resistant to the baleful lure of the magical world. The Cataclysm. Oh, there we go. Unbeknownst. To the old ones, toiling upon their great works, disaster loomed. To drive their world-building engines and facilitate their interstellar travels, the old ones relied upon sorcerer's power, drawn from an ultimate dimension, one that lay beyond the physical reality they themselves occupied. In ages long past, the old ones have learnt of this etheric otherworld and tapped into its limitless reserves of raw magic. Over the long l l millennia of study, they had reasoned that by opening gateways into the roiling heart of the aether, they might travel almost instantaneously through these interstellar deeps. In this assumption, they were correct, and in time, they constructed a great network of gateways and tunnels through the magical realm, linking together the many worlds of their vast cosmic empire. What the Old Ones had failed to comprehend was the power of the beings that inhabited this reality. Vast and predatory creatures dwelled within the Aether, creatures that simultaneously, simultaneously resented the intrusion of the Old Ones onto their domain, and hungered for the warmth and vitality of the Old One's alien realm. Creatures of pure energy and emotion, the denizens of the Aether were drawn towards the vibrant energy of the young world, and they gathered close about the gateways of the Old Ones. They peered through the metaphorical veil that separated the dimensions, whispering promises and lies to the creatures that dwelt there. Carried upon the winds of magic that flowed endlessly through the gateways, these whispers reached the ears of both 
those beasts and that survived from the bygone era and the young races alike. Where they were heard, these whispers seduced and corrupted the minds of many, luring them into the worship of ruinous powers that crept into their dreams, masquerading as benef beneficent gods. Upon every mortal soul corrupted, the creatures of the Aether fed hungrily and grew in power. As, their power grew, as grew their power, so grew their hunger, and they pressed ever more forcefully against the barriers that separated them from the sustenance they craved. Under the relent... The unrelenting pressure of these entities' attention, the portals above the poles of the world, each larger than a mountain, began to bend and break, eventually collapsing in an epoch-shattering implosion. In an instant, the gates were replaced by a boiling sea of chaos where the physical world and other world, the other world overlapped, a yawning chasm in the snuff of reality, revealing the realm of chaos that lay beyond. In that moment, the old ones disappeared from the old world. Their tenuous connection to this realm severed with absolute finality. Whether they were slain by the psychic trauma of the event or merely banished into a distant shadow realm, none can say. In the suddenness of their departure, the Old Ones left a great void which the forces of chaos rushed to fill. And all that remained in their wake were the ghostly echoes of their former greatness, vague memories of what they had been. The, cosm uh, the coming of chaos. Where once the polar gates had stood, an impossible wound in the fabric of reality now gaped, spewing raw chaos into the world, which co coalesced upon contact with reality into the unnatural black rock known as Warpstone. So great was the eruption that a new moon was formed in the heavens above the young world. Morris Lieb, the chaos moon, with the birth of this evil satellite, the world was rocked in its orbit and the land masses shook upon their foundations while the ever-growing tear in reality threatened to consume everything and the worst had barely yet begun. From the tortured heavens, pulsing comets fell upon the trembling earth, contrails of unlight flaring in their wake as they plummeted towards the vibrant green lands below. They crashed into the world, felling endless tracts of forest and burying themselves inside massive craters of scorched earth. With each impact, the land was infected further by raw stuff of chaos. Its insidious taint worked, out to wood in, worked outward into the fertile soil, suckled upon by the roots of ancient trees and seeped into the air, breathed by the nomads and the beasts that populated the lands. As chaos permeated all, the forest stirred, wreathing with malign, ma malign, malign energies. Weird calls echoed from the trees as the woods thrashed with rampant growth. Strange and terrible processes were enacted in that dank, boiling cauldron of fecundity. The primitives of the region, the beasts of the forest, were somehow mated. Their terrible offspring born and mated again, generation after generation, coming into being, indiscriminately reproducing and eventually dying in an uncontrolled and rapid procession. From the great roiling storm of magic that surged in the heavens above, riding upon the unleashed winds of magic that blew, a hurricane gale about the doomed world came a coruscating army of a billion fiends. These demonic creatures of the magical realm, servants of the ruinous powers that dwelt within the Aether, given life by the nightmares of mortals, were set loose upon a plane of existence on which they should never have trod. As the disaster unfolded, the oldest and wisest of the slant mage priests acted. Through a monumental outpouring of arcane might, they halted the tearing of the material realm. Wrestling with forces greater than anything they had encountered before, the land stabilized the globe, slowing its erratic flight through the angry heavens and setting it back upon its correct orbit around its distant sun. So great was the effort that many of the oldest land expired even as they battled to halt the cataclysm. Hundreds more died in the days that followed, their vitality consumed by their efforts to hold the demonic invaders, hold back the demonic invaders. Those who remained possessed only a fragment of the wisdom of their elders. They did not know the deeper secrets of the Old Ones. They were not masters of the Aether and they could not traverse the interstellar deeps. Of the geomantic web, arcane construction of their forebears, they understood only rudimentary details and they had not the knowledge of their master's great plans. By events beyond their reckoning, they had inherited a duty beyond their means, the preservation of the world and the completion of the Old Ones' great plan. Chaos had come to the world and its defenders had been utterly overwhelmed. A war against chaos. With the great cataclysm, a terrible war began. Faced with the annihilation, the remaining slain rallied, mustering armies of lizard men such 
of such size, their like has not been seen in the world since. Wow, this is only page 14. We've been recording for 30 minutes. Oh, 13, 14 pages in 30 minutes. Wow. Ugh. These armies marched forth to meet the demo demon legions in battles that spanned continents, lasted centuries, and claimed untold lives. E even as the lizard men met demonic tide with primordial ferocity, the slain harnessed the rampant magical energies to fuel spells of unprecedented destruction. They gulped in the magic-infused air and belched forth firestorms, unleashed tidal waves, and split the earth asunder to lay waste to the invaders. But demonic reinforcements continued to flow into the world, and the balance began to shift. The slain felt their powers weaken as the roar and chaotic magic that flooded the world grew ever harder to control. While the, while the unconstrained winds of magic were wore heavily upon the slan, sapping their strength, they invigorated the demonic legions, for they were born of the unnatural stuff and could readily shape it for their own use. As the magical supremacy shifted, so too did the war. Yet the war was not fought by the servants of the old ones alone. Across the seas, the young races, the elves of Ultuan and the dwarves of the old world had not been idle. In the centuries that followed the Great Cataclysm, these races had grown strong through hardship and their armies stood firm in the defense of their lands. The children of Grungni, Grungni. In the World's Edge Mountains, Grungni, the first of warfare and ancestor god of his race, had long ago warned his people that a time of great peril might come. In his wisdom, he had commanded them to take refuge deep beneath the mountains where they had sheltered as the Great Cataclysm unfolded. When the tempest had finally passed, the dwarfs had emerged once more from their vast underground realm and found the world above a very different place. The sky was dark and the land barren. Mutated beasts and unnatural monstrosities prowled the mountain peaks and besieging armies gathered hung hungrily outside mighty dwarf built gates. Yet the hordes of chaos quickly found that the dwarves were far from defenseless and eager to reclaim the lands they had once worked. In their long years beneath the mountains. Can this like open up more? Not really. In the long years beneath the mountains, Grugni had taught his people to inscribe magical runes on the creatures of chaos that assaulted them. And Valaya, wife of Grugni, had used her protections to ward off the dark magic of their enemies, dampening their dread powers. But it was Grimnir, the blazing warrior god of the dwarves, who would lead his people to war. With their rage filled and wrathful champion at their fore, Mighty dwarf throngs spilled forth from their strongholds. These mighty hosts marched across the continent, spanning mountain ranges of the old world, slaying demons and routing armies of mutant savages. Where Grimnir led, his warriors followed, and the hordes of chaos trembled. Chosen of Asur, far from the world's edge mountains, the salvation of the elves and the island nation of Ultuman came in the form of Anarion. A wanderer who had long travelled the world, witnessing firsthand the growing might of chaos and returning to Ulthawan in, in its time of need. Finding his once fair homeland war-torn ruined, Enarion turned to Asur, 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 Asurian, the creator god, for aid. Over many long days, he burned countless offerings in the sacred flame of Asurian's shrine. But if the god heard, he gave no sign. Finally, in desperation, Inarion cast himself bodily into the sacred fire, offering his own life as if Asurian would save his people. By some miracle, Inarion emerged from the flame unscathed and transformed. The spirit of Asurian had entered him, filling him with radiance that all could see. Inarion had become the vessel of a transcendent power, and when he spoke, elves hastened to obey. With the great mage Kalador, dragon tamer at his side, Enarion oversaw the training of Elven warriors and the raising of Ultuan's armies. For a century or more, Enarion, now crowned Phoenix King by his people, rode to war against the demonic legions mounted upon the great dragon Indrognir. Behind him rode the princes of Ultuan, each mounted atop a great worm. And behind each of these marched the serried ranks of Ultuan's gleaming host, Led by their king, the elven armies won many glorious victories, driving the foul hordes of chaos back from the borders of Ulthawan. In the distant east, the lands that would one day come to be known as Grand Cathay found salvation in the form of a being more ancient and more powerful than any mere god or demon. Since before the coming of the old ones, the celestial dragon had ruled in the east. 
an apex predator before which all others had bowed. When the old ones had first stepped upon the world, changing the shape of the lands and seas, the celestial dragon had chosen caution and avoided confrontation. Where others of his kind had fought the old ones, he had learned their ways. As the world grew warm and became saturated with magic, he studied their arcane sciences, becoming a hidden master of their arts. When the ruinous powers began to whisper their promises into his slumbering mind, the wise and thoughtful celestial dragon pondered their words and saw in them only the threat of coming destruction and despair. He looked at the humans now populating his land, simple but respectful creatures, and knew that his honor required him to protect them and lead them through the trials ahead. So it was that the celestial dragon defended his lands against the rampaging demonic legions. Together with his mate, the moon dragon, and their nine draconic children, he did battle with the demonic legions, driving them from his lands. And for his efforts, the young races of Cathay learned to shun gods and demons and to bow down before the dragons. Relic priests, in the wake of the defense of Itza, Lord Croak's loyal skink attendants lamented the death of their almighty master whose body was scattered far and wide. Diligently, the skinks collected every last scrap of that ravaged body, and with great reverence, the remains were swathed in resin-soaked wrappings. Thus was created the first of many relic priests. The lizardmen have found the spirits of departed slain so powerful that they often linger near their former bodies, and in times of need, a relic priest is brought forth from hidden crypts to enact once more the great plan of the old ones. The fall of Itza. Despite many victories by the armies of the Order, the demonic legions continued to assail the world and as the war ground on and decades turned into centuries, wave upon wave of demons, each more numerous than the last, sought to topple the servants of the Old Ones. The armies of the Slain were forced ever back, relinquishing their tropical paradise realm to the ravages of chaos and retreating into the shelter of their temple cities. Here they fought a furious defense against a besieging enemy, protected by magical wards so potent that no demon should ever breach them. Yet, breach them the demons did. Slowly, at first, the demonic attacks weakened the defenses of the temple cities. But as the years wore on and the ferocity of the assaults increased, the damage caused to the defenses grew whilst the strength of this land waned. The first temple city to fall was Sahutek, its wards collapsing in a kaleidoscopic explosion. Once the first temple city fell, others quickly followed until eventually the demonic legions massed at the walls of Itza. The first city and linchpin of this land's arcane defenses, Itza was under the protection of Lord Croak who also happens to look like a frog. How creative. Lord Croak, the first land to have gazed upon the world and the mightiest of mages, a great dome of energy surrounded Itza, crackling with Croak's power, turning demons to dust as they rallied against it. Yet after years of strain, even Lord Croak could sustain such mystic walls no longer. And with a final surge, the land exploded the barrier outwards, flattening the jungle for many leagues around. A hundred thousand demons were banished in an instant, but the hundreds of thousands that remained swarmed into Itza. Okay. Of all, of all that long war, no battle was fiercer than the one... The, what? No battle was fiercer than one fought in the streets of Itza. Only an epic, I mean, epic, only an epic stand by Lord Croak's armies prevented the demons from overrunning the Great Pyramid. Many days and nights, lizardmen warriors stood firm on the lofty bridge of stars while, whilst Lord Croak gathered its power. As the last of the defenders was cut down, the slain encountered spells that were the preserve of gods and fire rained from the heavens, banishing demons by the million. Time stood still as the fabric of the universe strained against the unleashed power. Yet eventually, Lord Croak faltered, and a host of greater demons, the mightiest servants of the ruinous powers, descended from all points of the compass upon the slain's corporeal form, tearing it apart in a moment of primal fury. So powerful was Lord Croak that its spirit refused to succumb to the death of its mortal vessel. Set free of its flesh, Croak's will became a roiling storm of tremendous power that descended upon the city with fury, scouring the invaders with a divine light that was like a second sun. 
The first city was saved and the transcendent land immediately began devising spells that would banish the hordes of chaos from the world forever. But they failed because everyone knows about the end times. Chaos banished them from the world forever. The wrath of Grimnir. Far from Lustria, the armies of the dwarves appeared, undefeatable with Grimnir at their head, where the ancestor god led. Whole armies of demons were vanquished. And before his wrath, mutants and degenerate beasts fled. Yet for every victory won, the price was great and the grief felt. For every fallen dwarf warrior weighed heavily upon Grimnir's heart, filling him with anger and guilt. Long did Grimnir brood, blaming himself for the terrible losses suffered by his people and questioning his worthiness as their protector. So melancholic became the ancestor that he refused to hear the wise counsel of his kin. Grumji, Grumni and Valaya, and his mood grew ever darker. In the depths of his brooding, Grimnir formed a plan to end the woes of his people and defeat the hordes of chaos without further loss of dwarf lives. The dwarves have heard the dwarves had heard tell from their distant ally, Calador Dragon Tamer, the old one's polar gates of their collapse, and of the roaring portal into the realm of chaos that now stood in their place. Grimnir swore an oath that he would travel beyond this portal and challenge the gods of chaos. The commanders of the demonic legions invading his realm and slaying his people in their own hellish domain and should he stand victorious, close and seal the broken portal from the outer side, other side, so that no more demons might enter the world. Hmm. Upon hearing Grimnir's plan, his kin, were, his kin were horrified. They saw in his quest only death and told him as much. But Grimnir would not be swayed from his path, declaring that to atone for his failings and to avenge the many dwarfs laid low fighting in his name, he was honor bound to seek a mighty doom. In preparation for his lonely journey north, Grimnir took rough shears and cut his long beard short and drew his bright, drew his bright red hair into fearsome spikes with animal fat. Next, he stripped his body of his armor and had powerful runes of protection and vengeance tattooed upon his skin. Finally, he gave one of his great rune inscribed axes to Morgren, his firstborn son, who, despite Grimnir's protestations, followed his father, insisting that someone must accompany him on his journey to the north and record the success or failure of his quest. Reluctantly, Grimnir left his people to do battle with the gods of chaos. Oh, agreed, and the pair left their hold, singing a mournful dirge. So it was that Grimnir left his people to do battle with the gods of chaos, passing from history and into legend. Put your trust in stone and iron. Stone and iron have always been true friends of the dwarfs. An old dwarf saying. Oh. The Great Undertaking in Ulta One. Oh, man. The Great Undertaking in Ulta One. The peace won by Anarion's. Oof. I'd like that light to be on my book, you know? I would really like that light to be on my book. On my book. Let's go. Come on. Down you go, light. Down you go. There we go. That's what we want to see. Lovely. Love your work. Fantastic. Okay. That is very bright. That is like ridiculously bright. Wow. Okay. Maybe not. Maybe you can just sort of go that way, yeah? Yeah, cool. All right. That's better, I think. Very good. Okay. There we go. In Ulta 1, the peace won by Ainarion's armies was to prove both fragile and short-lived when demons overran the Prince of Avalon, Astariel, ever queen of Ulta 1 and wife to Ainarion was slain. Worse, of the royal couple's children, no trace could be found, and it was believed that they had been stolen away by the hordes of chaos. So great was Anarion's anguish. Yeah, I mean, you would be pretty anguished, wouldn't you? Oh, 44. Wow, 44 minutes, and we're on page 18. It's only been an hour. Oh. So great was Anarion's anguish that... He that at this loss that his mind became fractured. In his madness and grief, the Phoenix King mounted in Dragonir and rode for the Blighted Isle. There he stood before the altar of Cain, the god of war and death, and drew the Widowmaker. Oh, this is bad. I know this story. A weapon of terrible power that had waited embedded in the Blackstone since the beginning of time. As old as the world itself, the Widowmaker was the ultimate weapon. And it was called Widowmaker? Really? 
Death itself made manifest, a splinter of the fell weapon wielded by the death god Cain, capable of slaying mortals and gods alike. Upon Anarion's return, those elves most embittered by the war flocked to his side, and the brooding phoenix king set up court in the dismal land of Nagarith, for a time wielding the Widowmaker. Anarion was all but undefeatable, an avatar of death that slew enemies by the thousand as he led his grim warriors against the demonic armies. Yet despite Anarion's victories, demonic hosts continued to assemble on the borders of Uthuan, and it became obvious to all but the phoenix king that the war was lost, and Uthuan was doomed. Wow. Okay. There we go. All right. It was Kalidor Dragon Tamer, wisest and most ancient of sorcerers, who would devise a plan of salvation for his people. Fully aware of Anarion's incipient madness and fearing that his king would blindly lead the armies of Ultimate into destruction, Kalidor and his fellow mages. Kalidor and his fellow mages devised a plan to create a cosmic vortex which they hoped would drain the magic from the world and with it the demons who rode upon its fury. It was a desperate plan with little hope of success and great potential for catastrophe but many thought it preferable to slowly descending into the madness of the Phoenix King whilst Uthuan and perhaps even the world faced certain destruction before the gathering of the hordes of chaos. At Kalidor's instruction, a vast pattern of waystones was erected around Uthuan, their careful placement augmenting the power of network of far older stones, each a node of power within the geomantic web created long ago by the Sevens of the Old Ones. With the waystones complete, Kalidor and his mate is gathered upon the Isle of, of the Dead to undertake a great ritual to awaken their power. Yet even as the ritual progressed, a demonic host of unprecedented size descended upon Uthuan, where it was met by the wrath of Anarion. Nice. We, sons of Grubni, may have drunk deep from the bitter waters of misfortune, but yet we survive. Whilst a single dwarf draws breath, we will fight the evils that assail us, and we will never ever give up. Hank Stonebelly, Dwarf Longbeard. A new age. Whether it was the arcane mastery of Lord Croak, the heroism of Grimnir, or Kalidor's great ritual that turned the tide of the long war, none could say. In truth, either thanks to the invention of some unknown cosmic power or due to a humble but serend serendipitous twist of fate. These acts of defiance in the face of chaos converged, and the storm of magic had raged for more than a thousand years subsided. In the intermediate aftermath of Kalidor's great ritual, as the tumult of battle died and the surviving elves gulped deep, deep breaths of the suddenly still cool air, Anarion, visibly wounded almost unto death, mounted in drug near once more, proclaiming that he would return the Widowmaker to the dread altar from which he drew it. None spoke out, too shaken were they by the battle they had fought and the ritual they had witnessed. Whew. Oh. Uh, of Kalidor and his mages, there was no sign. Where they had stood raged a vortex of arcane power burning with all the colors of magic. In the days that followed, seers and scholars would begin the task of trying to understand the ritual and the vortex, but they never truly would. Of Anarion, nothing more was seen. In time, the elves were left little choice but to acknowledge that the first Phoenix King was lost to them, and a successor was selected. Belshanar, the explorer, who would travel the world, founding many elven colonies and striking alliances with other races. Thousands of miles away in the world's edge mountains, Dwarf throngs marched once more, hunting the mutant beasts and chaos-worshipping savages that lingered in their lands. They too would explore the world, pushing north and east to found no more holds, and in time they would renew their acquaintance with the elves as they built settlements along the coasts of the old world. In Lustria, the surviving slan began the impossible task of setting the world to rights. They knew not what had happened or what the future held and for all their wisdom, could envisage no other plan than to set about the ensuring, ensuring the Old One's great plans were enacted. Yet with the passing of the oldest of their kind, those that had conversed with the Old Ones directly, the young slan that remained would never truly comprehend the subtleties of their lost master's plans, and whatever the dream of the Old Ones had been, it would never be realized. 
And yet, perhaps this was what the old ones had dreamed of. Perhaps this was what they had foreseen all along. The coming of chaos, their demise, and the birthing of a world in which mighty powers would battle, where great legends would unfold and great acts of heroism would play out. A world which would live long in the memories of gods and mortals, but which, in the fullness of time, would transcend beyond the humble reality it occupied and through the fire of its death reveal new plans of existence. Rune magic. Dwarves are not magical creatures, and unlike other races of the world, they have not developed spellcasters or shamans. In fact, dwarves have an innate resistance to magic, both its effects and the overt corruptions it is known to cause in weaker races. Dwarf legends claim their sturdy origins from rock itself leaves the stuff of chaos little to find purchase upon, and while they have no truck with wizardry, dwarves have no equal when it comes to forging magic items. They alone have mastered the art of binding the winds of magic through runecraft. War unending. The world was once an ice-clad jewel in the heavens, nurtured by beings older than time. To look upon this world was to witness the hopes of forgotten gods made manifest. Above lush jungles, winged lizards soared. White-crested crest, white mountains grazed the heavens. Sapphire blue oceans caressed the lands under endless turquoise skies. For a while, the world knew harmony. Then came chaos. The great cataclysm shook the firmament with such force its echoes still pervade and always will. All semblance of tranquility was blasted away in an instant. A screaming gale of raw magic enveloped the lands and the beasts that dwelled within, remaking them into forms disturbing and unclean. Today, the ordered kingdoms of the world face constant adversity. Their bustling fortress cities ever besieged by barbaric and murderous enemies eager to desecrate and destroy these monuments to civilization. Under storm-racked skies, surging legions clash. Battle lines slammed together with the force of tidal waves. Roaring behemoths slumbered out of their lairs. And evil warlocks summoning searing conflagrations of raw magic that turn whole battalions to ash. The muted roar of warfare resounds from the uncaring peaks. The gods of strife shall feast this upon this day and every he day hence until the end of time. Okay, here we go. Times of Legend. Oh, <laughs> oh, we're reading the entire timeline. Here we go. Ah, good luck. The history of the Warhammer world stretches over millennia and is littered with the, de the detritus of a hundred thousand battles. The bones of the dead lie scattered in shallow graves, each holding a tale, suffering and woe. Yet for all the forgotten stories of fallen warriors, some events, those that shape the world most profoundly, are well remembered. Wow. 53 minutes. Woo! We're on page, what page is this? That would have been 20, uh, 20, 21. We're on page 22. Oh, it's been almost an hour. Ah, here we go. I'm going to have a drink real quick. Okay. It's only been an hour. Ah, I might even have a sip of my energy drink. Why not? Just a sip. I'm gonna slowly sip away at that to keep my mind active. So we can finish this. Oh man, there's over 300 pages to go. This is ridiculous. The year, negative 15,000. <laughs> let's say, let's call it BS before Sigma. <laughs> 15,000 BS. The time of creation begins with the arrival of the old ones. The time of dragons comes to an end. 15,000 to, uh, what? Yeah, 15,000 to 5,600 BS. The servants of the old ones, the slan, settle in Lustria and undertake many great works. The land masses are shifted. The land masses are shifted. Oh. 
creating new continents and oceans. The geomantic web is constructed, allowing magic to flow around the world, stabilizing the new lands and fueling great and arcane machineries. The world itself is moved through the void, bringing it closer to its distant sun, warming its surface, and making it more habitable, habitable for new races, enabling the old ones to raise them from barbarism and learn the ways of civilization. Interesting. The year 5700 BS. Having mastered magic, the celestial dragon learns to take human form and rises to rule over the primitive tribes of the east. He takes the moon dragon as his mate and together they have nine dragon children. That's cool. 5600 BS. The great cataclysm. For reasons unknown, the polar gates collapse. In a moment, the old ones are ripped from the world. Perished or banished, they will never return. Through the broken gates pours a torrent of magic so great that the geomantic web shatters. As the magical machinery of the old ones crumbles, pure chaos is unleashed into reality where it coalesces into warp stone, great chunks of which rain from the skies, even as the chaos moon, Morris Slade, forms in the heavens above. Where these land, the world becomes warped and mutated as the first and greatest storm of magic ravages the young world. Demonic legions manifest, heralding the arrival of their dark masters. Many of the oldest and most powerful slan are overwhelmed by the storm magic and are struck down. Oh. Uh, wow. Well. The year 5589 BS. The remaining slain and their lizardmen armies desperately rally to face the threat. Demonic incursions throughout the geomantic web cause reality to twist and tear to accommodate the encroaching realm of chaos. The temple cities of the slain are besieged by hosts of shrieking demons. Despite their best efforts, many cities in Lustria and the Southlands are overrun. Yet more slain and inconceivable numbers of lizardmen are slain by the servants of chaos, but their armies stand resolute, defending the works of their lost masters. 5,000 to 4,500 BS. In the company of their ancestor gods, the dwarfs begin their slow colonization of the world's edge mountains. Pressing north as far as the borders of the realm of chaos, south as far as the coast of Sour Sea, and west along the Pale Sisters. As their realm expands, they delve ever deeper for treasures and precious minerals to feed their forges and fuel their industries. Grimnir meets and befriends Kalador Dragon Tamer. 4,500 BS, the war against chaos in Ulthar 1. Anarion is recognized as the leader of his people when he passes unscathed through the sacred, sacred flame and it burns beneath the shrine of Asurian. In the world's edge mountains, as many mountains fast, mountain fastness is besieged by hordes of demons, mutated beasts, and primitive men, the ancestor god Grimnir takes up his axe and heads north, journeying through the lands, warped by chaos and beyond shattered, the shattered polar gate into the realm of chaos itself. Wow. Anarion, oh, 4,499, the next year, BS. Anarion allies with Kalador Dragon Tamer, mightiest of all elven mages. Mounted upon the great dragon Indrognir and wearing the crown of the Phoenix King, Anarion leads an army of elf dragon riders against the hordes of demons that besiege their lands, driving them into the seas. With the forces of chaos seemingly defeated, a fragile peace descends over Ulthawan and Anarion marries Astariel, making her his ever queen. The year 4470 BS, Anarion's peace has proven short-lived when the forces of chaos attack Avalon. The Ever Queen is slain with us within her sacred groves and her infant children. Ivrain and Morelion are believed stolen away by the ruinous powers. Racked with rage and grief, Anarion makes haste to the blighted isle where he draws the sword of Cain. Armed with this most terrible of weapons, the first Phoenix King becomes a grim avatar of bloody handed death. 4,460 BS. At his court in Nagarith, Inarion takes Marathi as his bride and she soon bears him a son, Kalador Dragon Tamer. Concludes, concludes that to end the ceaseless incursions of the demonic legions, the wild winds of magic that lash Ulta One must be stilled. Work begins to repair and expand the ancient network of standing stones which has stood upon Ulta One since the dawn of time. 4450 BS. 
In Lustria, the four centuries long siege of Idza is finally broken by the eldritch might of Lord Croak. To save its temple city from demonic hordes, the oldest living slan sacrifices its life through death, though death is to prove little hindrance to a so powerful a creature. And its immortal spirit begins one last invocation to banish the demonic legions from the world and avert the doom of the remaining temple cities. 4420 BS. On the Isle of the Dead, Kalidor Dragon Tamer unleashes a vortex that will siphon the raging winds of magic back into the realm of chaos, settling the storms of magic that have raged for centuries. Struck down in battle, Anarion is wounded, almost unto death. His last act is to return the accursed sword of Cain to the Blighted Isle. In the east, the celestial dragon and his nine children drive the demonic hosts from their lands. In Lustria, the shade of Lord Croak completes an invocation begun decades ago. Far to the north, beyond the borders of reality, the wrath of Grimnir is unleashed. 4419 BS. The Age of Recovery. With an Arian lost, a new phoenix king is chosen. Malerion, Anarion's youthful son, is passed over and the honor is given to Belshanar. The coronation marks the end of the war against chaos and the start of the great period of rebuilding and discovery. Huh, how interesting. Malerion. I thought it would have been Kalidor. Oh no, Kalidor was sucked into the, the vortex thing, wasn't he? That's right. Okay. Uh, Malerion uh, is part, wait, age of recovery with an Arian lost and a new phoenix king of chosen Malerion, an Arian's useful son, is passed over and the honor is given to Belshanar. Ah, so Malerion was not the king, it was given to Belshanar the explorer. The coronation marks the end of the War of Chaos and the start of a great period of rebuilding and discovery. But possibly the start of the Dark Elves, right? 4300 BS. The Dwarves of the World Edge Mountains venture east, journeying across barren uplands which they name Zorn Uzgul, the Great Skull Land. West of the Mountains of Morn, they settle upon the mineral-rich plain of Zar. Elves make landfall upon the western coast of the Old World, quickly establishing settlements around promising harbors. 4119 BS. Elven settlers and dwarf prospectors meet and renew the friendship formed between Grimnir and Kalidor Dragon Tamer. That's good. Trade between the races is brisk and an alliance is formed to drive the remnants of chaos back in the primordial forests. As elven colonies prosper, wealth begins to flow back to Ulta 1 and the dwarves begin to found many new strongholds. As the dwarves of Zorn Uzgol delve far beneath the surface, Contact with the Dwarves of the World's Edge Mountains becomes infrequent. The Western Dwarves believe the Easterners to have perished in distant lands. The Eastern Dwarves, believing themselves forsaken by their peers and their gods alike, gradually turn to the worship of Hashut, Father of Darkness. Wow. This is the Chaos Dwarves, right? Wow, they, they turn to worship Hashut, father of darkness. Who the hell is that? The father of darkness, I guess. All right, 3000 BS. As the power of Cathay grows in the east, the celestial dragon takes the mantle of emperor and names his lands the Empire of Grand Cathay. Seeking the protection of the dragon from the horrors of the north or the monsters of the mountains of Morn, thousands of human tribes settle in the growing nation. 2751 BS, Belshanar is assassinated at the shrine of Asurian and revealing his treachery, Malerion proclaims himself Phoenix King. They would be, the would-be usurper steps into the sacred flames of Asurian to prove his worth, but is found wanting and emerges horrifically burned. Civil war erupts across Ulthuan. The Celestial Dragon Emperor uses his astromancers to crash a warp stone meteorite into the lands of the ogres, killing two-thirds of them and carving out the Great Maw. The impact and resultant dust storms also create the warp stone desert, forming a barrier with the west along the edge of the mountains of Morn. 2723 BS The Sundering, at the height of the civil war upon Ulthuan, 
Malarion attempts to harness the power trapped within the Great Vortex and bring forth the Realm of Chaos once more. His catastrophic failure unleashes energies that devastate the land, causing much of Ulthuan to be engulfed by the ocean waves. Malarion and his treacherous armies flee to Nagaroth. The Dwarves of Zorn Uskul, oh, 2700 BS. The Dwarves of Zorn Uskul, the Dawi Zar, raised the mighty ziggurat of Mingul, Zar Zarnagrund, in the plain of Zar, 2600 BS. The Dawi Zara marched in the dark lands and mountains of Morn, conquering and enslaving many orc and goblin tribes to work the ever growing network of mines beneath the dark lands and mountains of Morn. Hey Shan, can you check? Um, it's one hour and five minutes. One hour and five minutes? <laughs> can you see how much percent battery I've got left? No, no can't see that. Alright, that's alright. Just let it record, I guess. Um, what is the time? Do you know what the time is? Yes. How long have I been reading for? One hour and ten minutes. It's 5.13. 5.13? Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, where are we? 2500 uh, 2, BS. Setra unifies the disparate necropolis cities of Nehekara, making it the first and greatest true human empire. 2200 BS, the armies of Ulthuan take the Blighted Isle from the forces of Malarion, but the victory celebrations are short-lived. The Elven fleet is beset by storms as it returns home and many ships are sunk. The flagship of the Phoenix King is wrecked upon the coast of Nagaroth and Kalador the Conqueror is lost beneath the waves. Okay. Interesting. Two one nine eight BS, with the coronation of Kaladol II, an uneasy peace settles over Ulthuan. The survivors of the civil war begin rebuilding their ruined lands, whilst Malarion, the dread king, consolidates his power in Nagaroth. Two thousand and sixteen BS, Karun Kar is founded in Nagaroth. Two thousand and five BS, the Great Betrayal. Dwarf traders are ambushed and murdered. Dwarf settlements are plundered and honest dwarf craftsmen cheated of the gold. The dwarves believe the elves, elves are to blame. Their attackers are in fact raiders sent by Malarion to sow dissent between the two races. Many elves are slain by dwarf travelers, believing themselves under attack. The elves retaliate in kind. Soon both sides begin to muster their armies. 2000 BS, Nagash is born to King Ketep of Khemri. Oh, ha, ha. Nagash. Hoping to avert war, the Dwarf High King, Gotrek Starbreaker, sends an ambassador to Ulthuan. Dwarf demands are met with arrogance and the ambassador is shaved of his beard and sent home. Ooh, ouch. Oh, the resulting war known, as the, known variously as the War of the Beard and the War of Vengeance will rage for several centuries. Elf colonies in the Old World will bear the brunt of the hostilities and many elven settlements. Whoa, one hour and eight minutes. Oh man, that is crazy. All right, cool. That looks like a good thumbnail right there. Uh-huh. <laughs> okay. The resulting war, known variously as the War of the Beard and the War of Vengeance, will rage for several centuries. Elf colonies in the Old World bear the brunt of the hostilities and many elven settlements built inland are sacked and razed, forcing their inhabitants back to their coastal strongholds. The port of Tor Alessi is besieged many times. The dwarves chop down entire virgin forests to fuel their war effort and spite the elves. Snorri Halfhand, son of Gotrek Starbreaker, is slain by King Kaladol II after challenging the elf to single combat. 1968 BS. An elven ship carrying mages from the court of Dread King 
of the Dread King is driven off course by storms and forced to dock in Kemri. Nagash studies their magic. Morgrim, cousin of Snorri Halfhand, kills the Elf Lord Imladric at the Battle of Oragor. Nagash slays the priest king of Kemri and seizes power. Okay. 1950 to 1750 BS. Nagash distills an elixir from human blood that prolongs his fading youth, which he then shares with certain depraved nobles chosen to rule under him. Over the following centuries, these nobles come to see themselves as gods and the city's population as cattle. As their span of life extends beyond that of the ordinary mortals, they shun the light and seek out cool, dark places to hide in from the burning day. Nagash orders the construction of the Black Pyramid, one of the largest structures ever built by man. 1800 BS. In Cathay, work begins on the Great Bastion. This impenetrable fortress wall and a quarter mile of high will span league upon league along the border of Cathay, presenting an insurmountable barrier against the incursions of the Hob Goblakans and growing numbers of barbarous humans that make up the Marauder tribes. 1750 to 1600 BS, the many priest kings of Nehekara form a great confederation against Nagash. After more than a century of warfare, Nagash's power is broken and he is forced to flee north. The nobles of Lamia secretly steal away Nagash's books and seek to emulate his dark magic. 1600 BS, Nagash's uh, wanderings take him to Cripple Peak. Here Nagash discovers warp stone and begins to experiment experiment using the raw stuff of chaos to fuel his already potent magics. 1560 BS, Caladil II is killed by Gotrek Starbreaker. At the Battle of the Three Towers and the Phoenix Crown is lost. Victorious, the dwarves return to the mountains and refuse to fight anymore. That's weird. The War of Vengeance is over. Caladil's heir, Caradriel, like Galadriel but Caradriel, recalls Ulthuan's armies from the old world leaving the colonies unguarded. Caradriel tells the colonists that if they wish to enjoy the protection of Ultawan, they should return there. Many reluctantly abandon the old world, but others decide to stay. The coastal cities decline and in time are abandoned. 1500 BS, the time of woes. Across the world, terrible earthquakes and volcanic eruptions strike. In Cathay, sections of the Great Bastion collapse and hordes of marauding tribes raid deep into the nation. In the World's Edge Mountains, the Dwarf Empire faces disaster. Communication between many holes is lost and anarchy reigns. In the Chaos Karak, Ungor falls to a goblin invasion and the foul creatures bursting into the hole through great rents caused by the seismic activity. Beneath Cripple Peak, Nagash uses his legions of undead to mine ever more warp stone from the trembling earth. Many of the elf colonists remaining in the Old World venture into Athel Lauren in search of shelter as their settlements fall to ruin. Sad time. Wow. Well, yeah. Fourteen ninety nine BS Carrick Varn on the banks of the Black Water flooded barely a year before when earthquakes split the rock from which it was carved is overrun by Skaven. Loathsome rat men that tunnel from beneath the earth. It is the second dwarf hold to fall, but many more will follow in the years ahead. Oh, you're not going to tell us about the Skaven, how they came to existence, what year that was? Oh, Carrick Vine. Yes. Yes, that's when the tower was built and it kept raining in Carrick Vine, right? Pretty sure. 1498 BS, Orkwal Lord Argor Fospike ousts the dwarfs of the Dragonback Mountains and establishes the orc land known as Mount Bloodhorn. 1457 BS, the gold mines at Gunbad, the largest and richest mines in the World's Edge Mountains, fall to the night goblins after many years of sporadic fighting. 1387 to 1367 BS, the Silver Road Wars are fought between dwarves and goblins. At their height, only one in five dwarven caravans survives. The journey through the goblin-infested Dead Rock Gap. 1362 BS, after many years and many hard-fought battles, the dwarves abandoned the last of their mines and small settlements in the eastern reaches of the world's edge mountains. Oh, it just keeps going. 1350 BS, Cripple Peak is attacked and besieged from beneath by Skaven Hungary for Warpstone. But Nagash has grown powerful in his exile and the attack falters, becoming a bitter siege. Eventually a settlement is reached, 
between Nagash and his enemies and many valuable resources captured by the Skaven are traded with the Necromancer in return for Warstone minded, mined below Cripple Peak. Thunder Mountain erupts, driving orcs, goblins, and trolls northwards towards Karazakarak, a period of bitter fighting known as the Troll Wars follows. Mm. King Morgrim Blackbeard leads his forces southwards to reclaim the mountains. Around Mad Dog Pass, another dwarf army heads east and briefly recaptures Mount Gunbad. Many other fallen dwarf holds are attacked and besieged by the vengeful dwarves. Over the next 300 years, the dwarves continue to re-establish their hold of un over and under the mountains. The underway is partially cleared in places and some minor holds are retaken. The tombs of many ancestors are refurbished. The time of woes has ended. 1200 BS. The nobles of Lamia become corrupted by their study of Nagash's work, devolving into foul revenants that feed hungrily upon the blood of the living. Rumors of this reach the other great cities of Nehekara. Lamia is invaded and the followers of Nagash are defeated by a coalition of priest kings led by al Kadizar, the Conqueror. Kadrin Redmayne, the dwarf runesmith, leads an expedition in the ruins of Karakvan where he discovers a rich vein of Grom, uh, Gromril and petitions to the High King to allow him to resettle the old stronghold. Miners flock to Karakvan and Gromnil, Gromril begins to flood into the High, Elf, High King's coffers. Nagash brings war to Nehekara but is defeated by the formidable might of al -Kadizar. In his rage, Nagash unleashes terrible plagues and curses upon the land, striking down millions by leaving al Kadizar healthy and unharmed. Alone in the land of the dead and the dying, Nagash's legions march into Nehekara, all but unstopped, and al Kadizar is brought in chains to, to Cripple Peak. Ah, okay. al Kadizar. 1151 BS, the great ritual Nagash undertakes a great ritual that it will awaken the land of Nehekara into undeath. Nagash's treacherous allies Free King al Kadizar, who, wielding a weapon of terrible power crafted by the Skaven, cuts down Nagash and flees with the great necromancer's crown, a potent artifact imbued with a portion of its owner's essence. So great is the power unleashed by the great ritual that awakened legions of the Tomb King remain animated. 1147 BS, the body of al Kadizar and with it Nagash's crown is discovered by Kadon. Possessed by the shade of Nagash, the shaman founds the city of Morkain. Kadrin Redmayne is ambushed and killed in 1136 BS. His last act is to throw his rune hammer far out into the black water to prevent it falling into the hands of the enemy. Following Kadrin's death, the dwarf's hold on Karakvan becomes increasingly tenuous. 1125 BS. The winter of woe in Athalorn. Ariel and Orion become king and queen in the woods. Oh, this is the Wood Elves. 1005, 1095 BS. The Battle of Lorne. Morghur, the Lord of Skulls, and his beastmen herd attack Athalorn. Of course. Beasts are in the woods. Elves are in the woods. Beastmen versus Wood Elves. 1000 BS. The land surrounding Athalorn is settled by a people of the warlike Bretoni tribe. They learn of the elves in the forest and fear venturing too far into the forest itself. I'm going to say that's Bretonia. 813 BS. 813 years before Sigma. The Battle of Anguish in Athalorn, Morgher the Corrupter is slain following a great battle in what forever after will be known as the Glade of Woe, 700 years before Sigma. Elven seafarers report human shepherds grazing their flocks amid the tumbled ruins of former elf cities. 666 before Sigma. Wars of the Green Moon. Morislieb hangs large in the northern sky for more than a month. Mortal and de oh, there goes my light. Mortal and demonic servants of chaos battle ferociously within the chaos wastes for control of the magic storms. The fall of Carrick Eight Peaks in 513 years before Sigma. 
For more than a century, the greatest dwarf hold resists invasion, but it's doomed to send suddenly when its wells are poisoned and its tunnels filled with deadly gases. King Lun orders the tombs of the kings of old, not the tomb kings, tombs of the kings of old, be ruin sealed and the hold is abandoned. The king vows his home will be reclaimed one day. 469 before Sigma. Orcs destroy the dwarf hold of Karak Asgal, but abandon it when they find no treasure. The orcs then capture Karak Karak Draz, renaming it the Black Crag. Now all the mountains between Mad Dog Pass and Karak Eight Peaks are in Orc and Goblin hands. 370 BS. Orc War Boss. Ugrok Beard Burner. <laughs> Beard Burner. Oh, their names are funny. Uh, leads a wah to the dwarf capital of Karazakarak. The dwarf high king Logan Proud Beard is captured and humiliated. But the orcs are driven back and defeated at the Battle of Blackwater. The newly invented dwarf cannon plays a large part in the orc defeat and the messy beheading of war boss Ugrok. Uh, 250 years before Sigma, the dwarves intensify their trading with the growing tribes of men that dwell west of the world's edge mountains. In the lands that are to become the empire, several expeditions are launched into the forest of Lauren, never to be seen again. 200 years before Sigma. The cult of Qian Chi, as Chinch is known in the East, becomes popular amongst the aristocracy of the city of Beichai in Cathay. Morkain is sacked by Wah! Cracktooth. <laughs> Wah Cracktooth is his name? What? 150 years before Sigma, the first black orcs are seen fighting in the vanguard of the armies of the Dawi Zar. Within 50 years, their revolt and war breaks out within Zar. Now, Grund, many black orcs escape to the world's edge mountains and mountains of Morn. Uh, Fifty years before Sigma, Arthur, king of the Teotogans, discovers the Boschlag rock, later known as Ulricksburg, and enlists the aid of the dwarves to build a fortress that will be known as Middenheim. Cool. Nagash is reborn 40 years before Sigma. He assumes the Tomb Kings will obey his orders, but they do not, and he is forced to retreat to Cripple Peak. Nash, Nagash finds his fortress overrun by his enemies and drives them all out in a single night. Sigmar is born 30 years before Sigmar. Sigmar is born. <laughs> so it's actually IC, right? Imperial calendar. Not Sigmar's birth. Sigmar is born to the chief of the Unbarogan tribe. 15 years pre-imperial calendar. King Kurgan, Iron Beard of Karazakarak, is rescued from orcs by Sigma. Prince of the Unbarogan tribe. Okay, Sigma is a prince. Okay, cool. From this meeting, a great alliance between the races of dwarves and men is forged. In gratitude for his rescue, the Dwarf King gifts Sigmar the rune hammer Galmaraz, or Skull Splitter, an ancient heirloom of the King's clan. Uh, before Imperial Calendar, eight years. Eight years before. Upon the death of his father, Sigmar becomes chief of the Unbarogan tribe. One year before the Imperial Calendar is created. At the Battle of Blackfire Pass, a massive orc army is annihilated by the armies of Sigma and Kurgan, Ironbeard. The orc and goblin hordes are driven from the lands. So cool. Year Zero. A twin-tailed comet appears in the heavens. Interesting. Year One. Sigma is crowned emperor by the high priest of Ulrich. Many dwarves settle within the empire where they help the humans build their first cities. Dwarf masons, carpenters, and smiths are much in demand and dwarf workmanship is admired everywhere. Okay, 1, 2, 15. In search of his lost crown, Nagash travels north where he raises a huge undead army and attacks the fledgling empire. At the Battle of the River Rake, Nagash is felled by Sigma. Oh, interesting. And his army almost completely destroyed. After half a century of prosperity, Sigma relinquishes his throne and vanishes into the east. The system of elector counts is established whereby the provincial leaders elect one of their number to be emperor. The se year 73, the spreading cult of Sigma receives its first grand theogenist 
John Johann Hillstrom. Sigmar becomes the patron god of the empire he founded. In the year 501. Hmm. So Sig wait, Sigmar was 80 years old when he just, his eyes glazed over and he just walked off and vanished. Uh, year 501, Marienburg is absorbed by the empire during the reign of Emperor Sigismund II. The Bretoni tribes face a great incursion of orcs and goblins that descends from the Grey and Apuccini Mountains. Orc warlords demand tribute from the Bretoni tribes but are rejected. For the next 400 years, the Bretoni fight the orc hordes. Hmm. 698 representatives of the Phoenix King arrive in Cathay. They return laden with silk, jade, and spices. Trade between East and West begins to flourish. Uh, 977. Gilles Le Breton begins to unite, uh, un unite the Bretonians into a single nation. He fights 12 battles and is victorious in every one, conquering all the lands of the West of the Grey Mountains and creating the land of Bretonia. There we go. 977. The year 1017, Norse raiders established a stronghold on the island of Saratosa. The year 1111, unleashed by the Skaven, the Black Plague sweeps through the Old World and many settlements are abandoned due to falling populations. In Sylvania, the necromancer Frederick Van Hal raises a huge undead army from the bodies of the plague's victims, and a long war begins against armies of Skaven invaders. The year 1115, the death of the Emperor Boris Goldgather. From the Black Plague. Ooh. His reign is memorable only for the high levels of corruption and taxation abroad. The year 1124. Van Hal is assassinated and his undead horde wiped out. Van Halsing. <laughs> is that what that's supposed to be? The Skaven, weakened by war, are defeated and driven back underground by Count Mandred Skaven Slayer. Count Mandred is elected emperor. King oh, Guillaume defeats the orcs at the Battle of Amandur and drives them from Bretonia once more in 1142. 1152, Emperor Mandarin Skaven Slayer is assassinated. The elected counts cannot agree upon a successor and the empire divides into self-governing provinces. 1175, Cetra leads a large raiding force against Bretonia. He is met at Savage Point by a Bretonian fleet led by Admiral Henry La Morte. Cetra's fleet is heavy, heavily defeated, but he escapes vowing revenge. 1360, Grand Duchess Ottilia of Talabeckland declares herself Empress and war erupts between Talabeckland and Stirland. 1494, Khan Queen Miska, daughter of Radi Bokha, leads the Gospodars through the High Pass, driving back the Ungul tribes. Under Khan Queen Shuika, work begins on building the great Gospodar capital, Kislev Shuika, daughter of Miska, takes the title of Tsarina. 1547. The Count of Mindenheim proclaims himself Emperor. There are now three Emperors, none of which commands much loyalty amongst the other provinces. In time, hostilities wane between factions and each Emperor effectively rules an independent state. Okay. 1681. The Knight of the Restless Dead, Nagash, returns to life once again. Wow, this is the second time he's come back to life now. 16, 1,666 years after he was slain by Sigmar. Of course, we got the 666 there, yeah. For one night throughout the known world, the dead stir and walk the land, sowing terror and confusion amongst the living. Many vampires come out of hiding and wage war to increase their domains. Countless villages and towns are overrun and destroyed before the Night of Terror ends. Wah! Iron Claw erupts into the Empire through Blackfire Pass. Much of the southern corner of the empire is sacked and burned. Count Eldred of Solon is slain and the rune fang of Solon taken. At the Battle of Grunberg, the orc war boss is badly wounded and his wah loses impetus. The orc army breaks up, leaving the eastern half of the empire in ruins. 1757. The year 1757, Sartosa becomes the lair of pirates. In the year 1797, in Sylvania, the vampire Vlad von Karstein marries Countess Isabella von Drac. Haha. <laughs> Over the following two centuries, the remaining arist aristocratic families of the province are infected with the curse of vampirism. Of course. In the year 1850, far beneath the surface of the world, the Skaven under empire erupts into a vicious and protracted civil war. For several centuries, the loathsome rat men seem to vanish into myth, 
leading many scholars to doubt their existence at all. Hmm. The year 1979. Margarita of Marienburg is elected emperor by those elected counts not claiming the crown for themselves. The grand theogenist of Sigma refuses to acknowledge the appointment and the imperial system is effectively ended. 2001. The Phoenix King, Funubar the Seafarer, lands at the Bretonian port of Langui. He travels extended, extensively across the old world, opening relations with the Empire of Bretonia and even the dwarves. The year 2010. The Wars of the Vampire Counts begin with the devastation of Ostermark by the armies of Vlad von Karstein. Far more, for more than a century, the armies of Vlad and his descendants torment the fractured empire. Hmm. 2145. The term and the, the threat of the vampire counts once and for all. The united factions of the empire unite and scour the dark forces of Sylvania. Manfred, the final Count von Karstein, is brought to battle at Hellfen where he is defeated and his undead army is destroyed. How sad. 2201. Lewin Orkslayer, the king of Bretonia, declares his intention to rid the land of orcs. Over the next century, Bretonian territory is gradually cleared of orcs by the king's knights. 2205. Battle of Black Falls. Dwarf and goblin armies meet on the shores of Blackwater, the goblin war boss. Gorkil Eyegouger is mortally wounded by High King Alaric, but pulls his adversary to his doom over the falls. 2250. In the north, incursions and raids by Chaos Warbands grow both in both in, num in, in both numbers and frequency. In every nation, hidden cults begin to reveal themselves. All across the world, enemies gather at the borders of nations. Oh, we are finally done with the timeline. So what well, the last record is 2250? Hmm, okay. Wow. What year did the world end? I can't remember. I can't remember. That is a lovely picture of a, looks like it's a, yeah, black dragon, high elf riding a dragon. That is so cool. Lovely artwork right there. War and conquest. Okay, I think uh, we might be running out of uh, battery, so I think I need to charge this phone. Um, okay, so what, we're on page 31. You got to hear the first 30 pages with the microphone. I think now I do need to take this microphone off and charge the phone. Um, maybe we'll just read uh, this war and conquest section and then we'll charge the phone. Oh, one hour and 32 minutes, that is insane. War and conquest in the aftermath of the war against chaos. The young races ventured forth into the world once more, reclaiming lost lands and rediscovering lost colonies. In this era of bold exploration, powerful alliances would be formed. Yet the corruption of chaos was not banished from the world. Jealousy would soon give way to corruption. At the height of their powers, the elves and dwarves would descend into bitter conflict and, the war, and war would once more ravage the old world. Elves and dwarves. Under the rule of Belshanar, a great age of exploration and expansion began for the elves of Ulthamon and many new colonies were planted across the face of the world. In the old world, the dwarves were similarly engaged in conquest and growth, pushing their domains east in the Great Skull Land and west in the lands of the primitive human tribes. On the coast of the lands that would one day come to be known as Bretonia, the elves and dwarves met again. Quickly, the friendship formed long ago between Kalidor, Dragon Tamer, and Grimnir was re-established, and both races mourned to hear the loss of such great leaders. While celebrating the tales of their heroism and their roles of in, the, in ending the War of Chaos, Belshanar personally visited the new colonies and even ventured to Karazakarak, in the World's Edge Mountains, to swear the oath of friendship with the Dwarf Kings. Malarion, the son of Anarion, became his ambassador there, and a trusted friend of the Dwarves. And the Elves and Dwarves, as the Elves and Dwarves spread and multiplied across the face of the world, wealth flowed into their growing empires. The Elven cities and Dwarf holds were re rebuilt, following the long war, growing in size and splendor, and becoming places of beauty and wonder once again. The Seeds of Treachery Unbeknownst to the Elves, Chaos had returned to Ulthal One in an insidious new guise spreading through a web of secret cults of luxury and pleasure. At the center of this web was Malarion, who had long harbored a deep jealousy of Belshanar and believed the Phoenix Crown was his birthright. Returning to Ulthamon to, uh, on the pretense of revealing this creepy evil, Malarion plotted the downfall of Belshanar, planning his assassination before accusing the Phoenix King of being a cultist himself. With Belshanar's death, the son of an, of an Arion, uh, believed all he needed to do was claim the throne, was to step into the sacred fires of Assyria and to prove his worthiness. Yet the treacherous elf proved unworthy and he was cast from the flames, horribly burned and scarred. 
With Malarian's betrayal, the Elven realms were plunged into a bit of civil war. The wounded traitor fled north with his followers into Nagarith. In his wake, frantic consultations were held between the now leaderless princes of the Ulthuan. It was decided that the third phoenix king would be Imric, the grandson of, grandson of Calador Dragon Tamer, who upon his succession took the name Calador and would be known as Calador the Conqueror. Hmm, Imric, Calador the Conqueror. Uh, scarcely had Calador been affirmed when the armies of Nagarai swept down from the Grim Realm, bearing the banner of the Dread King before them. Thus did a civil war engulf Ulthuan and its colonies. A sundering. Hmm. I don't want to wreck my book. The bitter war between the Phoenix Court and the followers of Malarian was to rage for several centuries. As the conflict ground on, the Dread King brooded upon his many defeats, growing mad with jealousy as yet another imposter wore the Phoenix crown while he lived as an outcast, and he plotted an unthinkable revenge. Evil packs were struck in Nagarith, and from the brooding skies the laughter of the Dark Gods could be heard. At the culmination of a moonlit ritual, the Dread King attempted to unbind the cosmic vortex and unleash a realm of chaos upon Ulthuan. Yet the power had been invoked by Kalidor Dragon Tamer uh, and his mages was too great for the likes of Malarion to unravel. Briefly, the vortex flared with the radiance of a thousand suns before growing momentarily dark. At this moment, a terrible wave of malef malefic energy was unleashed across Ultawan, across Ultawan, causing a great tidal wave that engulfed Nagarith. Devastating the land and toppling cities. As, as much of northern Ulthuan disappeared under the torrent, the, the earth quaked, causing the jagged cliffs to crumble and great tracts of coastline to fall in the raging seas. As the land of Nagarith sank, renegade wizards in the court of the Dread King harnessed great sections of the splintering land. Aboard these great black arcs, Malarion and his followers fled, nor fled northwards, even as the vortex flickered once more into life. Yet the damage was done. A ferocious storm of magic had already been unleashed, however briefly bringing with it untold destruction to Ulthuan. We have vanquished the demonic hosts and driven back rolling clouds of chaos that pl plagued the lands. Yet let the world rejoice, for we have won its sanctity, and the air bears not the foul tang of the demon. But at what cost to us, the valorous and the brave of Ultuan, what sacrifices have been made upon this, the altar of hope, the lament of Belshanar? Woo! Mmm. The War of the Beard. In the old world, news of the Elven Civil War had reached the ears of the dwarves, though they failed to comprehend the severity of the news, so the war's treachery and kinslaying were alien concepts, and no dwarf would ever break an oath to a king. Consequently, dwarf kings had opted to stay out of the conflict and re refused to take sides. Yet when warriors of Ulthuan began to raid dwarf caravans, the dwarves were dragged into the conflict. Enraged at such aggression, High King Gotrek Starbreaker sent his ambassador to the court of the Phoenix King, now Kalador II, the son of... Calador the Conqueror, to demand explanation and recompense. But the brash, young Phoenix King quickly grew frustrated and ordered, ordered Gotrek's ambassador and shaved his own... Uh, and shaved and thrown from his court. His terrible insult could not be ignored, and the dwarves roused to anger. Uh, yeah, they were roused to anger. At the High King's command, mighty throngs gathered and marched against the elven colonies of the Old World, and the centuries that followed many elven cities were besieged, all falling to the might of the dwarves. Conquered cities were raised and their inhabitants driven into the sea. With each victory, the High King solemnly struck a single entry from the Great Book of Grudges, uh, the huge tome in which all wrongs done to the dwarf race were recorded. Yet there remained more grudges to settle, and it was not until Kalidor II was slain by Gotrek Starbreaker, and the Phoenix crown claimed as a trophy, so that the dwarves considered the matter settled. Okay, we're charging this uh, phone. Yes, it is a phone. It is just a phone that we're recording on, okay? Oh, all right. Let me charge this phone real quick. No, definitely not done. Just, oh, uh-oh. You need to uh -oh. go somewhere. What? I need to go somewhere. You need to go where? I need to bring stuff to my classmate in Asumuga. Okay. Yeah, well, you can bring stuff there. Kantana. Okay. Okay, here we go. Oh, the Rise of Men. Page 33. <laughs> oh, it's, all, it's been an hour and what? 36. Damn. Can we not 
read 100 pages in two hours. Random enough. Fifty pages in two hours would be good. Yeah, fifty, hundred, hundred fifty, two hundred, two hundred fifty, three hundred. Okay, no, we need to be doing more than that. <laughs> that would be bad. Ugh. I think that the start of this book is is full of all the, you know, the backstory and stuff. So it's got a lot of stuff I need to read, uh, but the rest of it is mostly. Uh, I guess, you know, pictures, diagrams, so we'll see. Ah. This is a mission. Oh. Okay. Oh, here we go. Yeah, uh, the rise of men. Whilst the elves and dwarves were forging alliances with the, in the old world, the primitive and barbaric race of men was building its first cities in the hot and arid lands of the south. From the nomadic desert tribes of Nehekara, the first true human civilization was forming. Okay. Nehekara. The ancient kingdom of Nehekara was at its most powerful when other human tribes were still primitive and savage. Over long centuries, Nehekara, known through its people as the Great Land, had risen out of the desert to become a powerful civilization with a, with a sophisticated religion and an advanced system of government. Small settlements had grown into great cities. Vast roads were constructed and fleets of ships built to connect each city to its neighbors. Mighty kings ruled the people and raised disciplined armies to fight in their name. The greatest of these was Kemri the city of kings, and by tradition, whoever ruled there was considered first amongst equals. The other cities were each governed by their own king, though all showed loyalty and paid tribute to Camry. Together, these kings subdued the tribes and surrounding lands, drove back the orc hordes, and ruled from the western deserts to the eastern sea of Dread. At the height of Nehekara's power, it had expanded and conquered lands as far north as what would become known as the Empire, south into the primordial jungles of the Southlands and even into the foreboding Darkland, east. The king's armies marched across the world, subjugating all before them, and their vast fleets of galleys and war barks terrorized the great oceans. Tylos. The cursed city of Tylos was founded between the Rhino Mountains and the Tilian Sea by savage tribes. Uh, of primitive men. These nomadic tribes had come to the rich and fertile lands in pursuit of great herds of migratory beasts, and they hunted and eventually to trade their meager wares atop a broad hill. In time, this meeting place uh, became home to farmers, shepherds, and craftsmen, and as the tribes intermarried and the numbers grew, grew stock dale walls were erected to defend the settlers. Soon after, a wandering clan of dwarves, prospectors, and miners also found the area. Immediately, they recognized the richness that lay about uh, within the mountains and the earth, and the two races formed an alliance. With the arrival of the dwarves, the city grew rapidly. With wooden stock day, stockades were replaced with mighty walls of dressed stone. Log built long houses were pulled down, and in their place, tall towers of granite climbed to the sky. The prosperity of the lands and the alliance between men and dwarves allowed the city to reach great heights. How cool. The city reached great heights. Yes, it did. Oh, come on. Allowed the city to reach great heights of architecture and culture within a single human generation. The crowning jewel of the city would be a great bell tower, which would stand unrivaled as the highest structure ever erected in the old world and would extend far below the earth as it did above. Strike in the Great Land. Learning Hikara prosper, prospered and cities grew in wealth, its many kings thirsted for great power. To this end, the kings began raising their armies and marching to war against one another to prove their mind worthy to the crown of Hikara. For a time, this symbol of rulership over all the great land passed from king to conquering king. Dozens of monarchs rose and fell during this time, their names quickly being lost to its history. As the cities were war, the great land became vulnerable to attacks from invading enemies. Hordes of orcs and savage tribes of men 
descended upon Nehekar from the north, slaughtering, plundering, looting, and laying waste to all before them. These invasions and, constant, and the constant inter internecine warfare combined with years of drought during the great Vite uh, river ran dry, took a heavy toll upon Nehekara. Pestilence and famine came to the great land as the meager crops, those that had escaped by being, uh, being burned by ramp rampaging enemies within the fields for lack of hands to harvest them. No single city's army, exhausted as they were from disease, starvation, and remitting war, could hope to hold back the tide of invaders alone. Yet the arrogant and distrustful kings refused to put aside their differences and form a lasting alliance, alliance and bend their knee to another. A halt in their pursuit of domination over their rivals. The first great civilization of man stood on the brink of destruction. If the Nehekarans could not be unified, they would all perish. Sad. Setra the, Setra the king of kings. When Setra came to the throne of Khemri, he was a vain and egotistical man. Uh, so he was, he was a man who demanded the adoration of his subjects. But he was no fool. He listened to the counsel of his priests and knew that only a king who commanded the respects of the gods would earn full adultation of the people. Adulation. Adultation. <laughs> to this end, Setra humbled himself before the ancient gods of Nehekara. In a great ritual, Setra beseeched the gods to restore Khemri to his former glory and grant him strength to conquer his rivals. The next day, the great Mate River flooded for the first time in several decades. This was seen as a sign by both the priesthood and population that Setra was indeed chosen by the gods. Setra became a priest king of the Khemri, uh, a ruler who commanded not only the unswerving loyalty of his people and his legions, but also built the power of the gods. Setra was a ruthless warlord, his keen mind matched only by his courage and martial skill. One by one, he brought uh, the cities of Nehekara to heal, always leading his armies from the front with every uh, victory. More warriors flocked to his banner before long vast regions of uh, leaves his past such as command and the kings of Nehekara bowed before him, swearing oaths and fealty and acknowledged Khemri as the pre-eminent city of the land once more. With his rivals subjugated in the, in the great land against uh, united against the invaders, the king of kings has restored Nehekara to greatness. The more to wear cult, in his arrogance, Setra became obsessed with his own mortality under his rule. The priesthood of Nehekara became similarly obsessed. From his, this compulsion was born the more to wear cult and Nehekara's greatest and most powerful priest were tasked by the great king with unlocking the secrets of immortality in the afterlife. In their research, the priests learn much and use their powers to extend Setra's life far beyond its natural span. Yet the priests could not halt the inevitable, merely postpone it. And they continue to search in vain for a way to accomplish their appointed task. With the passing of the years, they learn to preserve a corpse from decay through the elaborate art of mummification. They begin harnessing the winds of magic, devising a law of magical incantations and rituals with which they hope to bridge the gap between life and death. They believe that with careful preparation and the proper invocations, the dead could one day return to life and immortality. Though he raged at the priest's failing, Setra commanded that a vast burial scene be constructed for his body to rest within until the mortuary cult finished their work and he could be reborn into eternal life so that uh, he so craved. And so when the king of kings finally succumbed to his mortality, uh, to his mortality, powerful incantations were intoned over his corpse and he was embalmed with great ritual. Preserved against decay, the body of Setra was intoned within a mighty sarcophagus in the heart of a majestic pyramid of shining white stone. The rise from the gash, with the passing of Setra, the mortuary cult continued to grow in size and influence whilst increasing its knowledge and power. As the cult grew, so too did the necropolipses of the rulers of Nehekara. Great tomb cities uh, sprang up and the cities of the living growing in size and grandeur with each generation. Into this powerful priesthood came the gash, son of King Ketep of Khemri, filled with pride and greed and gash, coveted both the rank of high priest and the throne of Khemri, which by birth or by right of birth passed to his brother. Thutep, as he rose in power, Nagash gathered about himself a cable of acolytes, and one dark night, Nagash and his followers murdered Thutep's guards in the tomb of the king alive with the, within the pyramid of his father. The next morning, blood still staining his hands and surrounded by his acolytes, Nagash took his place upon the empty throne. For the people of Nehekara, the rule of Nagash was a dark time. The serpent cared not at all for the well-being of his subjects, desiring only to increase his sorcerer's powers and attain his own immortality. Oh, man. Uh, okay. Uh, and Nagash experimented with many dark magics, extending his, extending his life and the lives of those closest to him through the use of foul elixirs. He studied death and began to corrupt the rites of the mortuary cult for darker purposes. 
Evil creatures and undead revenants stalk the streets of Camry by night, preying upon the living, and the winds of magic blew powerfully around the fear-shrouded city. The Doom of Tylos. In the land of Tilea, the elders of Tylos had commissioned their dwarf allies uh, to aid in the building of a mighty bell tower which would climb from the foundations above where we had to stand higher than the tallest tower. The work had taken many years and many, many masons had dedicated their lives to a tower they would never see reach its full height. But as the tower neared completion, the dwarves could not raise the mighty brass bell up to the, the, the distant belfry. The elders of Tylos lamented and prayed for a solution. These prayers seemed answered when a hooded stranger came to Tylos. Oh, this is the birth of Scape. Offering to raise the bell and complete the tower. All this stranger asked in return was that he be allowed to inscribe a dedication to his god upon the bell. Hmm. Uh. Okay. But why were they building this tower in the first place? They just wanted to build the tallest tower. It's like the Tower of Babel story. It always ends badly, doesn't it? Never build tall towers. The elders agree. Okay. Uh, Land of Tilea. These are humans, right? Working with the dwarves. Uh, yes. Interesting. The elders agreed, and at the stranger's request, returned to their homes that he might work unseen. Oh, hello, Daddy. Where's Daddy's here. Where's Mommy? Mommy's downstairs. Daddy's reading a big story. Like Look, what? it's a big book. Like, she's not anywhere. Oh, <laughs> did she go? <laughs> okay, you stay here with Daddy. You stay upstairs with Daddy. Yeah? Uh, you yes. Want, Didn't you see your Daddy's Warhammer on the shelf? Did, 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 she went to the gym? She went to the gym, yeah. She went to the gym. But she'll be back soon, yeah. Hey, do you want to play with them? Look at all them ones. Because they're gonna broke. No, you can play with the ones at the bottom. They won't but break. But not the big ones. But not, not these ones. You can play with the big ones too. Because they're the gonna ones. because they're gonna all broke. Yeah, they're gonna all break, yeah. So just play with the ones at the bottom, see if there's lots of them. And then there's what see the two big ones in the packet? I'm so tired. Oh, you don't wanna play with them? Yeah. Okay, that's alright. What do you wanna play then? Just what? I need, yeah. I want some water. Oh, you want some water? Here. Yeah. Daddy's got some water here. We can drink this water. There you go. Just, just my water. You can have that one. <laughs> oh, video did not go according to plan. We have a halfling entered the room from the moot. <laughs> okay. I want more water, Dad. More water? Uh, there's water in your cup downstairs. In the, in the bottle, what? in the fridge. But I'm so scared. You're so scared. <laughs> Don't be scared. Or you stay up here with Daddy. Stay up here with Daddy, Daddy, okay? You can have a look there. Like, you can touch the toys there, play with the toys. What about these ones? Oh, maybe, yeah, those ones will break. <laughs> but these ones on the bottom, look. Wait, there's a big one here, look. Uh, uh, look at this one. Get that one out. Get this one out. The big toys. You can play with them. No, that broke. That one break, you won't break. Because They're pretty strong toys. They're strong toys. They won't break. Yeah. Okay. Daddy. Oh, yeah, you just pick it up like that. See? I can see those have an eye. It's just scary. <laughs> but they have one eye. Yeah, he doesn't eye. have an eye, hey? I only have one eye. Yeah. Alright, hang on. I'm going to move this a bit closer now. Oh, oh wait, this. Agreed, and at the stranger's request, returned to their homes that he might work unseen. The following morning, the bell tower stood complete, what? though of the stranger there was I no didn't sign. See that ropes. 
Yeah, you just put his arm back on like this. See? Put his arm in the hole like this. I'll show you. So if it falls off, you just put it in there like that. So it's up. His axe is up. There you go. No, he's gonna fight. You're gonna fight. Yeah, you make him fight. Uh, as the people of Tylos looked on in amazement, not realizing anything was amiss, the bell began to toll far above. When the bell tolled the thirteenth time, the skies darkened and a rain of warp stone began to fall, corrupting the city and poisoning the earth for miles around. Turning rich farmlands into foetid swamps, the terrified people of Tylos ran to the doors of the dwarf mines but found them barred. Locked within their minds, the dwarves were overrun by an endless tide of loose and vermin. Tylos was no more. And within its bleak, twisted ruins, evil creatures would lurk. But they don't have hmm? anything to play with to fight. Yeah, you do. Look, all of them ones. All of them ones. Yeah, there's more there. You can get them. Can you? You want daddy to get them? No, yeah. it's all of them. All of them? Okay, there you go. Whoa. Oh. They can fight the one, they can fight that one. They can fight these two as well. Oh, oh, oh. oh. Look at this one. They can fight that one. Oh. This one is a middle. It's a tree's name. Okay. The fall of Nagash and Kemri Nagash had commanded a vast black pyramid. He built in his honor once complete, the structure would, uh, would dwarf even the tomb of Setra and the sorcerer's powers of Nagash would be amplified beyond imagining. The winds of magic harnessed to his every whim by the pyramid's arcane geometries. Yet the tithe demanded for the pyramid's construction would prove Nagash's undoing. Across Nankara, impoverished priest kings rebelled against their cruel overlord and horrors rampant within, within his accursed court. United in defiance, the priest kings plotted to overthrow the tyrant. In response, Nagash used his infernal powers to raise a legion of skeletons from the necropolis. This was both the first glimpse of Nagash's true power and the first time the dead walked the world at the will of another. The horror proved too much for many. City after city fell before Nagash's might. Their dead swelling the ranks of the undead legions and their uh, deceased. I'm just going to move this up here just in case. Um, United in defiance, the priest kings plotted to overthrow the tyrant. In response, Nagash uses his infernal powers. Nagash uh, uses uh, uh, to raise a legion of skeletons from the necropolis. This was but the first glimpse of Nagash's true power, the first time they had walked the world at the will of another. The horror proved too much for many. City after city fell before Nagash's might, their dead swelling the ranks of his undead legions and their defeated kings bowing before the great necromancer. Yet Nagash underestimated the resolve of his enemies and a mighty coalition was formed between seven kings that refused to bend the knee. Beside the seven kings' armies marched cohorts of animated constructs empowered by the magic of mortuary cult, great stone of colossi driven by the souls of mighty heroes. With such potent allies, the army of the seven kings vanquished and the undead legions of Nagash and his most trusted acolytes were slain. Yet of the great necromancer himself, there was no sign that Gash had escaped his enemies. Yes! Oh, Dr. Koi! Why does he stand up? Uh, what? Who can't stand up? Why does he don't have a stick like this? Oh, he doesn't have one like that? Yeah. Yeah, uh, let's go. Stand up if you want. Do you want me to make him stand up? Yeah, it's in the blue box. You see the blue box? Open this, the blue box. This one? Yep. Open it up. Yeah. Yep. Open it. Open it. Open it. Okay. Yeah, open the blue box, Nacho. Oh. Then you get the, the super glue. I like this. This is one you painted. Remember, you painted that one. You painted the central. Where is it? It's in the blue box. Open it. Lift it, yeah, lift it, lift it up, open. Lift it up. Yeah, lift it up, up, pull it up, pull it up. Yeah, see? Open it right up. Well, bring it here, bring it here. <laughs> yeah, you go. Yeah. Open it up, open it up. Okay, get the super glue, the yellow one. See the yellow one on the top? Yeah. Yeah, get it. Yep. Yeah, that one, yeah. Yeah, get it. That's it, that's it, yeah. Bring it to daddy. Yep, that's the one. 
Bring me the horse. Bring me the horse. Bring me the horse and I'll put him on here, like this. Mm, what's happening? See if it works, okay? Cripple Peak, fleeing from his enemies, Nagash wandered into the hey, desert, thirst parched his throat, and hunger gnawed his gut. Yet the great man in the heavens had trudged on, haunted by dark visions. Some claim that Nagash died as he wandered the course of, of his will alone, returning his spirit no. to his desiccated corpse. You know, I've read 37 pages of this and I haven't read a rule yet. When do the rules start? <laughs> this is supposed to be a rule book. In time, Nagash came to the banks of the Sour Sea. Beneath the shadow of Cripple Peak, millennia before, a huge shelf of warpstone struck the mountains, splitting it wide. Long years of wind and rain caused the warpstone to leach into the rain, heading into eternity. Heading into a wasteland where no natural thing flourished. When the gas drank a bit of water of the sour sea, he was invigorated. Realizing a source of great power lay close. The gas determined to discover it. For long years. Did it work? Yes. It did. There you go. Okay, it worked. We got it. Uh, okay, for long years, Nagash lived, lived as a hermit on the banks of the Sour Sea, experimenting with warpstone to increase his power. By night, he visited the channel pits of the degenerate human tribes of the region, perfecting his obscene skill, uh, spells, and yes. raising the Daddy, corpses of the dead. Daddy, why does it do like this? Oh, okay, maybe we need to uh, glue it to the base this time. Uh, where's the seven base? Where is the seven base? Oh, no, no. Put him in a seven base here. Is there a black circle somewhere? No, no black circle. No black circle. Oh, okay, that's frustrating. Um, I don't know where it is, but he's still not standing up. Okay, here, I'll put him on this. Put him on this. Put him on this base here. There we go. Put him here like that. There we go. Okay, we got some. Here, look. Stick him on there. Daddy will hold him and I'll tell you when he's ready, okay? Okay, um. By night, he visited the channel pits of the dendrite human tribes of the region, perfecting his obscene spells and raising the corpse of the dead to do his bidding. He came to be worshipped as God by the tribes. The wretched souls worked tirelessly on the reanimated husks of their kin, mining warpstone from beneath the mountain to fuel their master's hunger and building a great fortress. There you go, Nacho, it's done. Okay, well, that super is done. We'll try that. Uh, okay. Cripple Peak became the center of a swarming empire where the living and the dead alike served their master tirelessly, their flesh and bones, the fuel that drove Nagash's obsession. The vengeance of Nagash. Okay. In the city of Lamia, allies of Nagash secretly studied his dark arts stolen from the tomes and um, 
Under a subtle influence created an elixir which blessed them with long life, great strength and vitality, but cursed them with a terrible thirst for blood of the living and an aversion to the light of the sun. Okay. Um, hmm. Over time, these allies grew in power and influence. Dark rumors spread that unclean things stalked the streets of Lamia and the dead walk among the living. Enraged by these rumors, the priest kings of Nehenkara were drawn into the long and bloody war against Lamia. Though the armies of the priest kings suffered greatly, vampires were defeated and Lamia lays to the ground. With the, fall, with the fall of Lamia, those vampires not slain fled north, drawn by instinct towards the sanctuary of Triple Peak. Arriving in the carrying court of the great ne necromancer, they were welcomed to give command of vast armies of the undead, raised by Nagash in anticipation of this moment and ready to march against the weakened armies of Nekara at his bidding. But Nagash had underestimated this enemy. The war against Lamia had not weakened Nekara. Instead, the great la land had grown powerful under the rule of the mighty Al-Qadizar, the conqueror. Under his inspired leadership, the armies of Nekara faced the legion of Nagash boldly and battle the battles won. Defeated the vampires, fled uh, across the desert to Cripple Peak, bringing their master the news of their failure. Enraged, Nagash chose to end all life in the Hekara so that he might rule free from petty and rebellious mortals. To this end, he blew to the great Vitae River with terrible contagions. Nagash just hated people. <laughs> uh, poisoning the land. Within weeks, those sets had come to the plague. Yeah. Remember of the living yeah. in the streets cho were choked with corpses as fully yeah. nine-tenth of the population was perished. Yeah. Whilst his people died, al Khadizar sat upon his throne, powerless as undead armies marched, but... All, and all but un unopposed into Kemri. With Nehekara reduced to a land of corpses, Nagash began the next phase of his plan. In a, long, in a days long ritual, he consumed vast quantities of warp soon, the souls of whole tribes of his followers sacrificed upon his black altar. Bloated with power, he began the incantation of his greatest spell, the Great Awakening, a spell that would raise every corpse in the world over and bind them to his will. Even as Nagash completed his ritual, Al, Al Kadizar captured and kept alive as a trophy with, in the deepest dungeon below Cripple Peak was mysteriously freed by hunched and heavily cloaked creatures. A powerful blade made of purest warp stone was pushed into his hands and he was guided, stumbling towards Nagash's throne room. Through sheer force of will, Al Kadizar summoned the strength yeah, to, yeah. to swing his battle sword yeah. and cut the hated necromancer down. Nagash roared as the terrible blade entered his unnatural life. Uh, that is interesting. Hmm. Nagash roared as the terrible blade ended his unnatural life, and the en energies of his cursed spell spiraled out of his control, sweeping across Nehekara and stirring the vast legions of dead into a shadowy unlife. More Cain and Star Stroibus. With the death of Nagash, Al Kadazar fled Cripple Peak, taking with him the great necromancer's crown with his sanity shredded by the horrors he had witnessed. The once mighty king wandered lost through the foreign lands until. Dying of hunger and thirst, he fell into the icy waters of the White River. Sometime later, the frozen corpse, still clutching the crown of Nagash, was found by a shaman named Caden. Pulling the crown from the dead king's frozen group and placing it upon his head, Caden's mind filled with visions and arcane knowledge. Returning his tribe, returning to his tribe, Caden brought great prophecies. He had the unknown king entombed beneath a mound upon which was built a temple and around which Caden's people built their dwellings. Caden named this place Morkai. And as it grew from the infertile soil of the Badlands, other settlements emerged around it, slowly at first, but more quickly, as the magic of Caden proved, provided tireless labor in the form of armies of the undead, and the realm of Stragos was born. Drawn by the presence of Nagash's crown, darker things came to Morkai. Like Among these was the vampire Ashura, who slew Caden and observed his throne. Under the, under the rule of Ushura, Stragos prospered among the coming of a great orc. Wah! Wow! <laughs> I think you were scared me. Uh, I was just saying the orc noise. So Morkine sacked and the mighty Ushuran slain by the potent magic of a powerful orc shaman. The destruction of Morkine, the crown of Nagash, was lost and the many tones of magical war transcribed by Caden yeah. were scattered far and wide, carried by those fleeting, uh, fleeing the destruction. The coming of Sigmar. Page 40. Jeez, page 40. Oh, wow, two hours already. Oh, wow, okay. Far to the north of Nehekara, a mighty water, warrior and a bold leader would not the warring tribes of men against their common enemies. And his ruler, Orton Goblin tribes, were driven from the lands, and his name and an empire was founded that would endure the world's end until the world's end. 
the Hilden Hammer. West of the Worlds, the mountains, the uh, dense forest stretch for league upon league, eventually giving way to Salt Lake and Marshland, where they met the distant coast. Here live many tribes of barbarous humans, each struggling tirelessly for survival against a seemingly endless number of beastmen, or uh, goblins, and orcs that plague the lands, eternally hungering for plunder and battle. As their civilization developed, these human tribes had begun to trade with the dwarves, learning from them the secrets of metalwork and trading their harvest with the finest dwarf made weapons and armor. Yet it was not until chance meeting that a true alliance was formed. Traveling through the lands of Unberugan tribe with bodyguards, the Dwarf High King Corgan Ironbeard was attacked by raiding orcs. The dwarves fought valiantly, but greatly outnumbered fell one by one until only the king remained. By chance, warriors of Unberugan tribe led their chieftain's son Sigma came upon the massacre and rushed to the High King's rescue. Sigmar led the charge, snatching the High King's fallen warhammer from the ground and swinging it mightily, slaying a dozen balls with each blow. So grateful was Kogan and so impressed by Sigmar's bravery that he gifted the young prince his mighty wounded hammer, Galmaraz, the birth of an empire. Through this meeting, mighty bonds of friendship were forged between the bold, branch young Sigmar and the gruff, Take a turn, Kurgan Ironbeard. From this friendship was formed a powerful alliance between dwarves and the Unbarogans. Yet the threat posed by endless tribes of orcs and goblins from the east would continue to grow in danger in the realms of men and dwarves alike. When Sigmar succeeded his father as the chieftain of Unbarogan, he determined to unite the warring tribes of men under his banner and drive the enemies from their lands. Through diplomacy and war, Sigmar forged a mighty coalition of tribes. Together with his dwarf allies, this coalition fought many wars and their mutual enemies, driving them from their lands. Yet for all their victories, the orc hordes continued to come and one last epic battle remained. In Blackfire Pass, Sigma and his tribal allies stood alongside the Kogan Iron Beard and hosted the wolves. Facing a near endless horde of orcs and goblins despite uh, vicious fighting and their horrendous losses, the army of men and dwarves prevailed. The power of orcs in the west was broken, and their primary route for battlelands in the, to the lands of men was closed. With this great victory, Sigma had unified his realm and was hailed emperor by his loyal chieftains. Sigmar's heirs. For 50 years, Sigmar ruled his empire and under his rule, his people prospered greatly. Mighty cities grew from tribal strongholds. Dwarf engineers teaching their human allies the craft of stone working and masonry. Building with great walls, roads, and temples. At the age of 80, still hale and healthy, Sigmar. Hale and healthy? What is that? Sigmar decided to relinquish his story and travel east of the world's edge mountains. What he planned, none know. Some say he wished to visit his old friend Kogan Ironbeard one last time. Others claim he had grown weary of peace and wished to test his mettle against the denizens of the darkness. Whatever the truth, Sigma passed the rule of his fledgling empire to the chieftains of the tribes which of, the, of which it consisted. To avoid infighting, these wise rulers chose to elect one of their number to stand as emperor in Sigma's stead. Swearing oaths of loyalty and duty to their chosen leader as Sigma looked on, his heart swelling with pride. I need some big ones. I need the big people. A big what? I need, I need in recognition of the sack, Sigma gives the Galmaraz to his successor and departed. I need the big people so this don't broke. What would break? This one is I like with that. But, oh no, it won't break. It won't break. But I'm but I need the big people he's gonna do like. Oh, okay, yeah, He's just... gonna win it. Yeah, okay, that's all right. Well, look, you got a couple of big ones there. There's some big ones you can use. I know. fight. I know, it's gonna grow. Yeah, just put that one back in the hole. Can you figure it out? The axe goes up. It goes up. So this one, this one has to go up all the time. You need to put it in. Yeah, there you go. Got it. From this first election was formed a system that would endure for a millennia. That of the Electoral College. In this manner, the descendants of the tribe chief, tribal chiefs would come to be known as the, uh, by the title elector count, and would meet to elect one of their number to reign as emperor when the need arose. Sigmar himself came to be worshipped as a god by his loyal subjects, and a great church spread across the lands to honor his name. An empire at war. Under Sigmar's rule, the territories of the tribal chieftains had each formed a self governing province within his empire. These provinces continued to grow in power and influence, but they enjoyed little respite from anarchy and war. Rampaging orphan, orphan goblin war bands continued to sweep down from the mountains, their numbers increasing in the years after Sigmar's departure into the east, and in their wake, oh, the battlefields would be stained red with the blood of men. Beastmen rampaged through the dark forest of the empire, destroying whole settlements and gutting, glutting themselves on the flesh of the slaughtered. Norskin longbows sailed from the frozen north to, to raid along the empire's coast, burning and pillaging. From marauding troops of barbarians, uh, barbarians came from the troll country to slaughter and sacrifice the name of the dark gods. Alongside these familiar enemies of old came youth rights, loathsome white men, corrupted beneath the sewers of ever growing cities. Whoa, yeah, you got all of it, hey? Yeah. So I see.
overrunning the streets, spreading plague and wreaking havoc before van vanishing once more into their tunnels. Shambling corpses under the command of wicked necromancers rose from their graves to wreck destruction among the living. Their inexplorable march overwhelming entire armies. These and other horrors assailed the Empire each and every year in increasing numbers, but through the seemingly unbreakable alliances formed between the Imperial provinces and with the inspired leadership of the elected Counts, the armies of the Empire grew in strength with each passing season, standing eternally ready to face their enemies with courage and ingenuity. Through as many trials in the Empire stood united for a time, at least. Oh. Okay. An Empire divided. For a thousand years, the Empire has prospered, and with the passing of each emperor, the elected council dutifully selected the best candidate to succeed the throne. But with the untimely death of Boris Goldgather, often called Boris the Incompetent, by the Prince of Present Eye, the Empire faced its greatest test. Boris had been an unpopular ruler. His reign is marked by corruption and suffering his people. When Boris died of a terrible pestilence that swept through the lands, the elected council could not agree on a successor, and for several years the throne sat empty. During this time, the Empire faced invasion from within, as armies of mutant rat men erupted from beneath its greatest cities. Had it not been for Graf Mandarin von Zelt of Middenheim, the Empire might, might have been overrun by the combination of plague and the verminous legions. Mandred led the armies of Middenheim against the verminous invaders and united his rival nobles to his cause. In a few so short years, the loathsome rat men had been driven from the Empire. In recognition of his popularity, the elected council agreed unanimously to Mandred's ascension to the Imperial throne. But upon Mandred's death, personal rivalries, conflicting ambitions, and petty jealousy divided the elected council once more, and they were unable to elect their successor. Blood was shed when these squabbles turned violent, and the counts returned to their lands with anger in their hearts. Ottilia. The elected Countess of Talabekland proclaimed herself Empress and declared war upon her main line, the elected Count of Stirland. You did it! Oh wow, you lined them all up. That's so cool, man. The age of three emperors. The decades that followed saw a succession of emperors and, uh, as one pretender after another launched a bloody coup to claim the throne. There was even an era where there were two emperors at the same time, one the elected emperor, the other the elected count of Telebeclan, who claimed a hereditary position as emperor following the self-appointed reign of Attilia. In effect, Telebeclan had seceded from the empire and was joined at various times by other provinces that were dissatisfied with the current elected emperor. To make matters worse, in 1547, Count Siegfried of Middenland decided to declare himself emperor as well. This audacious proclamation marked the beginning of the age of three emperors. With each, uh, with each claimant soliciting allies and supporters amongst the others. Uh, Nitro, do you want to get your iPad? Is it dead? Yeah, it's dead. Oh, it's dead, is it? Oh, okay. Um, mm. It's sleeping, Daddy. It's sleeping, is it? Yeah. Okay, well, we'll have to fix it later. I'm not it's back, okay? The provinces of the Empire now become more or less ungovernable. For, for the next four centuries, the elected counts fought rivals within their own lands as well as the numerous enemies that assailed them from without. As the power of the elected counts declined, the, emperor, uh, the Empire's cities looked more to their own affairs, and those that were not destroyed by war became prosperous under the leadership of Burgermeister's leaders elected from the mercantile classes and other wealthy citizens. Many of the larger cities began to construct fortifications and recruit their own standing armies, in effect becoming independent military, economic, and <coughs> political states separate from their surrounding provinces. With Sigma's peoples divided into squabbling fiefdoms, a fiefdoms. enemies gathered in ever greater numbers at their borders, eagerly Daddy, testing the Empire's waning defences. I don't, I don't know where they go. Oh, you can put them wherever you want, buddy. I don't know, I don't know. Yeah, you can put them wherever you like. You can put them there, if you want. That's okay. Yeah, you can put them there. Put him up there, yeah. That's is he okay. a good guy? He's a good guy, yeah. But why does he don't have a sword? Have a what? Sword. Yeah, he has a sword to fight the bad guys with. This one's all of under. This one and this one yes. and the big monster. Yep, that's and right. And the tree. And the tree, the tree and, monster, yeah. And the. Tree this man. one and this one and this one. Yep. That's right, buddy. Yeah, all of them. And why this dirt? Alright, now he's going to keep reading. The Anarchy. In its weakened state, the Empire became easy prey to its enemies. Rampaging armies of destruction fell upon several provinces, which, finding themselves unable to rely on support from the forces of their neighbours, suffered greatly. The worst such example came in 1705 when the Orc War Boss Gorbad Ironclaw led a truly massive horde of orcs and goblins through Blackfire Pass. Wow, Gorbad! 
The ravage rav- the southern corner of the empire to such an extent that the province of Solend, once, once rich and prosperous, was utterly destroyed. With its armies routed and its rulers slain, Solon was left to burn a black and wasteland by rampaging all hordes. Following the eventual defeat of the savage invaders, much of Solon was sub- uh, subsumed by neighboring Wizenland. In the year 1979, many of the elected counts had realized the need for strong emperor to reunify the warring nation. Though much, through much diplomacy, a majority of those elected counts who found themselves outliers in the contest for the throne became together and elected Margarita of Marienburg as empress. Unfortunately, this act was proved, was proved wildly unpopular with those electors, not consulted, not the least of whom was the head of the cult of Sigma, the Grand Theogenist, who was granted a seat in the Electoral College uh, recon- uh, in recognition of their rank and who refused to outright to acknowledge the vote. Ugh. Okay. Uh, rather than unite the empire, the appointment of Magrita led to ever ho- greater hostilities, and within the next few short years, the electoral system was completely coll- collapsed. The empire was, for all intents and purposes, no more. The Vampire Wars. As the age of three emperors had dragged on, a new threat had grown within the dark and forested province of Sylvania. Through a combination of deception, sorcery, and bloody murder, a vampire named Vlad von Karstein had wrested control over the region uh, from its previous ruler, Otto von Drach. Under Vlad's iron grip, Sylvania had grown strong and the taint of vampirism had spread. For a few hundred years, hiding his undying nature but behind a string of different names, Vlad ruled over Sylvania. The elected counts looked on with indifference at these changes, too caught up in their own petty power and struggles to uh, care about such backward corner of the Empire. In 2010, the Empire slid into anarchy. Vlad launched his bid to become the immortal vampire emperor. Marching at the head of the host of the undead, Vlad invaded Stirling and lost the mark before turning his attention to the heart of the Empire and marching towards the Raven. Uh, those three are the bad guys. For several decades, vicious wars raged until eventually Vlad himself was laid low by the Grand Theogenist Wilhelm III. Yeah, so he's a bad guy, and he's a bad guy, and he's a bad guy. Yeah. yeah so they're the good guys. But they're all the good guys, I don't know why they're the bad guys. Yeah, no, the fuck are the good guys, but they're the bad guys. Yeah, they are. Hey, the bad guys. Okay. With Vlad's passing, his undead, le- his undead legions collapsed and crumbled to dust, but the threat posed by his infernal bloodline was far from ended, and the other vampires rose power from Sylvania, who would continue to pursue Vlad's, Vlad's insane ambitions. Yes, buddy? What? I'm so scared to go downstairs. You're scared to go downstairs? Yeah. Oh, well, we'll stay up here with Daddy. I think Mummy will be home soon. Um, the Vampire Wars raged on to the year 2145, when Manfred von Karstein, the most vicious and cunning of Vlad's descendants, was defeated at the Battle of Hell, defended by the armies of several elected counts, briefly united Daddy, against a common enemy. Yeah. Can you go downstairs? No, Daddy, did you go downstairs? Yeah, it was me. But Daddy, Daddy has to make this video. But it's okay, Mummy will be back soon. Mummy will not be back. Yeah, she'll be back. Yeah. She'll be back soon. Yeah. She'll be back. Yeah. Uh, Look, there's more toys here. Look. There's more toys here. You should line them up. Because they're the good guys. See the good guys? You should get all the good guys and put the good guys at the front. The Empire today, it has been over 2,000 years since Sigma United the tribes in the center of the old world into a mighty nation. For a thousand of those years, the Empire grew and prospered, becoming wealthy, trade, and innovation. Other nations benefited greatly from their alliances with the Empire and its various provinces. In the kingdom of Estalia, Bretonia, and the, uh, the city-states of Chilea, all grew wealthy off trade with Sigmar's people. Yet strife and ruin, internal struggle, and invasion from without have all taken their toll upon the, one, upon the once great Empire. Divided by politics and uh, riven by the greed and short-sightedness of its rulers, the Empire has become little more than a collection of warring cities, city-states, and loosely formed provinces under rule. Uh, by pretenders who war with their neighbors bitterly, hoping to topple their visual rival, their rivals, and claim the crown of the empire for their own certain uh, that only victory over their rivals will restore the fractured nation. Yet this endless cycle of war, cycle of war, only further weakens the lands that were once the empire. Every battle of the unending civil war, costing lives of brave soldiers, all the wild beastmen, orcs, goblins, and darker things, creatures, and uh, that find civilization anathema to their existence, gather beyond the borders, hidden in the mountains and forests, oversh- overshadow, overshadowing all these threats, looms, the corruption, the chaos, and the desires of the dark gods. Their armies always gnawing at the edges of the old world or attacking it from within. Against these threats, mankind must stand united or be swept from the world. Faith in gunpowder. The Empire is arguably, arguably the most technologically advanced nation in the world. Its use of gunpowder, mechanical tools, and advanced methodology. Secondly, it's the dwarves. Uh, while the Welter State troops of the 
original armies might still fight with a sword, spear, and halberd, they are backed up by mighty cannonballs of handguns, pistol arms, horsemen, not to mention the more es esoteric weapons of war, such as the dreaded Hell Blaster, holy guns, or the rumbling steam tanks. The innovations of the Empire are principally focused on the industry of city of no industry of city of no and its engineering school, schools where new inventions for the elected counts armies were are routinely produced and sold from Marienburg to Talapine. Uh, okay guys I'm just gonna sort my son out real quick okay I think you can excuse me the challenge was to sit here in one sitting but my wife has left uh, I can't remember why she left she didn't tell me but I can't remember I was busy reading <laughs> All right, now try to sort you out right now, okay? We'll go downstairs and I'll we'll turn on the iPad so you can watch. Yeah? yeah. Okay. No, it's all it's sleeping. But we'll wake it up. But you're gonna wake it up to a long time. Yeah. Actually, you know what? I might just bring the book downstairs and I'll we'll continue filming. How about that? Sound good to you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sounds good to me. Yes. All right, we'll turn the microphones back on. Relocating now, we are on page uh, 44, just the end of 44. Wow. It's been a lot of hours, Nitro. It has been two hours and 26 minutes. Let's go. Come with Daddy. Careful, okay? Be careful. Okay. Be careful walking down the stairs, okay? Oh. That's it. Hold on to the railing. Okay. You're moving faster than me. Okay. Really? Okay. And you're so big, are ya? Okay, wait a sec, just wait, just wait. Just wait, just wait. There we go, it's all fixed. There you go. You're all set, Nitro? You're all set? Okay? All right, Daddy will just be in his room. Because that's where the stand is. <laughs> That is where the stand is. Okay, page 44, let's continue. All right. Fatherhood, here we go. We're all set up. Okay. Oh. Back to it. Okay. Oh, uh, that's, there we go. Maybe we can fix this light now too. That would be nice. Here we go. Okay. And it doesn't work. That's a real pain in the butt. Come on, you bastard. No. Still nothing. No. Doesn't want to work. All right. Whatever. Doesn't matter. Let's keep reading. Page 44. Oh, look. They've got a bookmark. How did I not see that before? <laughs> they've got a little bookmark for us. Oh, that's great. That's awesome. 44. Here we go. Chuck the bookmark in here. Okay. Ah, oh, the empire today. Oh, no, nope, we're down to this paragraph now. Equally as important to the armies of the empire as cannon and handguns of the proud knightly orders. Expert warriors cl uh, clad in heavy gothic plate armor mounted upon... I'm not ruining my book, am I? No, we're good. Mounted upon powerful war horses, they often exist outside the political structures of the elected council and claimants to the imperial throne. Fighting for honor, prestige, 
or the Articles of Faith as laid down by the Grand Masters. These orders make powerful allies and deadly enemies and petty nobles with designs on rulership. Some the orders are populists, such as the Knights Panther, who have chapter houses in almost every major province. Others, like the Knights of the Ebon Tier, number only a few dozen warriors. Knightly orders might be a secular fighting castle, cased like the Scions of the Blade, devoted only to mastering the art of war, or dedicated to a god like the Grim Knights of Moor, who count themselves the soldiers of the Empire's God of Death. Okay, I don't actually need this bookmark here yet. <laughs> Pretenders, centuries of unrest have seen the Empire regress politically, uh, resembling the scattered tribes once united by Sigma. Chieftains replaced by dukes, princes and barons, kingdoms and tribal lands replaced with provinces uh, and city-states. Presently, there are four great power blocks in the Empire, each ruled at least in part by a claim of the Imperial throne. Barony of Westerlin. Westerlin, ruled by the Empress Elspeth Marguerite IV, is the most prosperous region within the Empire. Its great wealth derived from the port city of Marienburg. Unlike many Imperial cities, Marienburg has not yet become an independent city-state. Though its ruling burgomeisters wield great power and influence over the young Empress Elspeth uh, Margrethe. The cult of Manan is a powerful faction within the city and uh, has its own influence upon the self-proclaimed Empress. For this reason, Margrethe is no, uh, often known deri deri derisively by her virals and detractors as the Sea Empress or the Empress of Coin, as a reference to her being a puppet of, of the mercantile guilds of the sea and the sea cult. Grand County of Osterland, uh, Count Sigismund Ulrich rules Osterland. Its forests and mountains cover the northernmost reaches of the empire, where it meets the southern borders of Kislev and the Sea of Claws. But politically, it encompasses large portions of Osterland, Ostermark, Hochland, and Middenland. Though in truth, it is a shadow of its former strength. Centuries ago, the Count of Middenheim claimed rulership over the north and was a claimant to the title of emperor. This led to a line of so-called wolf emperors who have continued to press their claim for control of the empire. Despite these ambitions, the current count is little more than the ruler of a city-state, even though he claims dominion over the entirety of Osterland and beyond. Principality of Reykland. Prince Wilhelm the first rules Reykland. The ancient and powerful heartland of the Empire born from Sigmar's own tribal lands. With Reckland's borders, the cult of Sigmar governed by the Grand Theogenist holds sway and the forces of chaos have the weakest grip upon the old world here. This is in no small part due to institutions such as the Knights of the Fiery Heart and the Order of the Silver Hammer. Uh, Templars of both orders travel the Empire alongside the armies of Reckland, rooting out worship of the Dark Powers. Such fantasism puts Reckland especially at odds with the uh, Duchy of Talavec, who they see perhaps rightly as a haven for pagan forces and elementist, elementalist witches. Hmm. Grand Duchy of Talavec, the largest yet most disparate region in the empire, the Grand Duchy of Talavec is ruled by Duke Ludwig the Eighth of the line of Ottilia. It, it ostensibly includes the provinces of Talavecland, Stirland, Avaland, Wizenland, the Moot, Though in practice many of the regions are self-governing and the cities of Talibheim and Noln are both powerful city-states in their own right, who owe little allegiance to the nobility. For hundreds of years the regions claimed the Ottilian emperors backed the cult of Tal and various other cults and rulers of the empire, eager to press their own claims to the emperorship. After the collapse of the electoral state system in 1979, the, du the duchy fractured further. Okay, uh, we are going to ch uh, charge the battery. There we go. Here's a battery, let's charge it. Okay. Oh, I gotta stop to charge things and take care of other stuff. All right, next page. The land of chivalry. Bretonia is a land of chivalry as vast armies were without a doubt among the greatest in the, in the world and the Sorias, be they noble or, present or peasant, are possessed of unshakable faith in the right, righteousness of their cause. If they could, oh, my wife's home, that's good. If there could be but a single bastion in the world where ideals of honor and goodness still exist, then surely it would be the kingdom of Brit Britonia. Giles Le Breton. Now, long before the coming of Sigma, humans settled in the lands between the Grey Mountains and the Great Ocean, but it was not until the arrival of warlike Bretonia tribe that a true nation was born. The Bretonia, with their own strange customs and notions, rejected Sigma's offers of alliance, remaining divided for centuries into numerous uh, petty fiefdoms. These battled constantly. What's that, Nitro? Wait, is Mummy home? Mummy's not home? Oh, I thought she was home.
You don't know where it is? Okay, here we go. Oh. Oh. I didn't realize my wife was gonna be gone so long. I did tell her I was trying to film this video. Oh well, such is life. Oh, you just got that water? Okay, well here's your water bottle here. Okay. Oh, it's got a little bit left in it. We'll put more in it, okay? Yeah? You want cold water? Yeah, okay. Cold. Yeah, well, we'll put, okay. You want cold water. Not water, just cold water. Uh, all right, there you go, buddy. Cold water and fresh water. Cold water and fresh water? Yeah. yeah. You're a fussy boy, aren't you? You're a fussy boy. What? <laughs> I am so fussy. Yeah, you're fussy. <laughs> okay, here we go. Back to it. Oh. She needs to get home quick so I can finish this video. Oh. Okay. All right. Let's probably move that back a little bit. Yeah, that's about right. The reading continues. Long before the coming of Sigma. Oh, yep, we read that. Um, Okay. These battled, these battled constantly for survival against rampaging orcs from the mountains, beastmen raiders from the forest, and undead invaders from the sea. Well, wow. fortunately, a young knight would rise and save his people from annihilation. In the year 976 of the Imperial Calendar, Giles Le Breton, Duke of Baston, rode to the relief of a neighboring fiefdom. Resting his army upon the banks of the lake, an ethereal woman appeared before him, rising from the waters, sensing her goodness. Giles knelt and asked her to bless his banner and his army. The fey woman bade Giles drink from her grail, a drinking vessel that granted those who drank it immortality. So blessed, Giles and his followers became the first knights of the grail, and one by one, Dukes of, the Dukes of Bretonia gathered to his banner. By the end of the century, Bretonia had been liberated from its foes, and the Dukes elevated Giles to the rank of High King of the Realm. Under his reign, Bretonia prospered as never before. The Lady of the Lake. In the long years before the time of Giles, the Bretoni tribes worshipped a host of different gods. Many of these were similar to those revered by the tribes of, to the east, such as Mor, the grim god of death, or the forest god Tal. Albeit under different names, in the centuries the time Giles, these gods have been largely replaced by the worship of the Lady of the Lake. The Lady is the patron god of Bretonia, her virtues are silvery in honour. It is the eternal quest of all knights to seek her out and earn her blessing and drink from the grail. Though she has no priest acolytes, her emissaries are fey the Fae Enchantress and the Grail Damsels that serve under her. Possessed of potent magical ab abilities, the Fae Enchantress is considered the living embodiment of the Lady and stands at the side of the King, guiding him in all things. Likewise, Grail Damsels guide the Knights of Bretonia on their quests, often accompanying them to war and lending their magical power to the armies in battle. Foreigners have been known to scoff at the notion of some magical aquatic woman protecting Bretonian knights from harm at least until they have seen with their own eyes the power of the lady turn aside arrows before they could strike home. How cool. The might of Bretonia. The blessings of the lady and the longevity of Bretonia's rulers have been both a blessing and a curse for its people. Though they enjoy great stability and safety, the realm has become trapped in time. Its dukes and kings are stewing the technological advances of neighboring uh, lands to remain, uh, to remain true to the ideals of chivalry and knighthood. Yet despite the disadvantages and stag of stagnant technology and rigid codes of chivalry, the armies of Bretonia are still a force to be reckoned with. The blessings of the Lady of the Lake grant her knights protection against all manner of harm, while filling their hearts with determination and grace, making them amongst the most formidable warriors in the world. It is just as well Bretonia's armies are so strong, for the history of Bretonia is one of constant war against enemies from without greedy aggressors who would violate the realm, intent of plunder and conquest and against enemies from within, the debased children of the Dark Gods who slay and burn in the name of their evil patrons. But the most bitter of all wars are those where knight fights against knight, duke against duke. Fostered by mistrust, vain, vain pride, betrayal, lust, and above all greed, this internecine strife has been the curse of Bretonia more than, more than any enemy. Only the rule of a strong monarch can stop the bickering amongst the dukes, settle their quarrels, and direct the energy of United Bretonia against its real enemies. When this happens, the, knights, the nation's knightly armies ride out on noble crusades, whether within the borders of the realm or off the far lands. Knights of the realm, the mighty Bretonian armies lies 
and its many ranks of knights organized by strict feudal hierarchy, these battle-tempered warriors ride to war upon the finest of charges. Intelligent, fiery, and strong animals of heroic proportions, glad in bar uh, baroque suits of armor, overlaid with rich liveries em emblazoned with their heraldic devices. A knight's weapon of choice is the lance with which much time is spent training in the joust in battle. In, the, in battle, the knights of Britannia fight in wedge-shaped lance formations, their charges piercing deeper into the ranks of the enemy like the weapon for which their name pierces flesh, capable of breaking apart even the legendary impenetrable battle lines of the dwarves. Peasants of Britannia. The bulk of Britoni any Britannian army is innumerable. What? What? The bulk of any Britannia... Uh, the bulk of a Bretonian army is made up of innumerable feudal peasants. By the standards of other lands, these peasants live in squalid existence, yet they revere their rulers as protectors of the realm and paragons of bravery and honor. Thus, when their lord calls, they eagerly take up arms. Peasant bowmen are the most numerous, the bow being a common hunting tool for the people of Bretonia and one and one many learn to use from a young age. Others, should they prove strong and capable enough, find, might find a place among their lord's men-at-arms. Men where they form solid blocks of infantry, infantry armed with heavy pole arms. Serving their lord in such a way is an honour not soon forgotten by those who survive. Throughout the centuries, vast hosts of knights have crossed the mountains that border fair Bretonia into the empire. Estalia, Tilea, and the border princes in the Badlands. Others have embarked upon great galleons, galleons and have carried the warriors and their steeds into the faraway lands of Norska, Araby, Albion, and even the mysterious land of the dead. The purpose of such crusades is simple, to crush the enemies of Bretonia before they can muster upon her border and threaten the humble existence of the peasant masses. In the burning heat of Nehekaran Desert, gallant knights have done battle with the undying legions of the two kings, glorious formations of horsemen crashing through endless regiments of skeletal soldiers until the crusaders' bright liveries were entirely obscured by powdered bone and the dust of ages. Entire orc and goblin tribes have been slaughtered by the crusading Bretonians without mercy, the crushing charges of galloping horse and heavy lance more than enough to slay the enemy elite before the rank. And file is driven into the sea. Monumental Bretonia fortresses have been built in the foreign lands in order to control remote provinces in the name of the king, but even the devout and ferocious knights of Bretonia cannot be everywhere at once. History has proved time and time again, uh, time, uh, t time and again, the truth of the ancient Bretonian adage, the realm and the king are one. Truly the lands have withered and suffered under the rule of corrupt and weak rulers. The Orc Slayer. The current ruler of Bretonia is Lewin Orc Slayer, so named for his crusade to rid the nation of Orc and Goblin tribes. Hailed as the greatest king since Giles the Bre Breton himself. Lewin has ruled for almost 80 years thanks to the longevity imparted to him by the Grail. An exceptional warrior and wise king, he rules from his court in the du Dukedom of Bastogne to maintain the stability of, of his kingdom. In recent years, the wars plaguing the empire have spilled. Uh, spilled hmm? over into the eastern parts of Bretonia, forcing Lowen to see off uh, brigand armies and ambitious imperial nobles. Though the king sees the empire's woes very, as very much an internal problem, he has entertained ambassadors from each of the major claimants to the imperial throne, with some of his dukes even going so far to, uh, as to campaign in the empire. More often than not, Lowen's attentions are focused on his western uh, shores and the realms of the south. The, the na na neighboring uh, nation of Estalia enjoys largely good relations with the Bretonia. The two kingdoms periodically fighting and border skirmishes. It is the beastmen, orcs, and undead who often raid from this direction and must be seen off by nightly armies. The king has, e has even shown an interest in bringing stability to the border princes, so it might act as a buffer against the Badlands and hostile realms further south, though so far Lowen has been thwarted in his ambitions uh, beyond a handful of exiled knights laying claim to the parts of this blighted region. Southern Kingdoms. Uh, though the Empire of Britannia and Kislev stand preeminent among the realms of man that lie to the west of the world's edge mountains, they are far from the only knights, only kingdoms in the old world. To the south lie numerous smaller countries, as if many as old, if not older than the lands of Sigma and the Bretoni, all powerful in their own right. The Border Princes. There are few human there are few human realms outside the northern wastes, as perilous as the Border Princes. Named for the countless exiled lords and ladies that claim corners of the region as their own, it has existed for hundreds of years on the frontier between the civilized lands of the Old World and the, and the southern wilderness of the Badlands. Filled with dismal crumbling towns and cities, often overlooked by a ruinous keep or castle, the, the people of the Border Princes live hard lives under endless succession of masters, the names of which can sometimes change from one day to the next. 
but the border, but the border princess is also a land of adventure and opportunity. Many, many come to the lawless region to make their fortunes, either by selling their skills as mercenaries in the armies of its multitudinous rulers, or by picking over the centuries of ruins, crypts, and tombs left behind by ancient empires and forgotten kings. Others come to escape justice in their homelands, fleeing ahead of outraged monarchs, furious magistrates, and angry mobs. All hope to leave behind the headsman's axe or hangman's noose and forget the crimes and misdeeds of their ignoble past. Straddling the border between the civilization and the wilderness. The border princes are riven with orc and beastmen tribes uh, beset by the restless dead, to name a few. Hang on, buddy. Almost done. Well, well not really almost done. <laughs> Uh, mommy should be home soon, buddy. Unlike the great nations of the old world, it's settlement. Uh, what? Mm. To name a few of its numerous perils. Unlike the great nations of the old world, its settlements do not enjoy protection of state sponsored armies or crusading knights and must instead rely on the personal uh, retinues or militias of their lords and masters for security. Consequently, they live with the knowledge that at any time hostile armies might crest the nearby hills and descend upon them. Thus are the people of the border princes, often as hard as the lands they inhabit, accepting that they must fight for everything they have or join the countless generations of bones buried beneath their feet. Beggar lords, the most fascinating detail of life in the border princes, the endless pro procession of rulers, outcast criminals, and even the odd do-gooder who thinks of themselves as the savior of the south all come to the border princes because their lands will not have them. Of course, carving out uh, a piece of the feast of the what? Car carving out a piece of the border princess for your own personal kingdom is no small, small feat and involves plenty of politicking, skullduggery, and fair measure of violence. For this reason, the castles, towns, and fiefdoms of the border princess are constantly changing hands as one lord or the other rises to power, only to be ousted or killed by the next. Occasionally, dynasties might arise for a few glorious generations, a kingdom might endure. Inevitably, however, treachery, war, or simple misfortune befalls its ruler, and the cycle begins anew. The civil war in the empire has been good for the border princes and many exiled nobles have, uh, have found new allies within its boundaries. Yes, buddy? All right, I'll come downstairs, okay. Hang on, I'll just read this and I'll come downstairs, okay? Uh, men like Karl Rockwell, the hermit prince, or the Lord Gunter Drunkel Drunkelmund, the Broken King, formerly Rakeland and Mindenheim, respectively make good money recruiting veteran soldiers from their region of their imperial patrons. Equally, the so-called Prince Jürgen Esselhofen, the Lord of Paupers, fights proxy wars in the name of Marienburg. He's tasked to keep southern, posts, uh, southern ports open for illegal trade. Okay, here we go. I'm coming downstairs, Nitro. All right, we're transferring downstairs. <sighs> okay. Transferring downstairs, here we go. To be with Nitro. Nitro! Uh, I named him Nitro because it's a cool name. Your name's pretty cool, isn't it, Nitro? You have a cool name? Daddy, yes. I'm gonna have this one. Oh, no. <laughs> we can't buy it. I'm not gonna buy it, buddy. What? Daddy already bought you one, remember? I bought you two, actually. I bought you two of them. But I'm not gonna have Okay. You're not gonna what? Okay. Well, you don't have to, you got lots of games there you can play, buddy. You got lots of games. Okay. Here we go. All right. Um, The Empire is far from the only nation to benefit from the rogues inhabiting the border princes. Exiled Bretonian knights such as Sir Cecil Gaston, the Black Knight, Adele Montour, the Cursed Maid of Mossillon, or Sir Julian Pontin, the Craven, have all been known to give shelter and aid to Bretonian knights questing in the south. Some princes are even more brazen when it comes to their mercenary nature, such as the Tilian Prince Fredo uh, Tordono, known as the Bastard Prince, or Carolina Aquilena, the slayer of queens, Italian princes such as Dessa Donalba, the bloody baron, or Lord Fulma Ortegeta, Don of the Red River, are barely more trustworthy, and only when dealing with their own kind. Then there are outsiders like Boyar Valdos Uvetovska, the Oathbreaker, or Yalska, what? Skalagrison, the Thane of Crows, men best avoided for the dark 
deeds they are perpetrated to have indulged in. That such cruel and ruthless outcasts rule in the border princes should be a sim ample warning to any traveler that it pays to know whose lands you are blundering into. Oh, let's turn on more of these lights. There's not enough light in here, buddy. Oh, there we go. That's better. The free cities of Tilea. To outsiders, Tilea is a chaotic land of ever-changing alliances and nefarious rulers, a kingdom riven by constant civil war and treachery. In truth, it is a kingdom only in the eyes of its neighbors, for the nation of Tilea consists of loose alliance of rival city-states and their environs, all bound together by complex trade deals, brokered by cunning merchants, and a need for mutual protection, fostered by powerful and wealthy families locked in generations, long vendettas with rivals. At times in its long history, Tilea has been a republic centered around the prosperous capital city of Remas, though at such times its, mer its merchant lords have always tended to look to their own selfish interests even while paying whilst paying lip service to the idea of a united nation and a centralized government much to the horror of its northern neighbors Tilea scorns the idea of nobility and long ago did away with uh, all of the what long ago did, oh okay you can see me there right yep you can see me cool long ago did away with all the border that can be caused by having kings and queens instead it has cultivated mer mercantile dynasties of family's power and position being built upon the extent of its trade and greed rather than any notion of a hereditary right to rule. Tilay and Zion always have been an in inventive and adventurous people. While some would argue that they simply dabble in new technologies in order to discover new ways of further enriching themselves, it cannot be denied that many of the most fabulous inventions of the old world were conceived and crafted in the workshops of world-renowned artisans in Remus, Pavona, Lucini, or one of the land's numerous other great cities. The people of Tilea are also known for being bold and adventurous explorers, though once again many would argue that, that this adventurous nature stems from a desire uh, to discover hidden riches and find new people with whom to trade. Whatever the case, Tilean explorers have wandered far and wide across the face of the world and many have and made many wondrous discoveries for the betterment of all the nations of man. Tileans were the first old world old worlders to reach the eastern empire of Grand Cathay by land, and the first to cross the great ocean and venture into the jungles of the New World, always returning with tales of the wonders discovered. Dogs of War Whilst the many merchant princes of Tilea employ large retinues of guards to protect their interests, none of the many city-states maintain standing armies, relying in times of need. Um, upon mercenary forces these are recruited from the many mercenary regiments the nation is famed for and are extremely well paid by the merchant princes keen to secure their loyalty. These mercenaries are commonly known as the dogs of war. Perhaps unsurprisingly, their professional nature and desire to survive long enough to enjoy their pay. Their armies can be most effective both in the inner city battles between the free cities and in, uh, in seeing off invaders. Sometimes a merchant pri uh, prince might even take it upon his or herself to lead a grand expedition to some far-flung region of the world, hiring a mercenary army to help them carve out a new Tilean post, usually for the purpose of setting up a lucrative trade route. In this way, Tilean ports have sprung up in Lustria, of the Southlands, and as far as the Dread Sea, all to serve the interests of one prince or another. Unfortunately for their masters, dogs of war armies can be notoriously fickle, especially in the in the coin runs, if the coin runs low or they receive a better offer. It is not unknown for an entire army to change its allegiance or even quit the field on the eve of battle. The most mercenary generals value their reputation enough that they have the decency to give their current employer a chance to make any outstanding payments or to counter an enemy's offer. Others might simply take their payment and disappear, safe in the knowledge that their would-be employer will not be around to post battle, around post battle to complain of having been conned. Uh, even more untrustworthy than the dogs of war, though, equally rooted in the Tilean way of life are the pirates of the Saratosa. For hundreds of years, the island, uh, the large islands of, off the southern coast of Tilean Peninsula have a den of thieves and cutthroats of all stripes. These criminals have been a plague upon shipping the, from the Black Gulf to the Great Ocean and far beyond. Far, far from trying to stamp them out, many merchant princes consider the pirates their de facto navy and will often pay for their services against their rivals and the enemies of Tilea itself. Okay. All right. Only 300 pages to go. <laughs> Seriously, we're on page 54. Wow. Kingdoms of Estalia. Estalia, according to its long and... How many minutes have we done? Oh, almost three hours. Wow, two hours and 53 minutes. Oh, okay. 
Kingdoms of Estalia. Estalia, according to its long and storied history, was the first land settled by humans in the Old World from its dry and arid northern mountain ranges to its fertile southern coasts. It is covered in a patchwork of ancient kingdoms and proud cities, the greatest of which are Bilbali in the north and Margarita in the south. The ruling families of these rivals share a long and tangled history that stretches back over hundreds of years and involves a great many marriages, assassinations, and betrayals of trust. Though the people of Estalia seldom concern themselves with affairs beyond their own borders, the nation boasts an extensive coastline, many great ports, and is well noted for the skill of its sailors. Though most kingdoms employ only a small fleet of war vessels, hundreds of merchant ships sail daily from its harbours. Um, ships bearing the colours of the Estalian kingdoms are a common sight in ports from Barakvar to Marienburg and far beyond. As a result, Estalia enjoys a more important, uh, an important position as a merchant nation with goods uh, from far, far flung corners of the world flowing into and out of its many markets. Much like its fleet, the military might of Estalia is decentralized, comprising the personal retinues of its many kings, queens, and lesser nobles, each of whom is responsible for recruiting and maintaining their own armies, and in many cases, small naval fleets. These armies exist to protect their homelands and those of their neighbors from aggression and invasion. Alliances between neighbors are common, but rarely do armies. But rarely do armies come together in significant numbers, only doing so in times of great need. Even so, Estalian regiments are well equipped with, uh, with crossbow and pike, and extensively trained to fight in a style similar to that of the famed Tulane mercenary regiments. These regiments enjoy plentiful support from Estalia's numerous cavalry formations, most of which consist of young nobles mounted upon the finest war horses. The kingdoms of Estalia are being famed for the quality of their steeds. Beside these ride uh, Templar knights of uh, several famed holy orders, such as the Knights of the Blazing Sun, a sophisticated order whose members study the science of warfare and excel in its many aspects from pitch battle to lightning raids and siegecraft. Southern Wars. Oh, what are you laughing at, boy? I didn't. <laughs> he fell off the edge. Yeah, I just. Southern Wars, sheltered as it is to the north by the lands of Britannia and to the east by Talea, the Empire in Kislev, Estalia has enjoyed a relatively peaceful existence when compared to other nations of the old world. Even so, orcs, beastmen, and the undead have all plagued Estalia throughout its history. The former emerged regularly from the untamed Irania. Uh, the untamed what? Iran, Ir, Irania? Mountains and the Ir, Ir, Irana mountains and the wide tracts of forest that cling to their foothills, seeking war and destruction. The latter often come by sea in the distant lands of the dead to conquer in the name of the long-forgotten kings or emerge by night by the many tombs, barriers and that lie scattered through the wilderness. One notable in, invasion into the heart of Estalia was that led by the vampire lord Nargur. The foul creature and his undead armies left devastation in their wake as they marched almost unopposed across the land, only to be stopped in the battle for Margarita, where some said the goddess Myrmidia, patron of the Estallians, appeared and personally destroyed the vampire, reducing it to ash uh, with her divine light. Hmm. That's cool. I never heard of the vampire lord Norgul before. That's awesome. Several times in its history, Estalia has come under attack from and even been occupied by human invaders from Araby, which is ironically similar to Arab countries. Uh, and in particular, the Sultanates of Araby, an ancient and prosperous land that clings to the western edges of the great southern continent and stands among the southernmost outposts of humanity in the old world. Several times as Araby turned its attention north across the sea towards the rich and fertile soil of Estalia. And warships have sailed from great coastal cities to raid the coast of Estalia. On more than one occasion, conquering uh, Arabians have landed armies upon Estalian soil to besiege the castles of its kings and queens. As recently as the 15th century, as reckoned by the imperial calendar, invaders from across the waves conquered great parts of the southern Estalia and formed their own kingdoms, some of which endured for decades before being driven back into the sea by foreign mercenary armies in the pay of Estalians. These, uh, these invasions have left their mark, and even today many of the noble lords and ladies that rule in Estalia's southern kingdoms are descended from those that once ruled as hostile invaders, albeit now under the colours of the Estalian kings. The Enchanted Wood. Ooh, it's a picture of a wood elf. I love that. That is nice. Yeah, wood elves, just their aesthetic is so sick. Friggin' love it. The Enchanted Wood. The wood elves are the secretive defenders of the great forest of Athalor and their armies are armies ever on the march carrying spear and bow against the agents of disorder and ruin, the sentinels of ancient sites across the old world. 
The elves of Athelor and fight a never-ending battle of vengeance against the lesser, lesser races that trespass upon their lands in the ever-spreading corruption of chaos. The elves of Athelor. In their prime, the elves of Uthelmine maintained colonies and outposts throughout the, uh, the known world. Nowhere was this more true than with the bounds of Ethan Arvan, the old world, yet it was not to last. When the treachery of uh, Malerion beset their ancestral lands with fury and war, the elves had little choice but to abandon many of their distant holdings and return home, lest by defending both realms that they would ultimately save neither. Yet not all the elves who had settled in the old world were prepared to abandon it. Most notable of the, those who remained uh, behind were the elf colonies that dwelt near the forest of Forest realm of Athelorn, those who renounced all ties to the Phoenix King and struck out in the cause of independence. So did the forest of Athelorn become a realm unto itself. But Athelorn is not like other forests. Its ancient trees long ago found vigor and voice, and they learned to hate the lesser beings who swarmed about the forest's eaves, gnawing at the verdant majesty with axe and flame. Few intruders survive unbidden with, within Athelorn's bounds, for the vigilance of the tree spirits is matched only by their loathing of interlopers. That the Wood Elves were not consumed by the vengeful spirits of Athelorn is one of the peculi peculiarities of history. The alliance between Elvenkind and Living Forest was born of a shared peril, for at that time the Dwarves of the Grey Mountains pressed hard upon the forest borders, felling trees to feed hungry furnaces and slaying Elves as payment for past grudges. The Elves of that region were few and the Dwarves many. Only through combining their forces could the Elves and Tree Spirits hope to survive. One dreadful night, a tremendous battle raged by the flickering of light, of the dwarvish logging fires, outnumbered by the combined forces of the elves and the thorn limb forest spirits defending the realm. The dwarf interlopers fought with grim desperation. Time and, time, time and again, the dwarf invaders charged into the woods, hoping to catch the elusive elves. But the woods seemed to close around the dwarves, binding them with vine and root, bludgeoning them with bow and branch. When dawn came, and the shattered dwarf shields and patches of scorched ground remained to show that a battle had raged at all. For weeks thereafter, in the deep holds of the Grey Mountains, dwarf sentries looked westwards for some sign of pure pioneering armies that would never return. In Athelorin, the battle had forged an alliance that would never, that would forever endure. Until the end times. Okay. Children of nature. From that day forth, the fates of the elves in the forest were intertwined. What began as a desperate alliance became something far deeper and more pervasive. With every passing generation, the Wood Elves became in character more akin to the forest they inhabit. Wrathful and vigorous during the summer months, torpid and somnolent with the onset of winter. So too have they taken the tree spirit's capriciousness and, a and distrustful nature. One can never be entirely sure how Wood Elf will react for their thoughts and reasoning bound as they are to the forest's peculiar consciousness and are unknowable to an outsider. Where once they lived for the joy of uh, ex exploration, the elves became hostile, extremely hostile to the outside world, leaving the borders of their realm only to wreak bloody retribution upon those who have earned their displeasure or, or to defend ancient groves and distant lands. As time marches on, these groves are ever more assailed and plundered, and so the wood elves become ever more vengeful. Their desire for solitude has been sacrificed to ensure the sanctity of their race and indeed the world at large. So it is that the great forest of Athalorin is now not merely the wood elves' dwelling place, it is their ally, their protector, and their ward. The elves are bound to it, body and soul. Those outsiders foolish enough to set foot within Athalor and risk not only the wrath of the trees, but also the keen-eyed elves who watch every path and stand over every glade. A hidden nation. The aloof wood elves are isolationist in the extreme, caring not for the affairs of other realms and races. Their concern is solely for the survival of Athalorin and the splintered offshoots across the face of the world. Truly, the wood elves feel a little sadness when other nations burn, so long as their cherished woodlands can endure. Yet this is not to say that the wood elves entirely shun dealings with the outside world. Though the otherworldly waters of the crystal mere prophetess, Prophetesses and scryers sift the strands of future fate, seeking significant signs or portents of the next threat. Not all such threats need to be ended entirely, but merely whittled to weakness or redirected upon a different path, one that does not lead to Ethel Lauren's borders. It is fortunate that it is, it is so, for the Wood Elves are less numerous than other elven peoples, and they can ill afford bitter and bloody campaigns of interminable length. Better that each battle is carefully chosen for a maximum effect, Slain Orc, Warlord, and the coalition of tribes their commanders is as likely to tear, apart itself, uh, tear itself apart as it is to continue upon its rampage. Lure a beastman, Warherd, onto the defenses of an empire town and its deep-rooted hatred of man. 
will drive all other goals before it. It is fair to say that the Wood Elves have little in the way of allies, but rather a wide array of enemies in varying degrees. Enemies that can be used as weapons against one another as need dictates. A force for good. In recent years, the Atavastic Beastmen have multiplied across the Old World and beyond, spawned from the dark hanks of chaos-tainted woodlands. From the north come tribes of warlike men, while the division within the Empire and the squabbles of its rulers are a sign of greater dangers to come. For this reason, the armies of the Wood Elves march abroad in numbers greater than ever before, waging their covert wars against those in the sway of the ruinous powers, wherever they may be found, and even making alliances with those other races who would stand against the rising darkness within the Old World. The, wooden, the, the Wood Elven nation is ruled by etern its eternal queen, Ariel, and her consort, the King of the Woods, Orion. As the avatar of Isha, the ancient elven goddess of nature, Ariel is one of the most powerful wizards in the world, able to confound enemies by controlling the very woods around them, or kill them by causing nature itself to rise up and slay them. While she is the mother of her forest nation, Orion, master of the wild hunt, is its greatest general. Tied wholly to the seasons of the world, Orion dies each winter, his body consumed by a funeral pyre. With the coming of spring, Orion is reborn into the body of a young elven warrior, chosen to become the next incarnation of the king in the woods and continue his eternal rule. Hmm, interesting. I didn't know that. The Oak of Ages. At the heart of Athalorn stands a tree like no other, the Oak of Ages. Prodigious in both height and breadth, it, uh, it dwarfs the surrounding forest and teems with life, its branches filled with spirits and spites, its roots fashioned into halls and chambers. The Oak of Ages is more than just a heat, a heart of Athalorn. It is the center of the world of roots, magical paths that spread out across the entirety of the old world and far beyond. The Wood Elves use these secret ways to travel the world, appearing suddenly in distant lands or vanishing from enemies as if they were never there. It is a gift of Ariel that allows her people to influence events in distant realms, often without the knowledge of their foes. Hmm. A magical tree. That is very cool. You can travel the world using the tree. Nice. Very cool. Okay. Kin band and clans. The Wood Elves have little in the way of a formal military. Instead, an army of Athalorn is an alliance of kin bands drawn from different clans each bringing martial skills honed in the dangerous environs of Athalorn. These kinbands seldom meet the enemy in open battle, preferring swift and deadly surprise attacks. The woods too are their allies, and the clans will call upon the forest creatures, spirits, and spites to aid them in battle. Great treemen might even join their ranks, uprooting themselves to aid their elven allies in the defense of their hidden home. The sight of the very trees themselves come to life is one few adversaries of the wood. Elves soon forget. Oh, okay. Wow. Here we go. Lords of Ulthuan. Haughty and proud, the High Elves ruled, rule over the vast island and continent of Ulthuan. <sighs> Steeped in ancient magics and possessed of unsurpassed martial skills, their prowess is such that no single enemy has ever truly defeated them. Beyond their borders, their elegant fleets rule the high seas. Carrying the armies of Ulthuan to every corner of the world. Masters of Magic. First among the races the Old Ones created were the Elves, called Asura in their own tongue. To provide a home for these peoples, the Old Ones made a kingdom for the Elves, raising the Isle of Ulthuan up from the ocean floor. Here the Elves would prosper, producing wondrous, wondrous art and mastering the primal energy known as, as magic. But the passage of time was not kind to the elves. When the polar gates collapsed and the raw stuff of chaos flooded the world, all the ones were beset by monstrous fiends as demonic entities. Yet the elves rose to meet this almost overwhelming challenge. As the tide of chaos crashed upon the shores of Ulthuan, the elves stood firm in the defense of their realm, led by the first and mightiest of the phoenix kings, Inarion. Inarion and protected by the potent magic of their mages, the elves halted then, turned back the legions of chaos. Despite the blood and sacrifice, this victory of chaos was the greatest achievement of the elf race. But it was a tainted victory, for in order to achieve it, Anarion raised the sword of Cain, bringing the curse of madness upon himself and his descendants. Furthermore, their great victory fed the vanity and ego of the elves, who since then have considered themselves preeminent amongst all the races of the world. A martial people. The history of the Asur since that time has been one of almost constant battle and warfare. 
Many of these wars have been valiant and noble, for the High Elves have always been the mightiest opponent of the ruinous powers, but almost as many have been brought about by the pride and arrogance. Mo oh, you alright buddy? You drop your water? Most insidious of these were the civil wars that divided their people into those who adhere to the old ways and those who have embraced cruel new masters. Oh, I don't know, Mummy did that, but she'll she'll fix it when she comes home, okay? It's alright. What? It's alright. Yeah, mummy mummy's gonna fix it when she comes home. It's okay. It's alright. Yeah, it's okay, buddy. Uh, okay. So many of these wars have been valiant and noble for the high elves have always been the mightiest Oh wait. Have always been mighty spread of the ruinous powers, but almost as many as have been brought by the about by pride and arrogance. Most insidious of these were the civil wars that divided their people into those who adhere to the old ways and those who have embraced cruel new masters, an ongoing struggle that has raged for thousands of years and consumed countless legions across history. These wars have forged a race very different to the mystics and scholars known as the old ones. Although the high elves are still the supreme exponents of the magical arts, their armies have become the most professional and disciplined of all in this new age of war. All citizens of Wolfram are taught how to use weapons from an early age. It is said that high elves learn to shoot a bow before they can read and to wield a sword before they can write. The skills lenders use mean that the High Elves are expert warriors by the time they reach maturity. This multitude of deadly fires, an entire race honed for war, forms the backbone of Ulthuan's mighty armies. The, mighty ar the armies of Ulthuan. Equipped with finely wrought armor armed with bow or spear and shield, the glittering hosts of Ulthuan are possessed of a uh, preternatural deadliness. Yet for all their prowess, these citizen soldiers are but the rank and file of a High Elf army. More elite warriors exist in the form of famous silver elms. Helms, the noble elven knights who fight in the vanguard of every high elf army, the graceful reaver cavalry that guard the shores of Eldarion, the famed dragon princes of Calador, descendants of those who rode drakes to battle in ages past. Riding alongside these cavalry formations are charioteers from Tiranoc and Trace, the, the latter drawn not by elven steeds, but by ferocious white lions that prowl the mountains of that mystical realm. Oh, mommy's home. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, I had to transfer down here because where, where did you go? Oh. Oh, come on, trust me, I'm at church. Like volleyball. Like volleyball, ka? Oh, uh, I'm gonna. But then I won't look good. Okay, I'm gonna transfer back upstairs. Oh. Wait, no, I'm gonna what? go back. You're gonna get back? What? I, I told you I was going to take a video, Diba. Yeah. Oh, okay. You, you can take Nitro with you. Oh, yeah, there's a baby there. Whoa, when okay. Baby Back upstairs baby. into the office. I'll show you. It's so fun there. Okay. Woo! Go with Mummy, Nitro. You got to go with Mummy, okay? Here we go. Oh, okay, this was the right page, yes? This was the right page, yeah. These are matched both in valor and skill by elite infantry. The ever silent Phoenix Guard are granted visions of their own demise by Asurian himself, the supremely skilled sword masters of Oeth, who strike as swift as lightning with the two handed swords with which they endlessly hone their martial form. The white lions of Trace, every bit as ferocious as their namesakes, wield elegantly curved axes that can hew necks as easily as the birches of their homelands. And above each High Elf war host saw the huge majestic dragons that have accompanied the High Elves to battle since the time of the Great Cataclysm. It is even said that, in recent years, the Elders of Drakes have been roused from their slumbers by the clamor of war. Lords of the Phoenix. Uh, the armies of Wolfram are led to battle by the greatest heroes of the age. The general of a High Elf army will have studied the art of war from infancy, committing to the memory of the countless essays and uh, treaties laid down by the greatest High Elf commanders that came before them. These works, written by the likes of Calador I and uh, Bel Coradris, mean that a High Elf general can call upon a store of military wisdom undreamt of by those who would command the armies of their enemies. Furthermore, the military acumen of each Elven officer will be bolstered by the spell lore and magical abilities of the finest mages. Even the youngest and most hot-blooded dragon mage can summon a storm of pyrotechnics. With such capable mages amongst their ranks, the armies of Ulthuan have little to fear from the primitive magic of their enemies. 
It is this combination of skilled troops and expert leadership uh, and consummate sorcery that make a high elf army such a deadly force. With these finely honed war hosts, the high elves impose their will upon all the corners of the world, be they land or sea, for their fleets are unmatched in speed and power, arrogant and prideful, supremely confident and skilled in all the manner for the arts of war. The high elves have no compunction about uh, using unstoppable force to achieve their ends. Uh, they know it is their destiny to shape the fate of the world and woe betide any that stand in their way. Colonies across the world. Uh, though time and the ascension of the younger races may have worn away the might of, wow, looks like I've read hardly anything, uh, might of the high elven empire, theirs remains one of the most widely spread races of the world. Elven colonies, once numerous in the lands of the empire, Britannia and greater old world, now cling to coastal regions where they stand as trade hubs and diplomatic outposts, connecting the court of the phoenix kings to kings, emperors and lords from the shores of Araby to the wilds of the Southlands. In turn, many of the younger races, though distrustful of the high elves, rely upon their fleets to keep the oceans and seas of the warhammer of the world safe for trade. There being no shortage of pirates, monsters, and even darker things lurking both above and below the waves. Even further afield, high off ports guard the great ocean tradeways of the Warhammer of the world. Uh, beyond the churning gulf, the fortress of Dawn guards the straits between the Southlands and the south Southern Wastes, while the Tower of the Sun and the Tower of the Stars ward the entrance of the Sea of the Dread. In the distant east, even more towers, fortresses, and ports connect all to one to far off kingdoms, such as in Nippon, Nippon. <laughs> Nippon is just Japan. And Grand Cathay. In this way, the High Elves maintain an unbroken chain of safe harbors for their ships from one end of the world to the other, as well as a presence in the court, courts of almost every great ruler in the world. Okay. Oh. A shadow of chaos. As a power of chaos again. Once again, wax is strong, and the armies of the Dark Gods gather in the north. The High Elves find themselves preparing to face their ancient foe as custodians of the world, and at least in their own eyes, the inheritors of its defense, the armies of High Elves, are once more on the move. Though some among their kind feel it is time for the younger races to stand on their own, there is little faith among the Elves that man is able to hold back the mind of the Dark Gods. <clears throat> Many, in fact, blame the rise of chaos over the millennia upon humanity, believing they too easily fall under the sway of chaos, ultimately filling the ranks of their enemies with corrupted warriors and murderous madmen. To this end, elven envoys have begun to veer across the old world, lending their knowledge and guidance to more rulers. It is the hope of small numbers, uh, hope of a small number of these envoys that the divided nations of man might be forged into a force to stem the tide of chaos, so that's lest it sweep across the lands and isolate the elves upon their distant island nation. At the same time, the elven navy grows in strength just as the magical defenses of Wiltawine are increased for any blow from chaos that lands upon the old world will inevitably attempt to find its way to the mystic isle's shores. Funubar of Lothurn Following the coronation of Funubar of Lothurn as Phoenix Kin, the realm of Ulthuanum underwent many changes. Amongst these was the establishment of garrisons across the coast of the Old World. This was part of a greater move away from isol isolationism with fleets of sea guard patrolling the waters between Ulthuan and the Old World in an effort to drive away pirates and marauders, thus keeping wealth flowing into elven cities. Woo! Classic dwarf image right here. 6th edition rule, uh, dwarf book. The nostalgia. It's great. The dwarfs are a venerable and proud race born from, long distant, uh, from a long distinguished line of warrior thanes and vengeful kings, the, uh, the ancestor gods. Craftsmen beyond compare, they dwell in great subterranean fortresses far from the light of the sun. The traditionalist dwarf have much in common with the stony kingdom as for every one of their number is as stubborn as unyielding as rock. Children of the Ancestors. The history of the Dowie, as the dwarves called, them, called themselves, begin with the awakening of the firstborn, their pantheon of gods, chief, chief amongst them who were Grongni, Grimnir, and Valaya. According to the dwarf tradition, these gods were carved by time from the rock, rocks of the mountains, birthed by stone itself. They believe that the first dwarves, the children of these ancient ancestors, inhabited the southern portion of the world's edge mountains, migrating northwards as their numbers grew and splitting into different clans, many of which were led by a living god. In these ancient days before the coming of chaos, the Dawi were cave dwellers who fashioned primitive tools from flint and eked out a living in the bleak 
and inhospitable mountains. Then, as now, the dwarves were hardy and enduring folk, led by the gods themselves. The dwarf civilization soon developed um, from a stone era into a bold new age. With the iron and steel weapons and armor that Grumni, the forge father, taught them to make, the dwarves were able to fight off the terrors of the mountains and expand into new territory. It was Grimnir the warrior who staved off giants, trolls, and marauding orcs while teaching his charges the arts of battle. It was Valaya the protector who showed the wandering dwarves the value of strong dwellings and the importance of bonding and community for the still developing clans. As the dwarves spread through the, throughout the mountains, seeking out new veins of precious metals, they found many strongholds, each a small fortified realm centered around a productive mine, a bastion in the rocky wilderness. The largest of these became known as Karax in the dwarf tongue, and the glory of these great fortress cities was fabled. Eventually, the dwarves reached the northernmost peaks of the world's edge mountains and a desolate region scattered with the bleached bones of many creatures. They called this cold and barren land Zorn Uzgul, or the Great Skull Land. Here, most dwarves turned back for the harsh region provided a scarcity of mineral wealth, although a few of the boldest clans pushed onwards, some turning uh, west into lands called Norska, others heading east across the Great Skull Land and daring to enter the mountains of Morn. Thus was founded the great dwarf realm, the Karaz Angkor. At its center lay the great city of Karaz Akarak, the ever peak. For a long while, for a long while, the widely dispersed clans maintained contact with each other, while each delved more deeply beneath the mountains. Soon, however, they would be separated by a growing storm, unlike anything seen before. Page sixty-six. Woo. Okay. Uh, I think we may need to charge now the phone. So, this comes off. Let's charge the phone, please. Thank you. Golden Age. The dwarves suffered greatly during the long centuries following the Great Cataclysm, and much was taken from them that could never be reclaimed. Many holds fell and entire clans were lost. Worse, their ranches disappeared one by one during the long years of war. Grimnir, as all know, had marched boldly into the north to challenge the Dark Lords, whilst Grumni, Valaya, and their kin returned at the fullness of time to the mountain's heart, going back from whence they came. So it was in so it was that in the years following the war against chaos as the dwarves re-emerged from their strongholds, they were eager to rebuild and stamp their authority upon the mountain realm. Many great works were undertaken, strongholds were deepened, and explorations in the depths of the world were launched in search of ever greater mineral riches. Great halls and tunnels were excavated, expanding into the colossal into colossal underground cities, all interconnected by vast subterranean highways. When the elves returned to their colonies in the old world, the dwarves greeted them gladly and eagerly traded with them. A long age of peace and prosperity has begun. In Karazakarak, the High King sat upon his throne, presiding over the Dwarf Lords who ruled the other holds. New alliances were nurtured uh, with the primitive race of man who looked with awe at the Elder Races and sought wisdom and guidance. Alas, the hard-won peace would not last, for the treachery of the Elves would incite a terrible war that was to rage for several hundred years. The time of woes, following the proactive and, and bitter war of the beard, or as the Dwarfs call it, the War of Vengeance, the Dwarves stood victorious. This hard-won victory should have ensured the Dwarves have been in the Old World for many centuries to come. However, the fates proved unkind. War had been long and vicious, and the dwarves found their vigor expended. Before they had begun to recover and rebuild their strength, their realm was beset by natural disasters that unleashed destruction unparalleled since the coming of chaos. The end of their golden age came amid the devastating series of earthquakes that shed the length of the world's edge mountains. These, in turn, were followed by volcanic eruptions, monumental proportions, throwing their realm into disarray. In the wake of these natural disasters, the dwarves uh, were left vulnerable to many enemies that fell upon the strongholds and from above. Ugh. And below. Many holes were overrun by goblin interlopers and homeless clans were forced to flee, seeking shelter at the hearts of their neighborhoods. For several centuries, the dwarves fought desperately to drive out hordes of invaders, yet more and more enemies came one by one, the red holds fell. 
each recorded with incredible approaches. The huge sermon in which all wrongs under the dwarf race are written. The once glorious dwarf empire lay shattered and despoiled, where in the past its power dominated in the old world. Its armies now struggled to defend a handful of remaining strongholds. The dawn of a new age. With the decline of their empire, they began a time of exodus. Many dwarves forsook their ancient homelands, leaving the familiar peaks of the world's edge, world's edge mountains behind and battling westward into the Grey Mountains, where they established new strongholds. Although these dwellings were rough-hewn and humble things uh, through non-stop industry, they grew and were refined, though they would never rival the great works of their ancestors in scale, production, or architectural wonder. Between the Grey Mountains and the World Edge Mountains, the Court Dwarfs established new trade routes and refurbished old roadways and made uh, made when they traded with the elves. Travel was still dangerous, however. All these lands were overrun with orcs and goblins, which the Dwarfs saw were in a constant state of war with the growing tribes of men for possession of all the forests and lowlands. Seeing this struggle, the Dwarfs did all they could to encourage these tribes. Trade between the two races increased rapidly, and the Dwarfs shared more, ever more of their wisdom, teaching the humans the arts of metal and stonework. By a strange quirk of fate, the Dwarf High King, Kogan Ironbeard, forged a powerful friendship with Sigmar, the son of the chieftain of the Unbergorgans. Through the Dwarf's friendship and this, with this large and influential tribe, the alliance between them and men grew, and the combined might of their armies would rid the lands of their enemies. A new age of prosperity had begun for the Dwarves and their allies, Silver Age. Despite enduring the decline of their once great empire, the Dwarves main, uh, remain a proud race, and their rich sense of honor uh, had seen them gradually reclaim much of what was once stolen, seated upon his golden throne deep within Karaza Karak. Karaza Karak, the Ever Peak. High King Alrikson is the inheritor of a prosperous era of trade and mention begun long ago when Kogan Ironbeard fought shoulder to shoulder with Sigmar. And he is keen to see this continue, for he holds dear the enduring oaths that, provide, that bind man and dwarf. So, though the nations of man are quarrelsome and given to warring amongst themselves, many dwarves dwell within these lands. And is the ingenuity and industry uh, huh? is the ingenuity and industry of the engineers and artisans that has built this great the great human cities and driven the young races advancement. This in turn has driven the industry of the great forges and foundries that riddle the mountains and the high peaks ring day and night with the sound of hammers and anvils and engineers guild crafts ever greater wonders. Yet much of what has been lost goes unclaimed. The treasures of the ancestors lie buried in distant tombs beneath shattered holds occupied by goblins, trolls, dragons, and worse. Eventual war throngs march regularly to war led by powerful thanes and kings on a bound to liberate their ancestral strongholds from the foul creatures that despoil their depths. With each glorious campaign, the dwarves solemnly strike entries from the great book of grudges. Yet for all their victories, many grudges remain unanswered. Oh, the orcs now. Now you got some good old orc, uh, orc artwork right there. Beautiful orc artwork from the old editions. I think it's 8th edition, isn't it? I believe so. Okay, here we go. A green menace. Orcs and goblins are destructive creatures, interested only in fighting and breaking things. They are scourged to all lands and obey to civilization. They raid ceaselessly, carrying war and barbarism to every corner of the Warhammer world, yet they are also extremely adaptable, able to thrive in the harshest of environments, mimicking the technologies of their enemies and enthusiastically adopting new ways of making war. Unexpected interlopers, long ago, the first orcs and goblins appeared upon the world, much to the disappointment of the Old Ones having crossed the interstellar deeps by stowing themselves away aboard the Old Ones' magnificent craft. Wow. They, wait a second, <laughs> they just snuck onto the old one's spaceships. Wow, these interlopers crept from the vessels upon which they hid and spread out into the young world, seeking refuge in its wild places. Here, hidden from the gaze of the old ones and seemingly forgotten about in the hope that they would quickly starve, the warlike creatures prospered. Tribes grew rapidly, roaming the barren wastelands, hunting herds of great beasts, fighting one another, and generally having tremendous fun. As their numbers grew, they spilled out of the southern deserts and volcanic plains, plains, invading the lush lands of the young races and finding fertile hunting grounds, pleasant climates, and most importantly, new enemies. In the mountains, they encountered dwarves, 
from fighting these uh, orcs are on page 69 just so you know well, I thought I'd, I'd let you know that which is ironic because dwarves are asexual <laughs> I mean orcs are asexual they just plant things in this warhammer world in the mountains they encountered dwarves from fighting these hardy warriors the orcs and goblins learned the value of iron and steel and quickly began to forge their own crude weapons and armor Many goblin tribes began to explore deep ca uh, caves and caverns, finding vast underground realms to inhabit a wealth of fungi to sustain them, often with hilarious side effects ranging from deadly toxicity to mind-altering intoxic intoxication. From here they tunneled further, finding way finding hidden ways from the ground layers of dwarves, the better to make war upon their enemies. Along the coast of the old world, the migrating orcs and um, goblins encountered elves, and whilst their jeering hordes watched the tall and strangely fragrant beings flee across the waves they learn the joy of boats soon the adventurous creatures were sailing the seas of the old world in ramshackle craft carried hither and yon by wind and current they came upon distant lands such as Ulthuan and Lustria these were eagerly invaded and as their hordes ravaged coastal settlements and laid siege to great inland cities ever more enemies appeared keen to fight the intruders It's frustrating, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Alright. In the frozen north of the old world, they first encounter the primitive tribes of man. Great must their joy have been, for these creatures seem bar as barbaric and warlike as any orc, and as cunning and vindictive as any goblin. Whether the dwarves would bar their great iron doors against them and the elves would rain arrows on them from afar, in man the orcs and goblins had found a foe that they would that would face them head on in battle, meaning meeting them blade to blade. So numerous have the warlike orcs and goblins become that should they ever stop fighting and turn their minds to conquest, they would sweep away all opposition in a brutal tide of violence. The Battle of Blackfire Pass. Through the Blackfire Pass between the Black Mountains and the Weldage Mountains runs the old dwarf road linking the empire to the ancient dwarf capital of Kazakarak. The pass has long and bloody has a long and bloody history. For it is also the route favoured by invading orc and goblin armies from Badlands. And it has been the site of many battles. It was here long ago that the allied armies of men and dwarves engaged with a massive invading orc and goblin army. Unable to bring their superior numbers to bear, the orcs and goblins were defeated and scattered. The ensuring victory was the epoch changing event that allowed Sigma, the leader of the, of the men, to found the nation that would become the empire. Tribes beyond number. Orcs and goblins. Pages beyond number. Orcs and goblins live in a warrior in warrior tribes or war bands, sometimes forming into tribes that consist exclusively of one or the other, but most often gathering together their distinct differences strengthening the collective force. These groupings range from a few hundred to staggeringly vast hordes that cover the lands in heavy, heaving seas of green fl flesh and rusted metal. They can be found throughout the world and dis disconcertingly for peace seeking folk. There isn't a habitat in which the adaptable creatures cannot thrive. From the scorching heat of the Southlands to the frozen steppes of Kislev, from the forests of the Empire to the high peaks of the World's Edge Mountains, a traveller cannot hope to avoid them. Though these prolific creatures do not have a distinct kingdom of their own, there are vast tracts of land where they dominate completely. The notoriously dangerous, dangerous region known quite justifiably as the Badland, which lies between the south, southern World's Edge Mountains and the Black Mountains, is one such place, and it is from here that many invasions of the Old World originate. Most tribes are semi-nomadic due in part to the fact that a successful tribe destroys, it destroys everything within many days' march of its camp. Thus a tribe must be consistent, constantly on the move, seeking out rich new lands to devastate any spoil. Any war boss with their rusty iron shot boots considers anything visible on the horizon as their rightful stomping grounds, and anyone who disagrees had better be prepared for a fight. Belligerence made manifest. If belligerence could be personified, it would look much like an orc. Broader and more muscular than a man, these green skinned brutes have large heads, powerful jaws, long bows, and great tusk like teeth. They are dim witted but adaptable, with dense hides that protect them from harm and thick skulls that protect them from the perils of philosophy. But by far their most defining characteristic is their love of violence. Orcs love live to fight. Indeed, when not surrounded by a maelstrom of violence and bloodshed, orcs quickly become bored, some slipping into brooding lethargy, others attempting more adventurous activities such as the crafting of crude weapons, the training of reluctant mounts or the building of great effigies from rocks and dung. 
but orcs find such non-violent behavior taxing and before long they will begin looking for ways to unleash their pent-up aggression to orcs there is nothing better in life than battling one's enemies and should enemies prove scarce all orcs know that punching another orc quickly creates a new enemy in all culture such as it is the largest and strong quickly become leaders imposing their will through strength brutality and shouting black orcs named for their dour demeanor and black bleak sense of humor as much as for their dark green skin uh, by far the most notable and fearsome the largest of their kind can often be found as leaders accompanied by a bodyguard of fellow black orcs hungry for war many of the most notable orc hordes are led by black orc warlords okay we're getting there we are getting there yes we are okay Uh, on page 71. Vindictive green hordes, smaller and more nimble than orcs, goblins are comparatively intelligent creatures with scrawny limbs and irritating voices that never seem to cease. Whilst feeble compared to their larger kin and prone to extreme acts and cowardice, history has repeatedly shown that a goblin horde can defeat the most redoubtable of foes through the weight of numbers. Vicious and mean-spirited goblins uh, far prefer to attack from behind to sail foes already weakened by battle or, better still, both at the same time. Despite the differences, orcs and goblins naturally congregate together and it is, a rare, it is a rare tribe that does not include both. Although goblins often suffer terribly whilst in the company of orcs, such as symbiotic arrangement has its advantages. In battle, goblins can rely on their stronger cousins to do most of the fighting whilst they seek vulnerabilities. Hmm? In the enemy's battle lines to exploit uh, with sneak attacks and to make use of their ingenious war machines to bombard the enemy from afar. Ingenious. <laughs> They always seem to screw up there, don't they? Especially that Doom Diver. Yet being every bit as adaptable as orcs, goblins do form tribes alone, which can be found in many and varied lands. From the volcanic expanse of the Darklands to the lush fields of Bretonia and nomadic tribes of goblin wolf riders swarm with the primordial, primordial forces of the Empire, spider riding goblins lurk in the many caves that rule the world's edge mountains, the sprawling lairs of the black robed night goblins wage unrelenting war against the Dwarf Kingdoms and any who dare cross the Highland Passes. Gork and Mock. Orcs and Goblins are extremely superstitious and some would say gullible creatures. As such, they are willing to believe in lesser deities and prone to following strange cults. Yet, for all their love of petty fetishes and minor idols, their pantheon is dominated by the boisterous and belligerent brother gods known as Gork and Mock. The followers of Gork and Mock seldom call upon... Uh, seldom call upon them for aid in times of need, nor do they beseech them for gifts as less robust races of their god, uh, do of their gods. Instead, these war gods and their infamous deeds serve as inspiration. Gork is brutal and cunning. Mork is cunning but brutal. brutal. Gork is brutal but cunning, and Mork is cunning but brutal. So, it's the same thing, <laughs> right? Uh, and every orc and goblin lives in the shore and certain knowledge that if they are brutal or cunning in life, enough in life, they will join their gods in eternal battle with death. Wow. That's very interesting. They just love killing stuff. Jeez. Monsters. Amongst their followers, the power of Gork and Mork was the phenomenon known as Wah! An all and most spiritual calling to war that fills every orc and goblin with frenetic energy. Shamans, as the innumerable, innumerable tribes call their magic users, are living conduits through which this power is manifest for all to see. When their armies march to war and the power of what rises, shamans attempt to harness and manipulate it, using it to blast their foes or rouse their warriors to greater heights of violence. However, such communication with the gods has a profound effect upon the mind of a shaman, as evidenced by their strange antics and peculiar habits. The Tomb Kings of Kem. Oh, here we go. Three more factions to get through. Oh, jeez. Before we get to the actual friggin' rules. Damn. Speaking of orcs, here's an orc. He's a drum beating orc. Except he doesn't have his drums. That sucks. Both of them missing their drums. Don't know where the hell they are. Ancient and vengeful. The Tomb Kings of the Southern Deserts have awoken from their millennial slumber. Theirs is the wrath of the cheated, for they were promised an eternity of heavenly glory, but were imprisoned between life and death. At the behest of the Tomb Kings, legions of merciless skeletal warriors rise from the sands of Nehekara and march forth to reconquer the world. 
the land of the dead. Despite being an enlightened and advanced civilization when the tribe of the old world still dwelt in caves and mud huts, Nehekara was brought low by the megalomania of its kings and the evil magics of Nagash, at whose hand Nehekara withered and died, cursed to an unquiet death from which there could be no true respite. Today, the great land is a barren sea of sand dunes, a scorching desert studded with the morbid architecture of a civilization obsessed with death. Beneath the thin white sands lie countless gilded artifacts and trinkets buried amongst the drifts of bone. Each of the many thousand tombs that litter the arid landscape contains a king, king's ransom and jewelry and gem studded weaponry. Every year, armies of the avaricious and the adventurous march deep into the heat, blasted deserts, intent on ransacking the military wealth of the land despite rumors of the vengeful dead buried beneath their feet. Every year, the sands are stained red once more with blood, with the blood of the foolish, for the rumors of spirits abroad and the deserts are true. The long-dead soldiers of ancient Nehekara stand ready for battle at all times. Should a commander be brave or foolish enough to trespass into Nehekara and lead their warriors into the sacred vales of the kings, then they would witness a terrible phenomenon. As the punishing midday sun blazes down upon the interlopers, the sands begin to shift. Some bleached skulls surface all around, dust spilling from their empty eye sockets. Holding curved kopesh blades, armored forms awaken from their slumber, forming up into elite regiments with preternatural pre 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 discipline and coordination. Undead archers knock and loose volley upon volley of arrows as they march from their graves in eerie unison. Fully formed cavalry units burst from the ground, spears leveled as their skeletal mounts gallop towards the troops. Cresting the dunes come fast and deadly chariots. From the sands boil black clouds of skull, carapace scarabs, and scarcophagi cast in the form of scorpions that sting and slice in the soft flesh of the living. Out of the tombs come towering god statues jerking and lurching uh, towards the foe with an unnatural gait. Alongside these stone sculptures come hulking skull-faced constructs of bone and precious metal, each adorned with a treasure chest's worth of gemstones and ornate curios. These unnatural cohorts have been brought to unlife by the incantations of the lich priests, magisters of the dead who bind and tame the unruly winds of magic with the ease that the lesser wizards might tame the unfamiliar spirits. And yet, these are merely the initial defenses of the lands of Nehekara, those who protect the outlying tombs and settlements from the greedy and the insolent. The magic of death. In that dread desert, beneath moon's pale gaze, the dead walk. They stalk the dunes in that breathless, windless night. They brandish their weapons in mocking challenge to all life, and sometimes, in ghastly dry voices like the rustling of seri leaves, they whisper the one word and remember from life. The name of their ancient dark master, they whisper the name Nagash. From the Book of the Dead by Abdul Ben Rakib. The magic of death. These vast armies are animated by the will of the tomb kings and the power of the de death itself. When the great necromancer Nagash unleashed his magic upon the world, Nehekara was the worst affected. So prepared for the afterlife and so steeped in death were its people that it became a realm completely inhabited by the unliving. To this day, the magic of death thrives in the wastelands of the south, giving unnatural life to the skeletal remains of countless thousands. It is said that the magical wind of death blows especially strong upon Nehekara and any living being who ventures there will in time sicken and die should they linger too long. The same power, I don't have much energy left, I better save that. Save it, I'll need it later. This same power that saps life from mortal flesh and bones and big great sound dead in the armies of the tomb kings are the strongest when they wage war in the shadow of their great pyramids and fallen cities. Certainly in the long centuries since the rise of the tomb kings, no army or nation has yet conquered the lands of the dead, and those few foolish enough to try have left their bleached bones in the endless desert sands. The magic of death that surrounds Nehekara is as much of a blessing for the tomb kings as it is a curse. Though it has doomed them to an eternity of decay, it also allows them to work powerful magic upon both themselves and their servants. At the heart of this great power stands the mortuary cult as many priests and hierophants, the mortuary cult. At its founding, the mortuary cult was commanded to study the arts of mummification and communication with the gods. Steadily, over many centuries, the priests learned how to preserve a cult from decay until the art of embalming had become extremely elaborate. The priests had also devised advanced law of magical incantations and rituals intended to bind the souls of the dead kings back into their royal bodies. Since the ruler depended on the mortuary cult's knowledge and loyalty in order to live beyond their own death, the lit priests held great power in ancient Nicaragua. Indeed, the priests were, were the only subjects who could not be executed, and in this way, the priesthood became a formidable power behind many thrones. The priests acted as advisors and viziers to the rulers of Nehekara, and their status was second only to that of the ruling families. Each necropolis 
with the burial pyra- with the burial pyramids of the tomb kings at its core had a temple dedicated to Nehekara's mortuary cult, and it is here where the lich priests preside. In addition to the rituals of summoning, lich priests have many duties to perform in the necropolis, including renewing the seals upon the portals of the tomb vaults, maintaining the incantations of preservation, and determining the moment of a tomb king's awakening. The lich priests continue to perform these duties for centuries, unable to die a natural death, cursed forever by their own lust for immortality. Gods of the desert. So ancient is Nehekara that its culture, architecture, and gods are strange and alien to the younger nations of the world. Travelers brave enough to venture into the lands of the dead might find themselves surrounded by fearsome nearing animal gods shaping gigantic golden insects and terrifying death masks studded with precious metals and gems. These uh, uh, the, the armies of the tomb kings carry these icons in a battle bearing uh, banners bearing coiled serpents striking scorpions watchful eyes uh, hinting at deities long forgotten. In the current era, the gods of the desert exist only as carvings on tomb walls or statues standing sentinel over ruined cities from towering pyramids deities such as Shra, the sun god, or Geheb, the god of strength and stone, gaze mercilessly down upon the sands, remainder of the eternal might and once grand position within the pantheon of Nehekara. The faces of the gods also adorn the weapons and armor of long-dead warriors, such as Bath, the goddess of grace, known for her speed and deadliness, or uh, Asaph, the goddess of vengeance, whose visage spells doom for all who look upon it. Most numerous by far, however, the gods of death, who Syria and the god of the underworld, Dejaf, the god of war and death, and Sok, the god of scorpions, are all constant companions to the army of the tomb kings. Indeed, their likeness are often carved on the stone of animated constructs like the Yushamti, allowing these forgotten gods to walk the earth once more. Setra the Imperishable. The land of the dead is ruled in perpetuity by Setra the Imperishable, king of kings. He is a ruthless leader uh, whose, whose thirst for conquest knows no bounds. The immortality he lusted after in his life is his. And the civilizations that flourished in his absence will feel his wrath when he reclaims his lost lands and forces the usurpers of the old world to kneel before his might. Sephra rides to war upon a magical chariot, the magnificent crown of Nehekara resting majestically upon his brow. A bloodthirsty and skilled warrior, Sephra drives his enemies before him without pity, scything through their ranks with every sweep of his blessed blade. Sephra, alone among the tomb kings, knows the secrets of the lich priests. He understands their language, and though it may take all of eternity, he will master their magical arts. At Sephra's side stand the innumerable kings and princes that ruled over Cambrian ages past. Though not all who once ruled in life bowed eagerly to the king of kings and death, long centuries of war between the ruined necropolis cities have bent most of Cetra's unbreakable will. Equally hungry for conquest and with a terrible hatred against the living, their arrogance and rage sustain their unliving forms. Cetra uses the generals well in his conquests, directing the wrath and greed of individual tomb princes or kings outward against the foes of Nehekara, promising them kingdoms and fabulous wealth should they reclaim the lands once ruled by their people. Okay. Woo! Man. Oh, okay. Chaos. Chaos. Here we go. You know, I really wish they had five good factions and five evil factions. You know, they, why not lizard men? Why not? It doesn't make sense why they didn't include them. They, they could have included them. Lizard men, come on. Classic faction. Children, the old ones. You're just going to forget about them. So annoying. Anyway. The lost and the damned, deep within the immaterial realm of the Aether, reside the ruinous powers, beings of incomprehensible magnitude, cruel deities that play with the lives and dreams of mortals as if they were mere toys to be charity discarded upon a whim. Barbaric and primal, these gods are the most powerful emotions and the deepest, darkest fears and passions of mortals made real. The tribes of the north. North of the empire, north, north even of Kislev, lies the realm of the gods. Here, where the colossal gate where the old ones once stood, leading to distant worlds, the thin veil between reality and the aether has been torn asunder, and the realm of chaos spills into the mortal world. In the dark hinterlands that lie between this world and the next, the marauder tribes dwell, numerous beyond counting. These tribes differ greatly in customs, tradition, and even appearance. Some are tall and fair, some, uh, with long flaxen hair, bristling beards, other are stocking, robust, with coal black hair and dark brooding eyes. These tribes range from small nomadic war bands to hordes of barbarians that rival the nations of the old world. Yet all of these tribes share one thing in common, their devotion to the ruinous powers at the edge of reality. The gods of chaos rule all, and to the tribes that battle for survival and cusp of the world, they are the only gods worthy of adoration. In their name, the Marauder tribes war with one another eternally, seeking the favor of their patrons. Each year, the tribes unite under powerful leaders and march south, spreading destruction and seeking to topple the weakling gods of civilized land. A creeping evil. 
Whilst the tribes of the far north are the most prolific worshippers of the ruinous powers, they are by no means alone. Throughout the old world, twisted individual, individuals seek one another out, banding together in secret places of worship at profane shrines and conduct dark rituals. These secretive cults hide from the authority of church and state, avoiding the wrath of church sanctioned witch hunters and city militias alike. Whilst practicing dark arts and plotting against the very civilizations that harbor them, they give shelter to foul mutants, cast out by their parents and sanctuary to the practitioners of dark and evil magic, fleeing from the persecution of righteous priests. Oh, to these cults are drawn scholars and laborers alike, high-born nobles and lowly peasants in equal number. They grow in size with each passing day, and as they grow, so spreads their corrupting influence and their hidden power. Charismatic and maniacal leaders arise, their powerful oratory filling the imaginations of their followers with glorious visions of ruin of, of ruin of worlds dominated by chaos and ruled by the gods' favorite disciples. These early cults form sprawling plans of great complexity, installing their agents and spies in the courts and garrisons of great nations, ready to unleash chaos and topple the thrones of kings and emperors alike. Okay. The gaze of the gods. Ha ha ha. All who serve the ruinous powers strive for the attention of the dark monsters. The devotees of the gods of chaos perform great and terrible deeds to prove their fealty, hoping to oppress the diabolical patrons and earn their infernal blessings. To the followers of the ruinous powers, the blessings of their deities are both immediate and real, unlike the blessings of the weak gods worshipped by the cowering populations of civilized lands. For those who prove their worth and attract the gaze of the gods, great power awaits. Gifts are bestowed upon those favored with chaos abandoned in the form of great and supernatural powers, longevity, and most profound of all, mutation. The gods delight in granting their favorite followers a vile array of mutations. Amongst the northern tribes, it is not uncommon to see warriors sporting horns, tails, or additional limbs, or that have been granted a unity with their weapons and armor, their swords becoming as much a part of their body as their hands, and their armor melded to their flesh as a second skin that can never be removed. But these mutations can be horrifically disfiguring and disabling, and one favored by the gods might be granted so many that their true form becomes lost with an ever-warping mass of flesh, their sanity is shattered, but the gods do not care. Any follower so blessed must accept their lot and adapt, for to complain about such burdens is to draw the gods' ire. The path to glory. Yep. Sooner or later, the most devout servants of chaos feel an urge to walk a path of glory, following the footsteps of past pilgrims beyond counting. And they turn their faces to the north and strike out in search of the fallen gateway at the top of the world. Gathering about themselves war bands of loyal followers, these aspiring champions carve a bloody path through the land, seeking worthy enemies and battling the war bands of rival champions. Those that prove worthy feel the gaze of the gods upon them. They are gifted many rewards by their patrons, and their war bands grow as followers flock to their banner. In the fullness of time, the great, greatest champions then find themselves standing on the threshold of the realm of chaos, where all reason is lost. The laws of nature hold no sway, and time loses its meaning. Here at the edge of reality, the supplicant pauses, their final challenge lying before them. Only those with the most courage are able to step beyond the physical world and the presence of their gods. Many more linger frozen by self-doubt for a day, a week, a month, a year, in a realm without time, many sacrifice eternity for a moment of uncertainty. Wow. Whew, that is pretty epic. Of those few that possess the courage to step into the void, most are judged unworthy, and their souls are consumed by the aether. But those who gain the approval of the gods are rewarded, and return to the world swathed in glory, ready to lead the armies of chaos against the forces of order. So cool. The ruinous powers, the, the devotees of chaos, follow a staggering array of deities and spirits with varying degrees of fervor. These many gods exist, all exist within a wide pantheon. Ruled over by the four greater powers, Corn, Nogal, Slanesh, and Siege, all uh, who vie eternally for seemingly unattainable dominance over one another. Most offer their prayers to any god that cares to listen, neither acknowledging nor denying the primacy of any, though some choose to dedicate their every action to a single patron. Corn, the Lord of Skulls, an angry, raging god of bestial strength. and merciless battle prowess. Clad in brazen armor and wielding a broad-bladed sword drenched in the blood of a billion fallen enemies. <laughs> a billion fallen enemies, wow. 
Among the warlike marauder tribes, Corn has many followers for he rewards bravery, minded arms, and conquest. Corn is also known variously as Arkar or Karna, and is often depicted as a great warhound, eternally first thirsting for blood, his howl an inescapable call to war that fills those who hear it with a terrible fury. Nurgle, the Lord of Decay. He who unleashes famine and pestilence upon the world, known as as Neglem or Nagal and Nurglich among the Morda tribes and often depicted as a disease ridden carrying crow. crow. Yeah. Nurgle appears to most to his most devoted followers as a massively bloated creature festering in portals and boxes, surrounded by a dark cloud of flies. Yet, despite the terrible nature of the uh, of the gifts he bestows upon the world, Nurgle is a kindly god, and his followers revel joyously in his blessings, embracing the delights of decay, disease, and ruin. Slanesh. Slanesh. The Dark Prince, the youngest of the four greater gods, Chaos Gods. Known under a multitude of names, including Shornal and Lanshor, they are the Lord of Pleasure, the patron of all things beautiful and seductive. To many, Slanesh is both the master of excess and fount of all creative power, whose realms of influence include music, art, and passion, pride, arrogance, and excess. To those that worship at the many altars of Slanesh, the Lord of Pleasure, it appears variously as an androgynous beauty that inflames the passions, or a reading serpent that crawl, that creeps into the mortal minds, bringing dark and selfish desires. He's also very kinky. Uh, but you know they, they don't mention that. Older editions they do. Cinch, the changer of ways, the master of magic and weaver of fate. Among the Morda tribes, he is depicted as a great eagle, soaring high above the world. His unblinking eyes see seeing all, and he is known as Char. Char. Cinch uh, manipulates the fates of all mortals into complex and intertwining patterns delights in watching his countless carefully laid conspiracies unfold gradually revealing his insane plans to pour to his pawns in ever more terrible detail he is the patron of many sorcerers whom he gifts with ever more profound mastery of the winds of magic only fools claim to understand chaos for by definition chaos is a human and incomprehensible mortal sages and mystics who dare ponder its nature are driven mad or else succeed only in attracting the attentions of its fellow creatures. Many a wise scholar has been carried alive and screaming to the charnel houses of the realm of chaos, there to read an eternal debate with the demons of torment, grand theogenist Cybold the same. The beasts of the forests. Here we go, page 80. Uh, where are we at now? We've been filming for a long time. We've been filming for a very long time. Where are we at now? Oh. What does that say? Wow, we're almost at four hours. Oh, this is ridiculous. Woo! Ridiculous. Okay. Here we are. The beasts of the forest. Within the haunted woods and blighted forests that come the old world dwell the beastmen, the true children, the chaos. Within the warped hearts of these grotesque hybrids of beast and man simmers intense hatred of primal rage that can only be sated by grievous acts of defilement and savage savagery. For the world once belonged to the beastmen, and they hunger to take it back. The domain of the beast. When the polar gates collapsed and chaos came roaring into the world, the great forest became the domains of the beastmen. For thousands of years they ruled their realms unchallenged, preying upon the cowering young races of wolves prey upon sheep. But the reign of the beast was not to last. The scattering tribes of man grew steadily in number and the courage of the peoples increased. The, the, the prey began to fight back when the beastmen came, timidly at first, but with ever-increasing ferocity, until eventually it became uh, it began to win victories, forcing the beastmen to flee. With each defeat, the beastmen retreated further into the dark forest, pursued by growing armies of men. In their wake, their victorious enemies felled the trees and cleared the ground, taming it with plow and harrow. In time, the land was ruled by man, who looked out upon the shrinking forest from behind tall walls that planned ever more campaigns against the beasts of the forest. Yet despite the gains made by man, the wild woods remain largely untamed. The proud cities of man are but flickering pinpoints of light. Islands of barely maintained sanity in a vast black sea of trees. Outside each town or village, the dark forest echoes with howling savage beasts. The nature of the beast, creatures of animalistic lusts and vitrolic temperament, 
Mm -hmm. uh, beastmen are a twisted reflection of the cruelty of nature. They are the apotheosis of violence and destruction. As reasoning and deadly as the flood that washes away the village, the plague that ravages the land of the blight that kills the harvest. All beastmen surly and cruel, for they are surly and cruel, for they know that they are destined to live a short, brutal life of slaughter and pain. Quick to anger, their every gesture or glance brimming with hostility, beastmen become belligerent and bellicose in the extreme at the slightest provocation. The av the atavistic fury that each beastman harbors within its soul is always but a mere moment away from the surface. But above all is the trappings of civilization that fan the embers of hatred to wood are uh, burning within buddy. each beastman's breast. Yes, buddy? Can I the crab one? This one? Because uh, I already bought you one today, remember? Can I bought I you two today. Can I have it? Okay, does it cost money? Let's have a look. Uh, it costs money, buddy. It costs a lot of money. Yeah, we can't get that one. We can't. It, it's okay, because you have lots. You have lots, yeah. I'll tell you what. How about tomorrow, eh? We, Daddy will show you a different one. Okay? Yeah? I know, but there's lots of good ones we can look at. Okay? I like... Yeah, I, I can't get you this one, buddy. It's very expensive, okay? It's very expensive. It's a very expensive one, okay, buddy? Yeah. It's all right. <laughs> because it costs money, buddy. It costs lots of money. Just, just, just try it. No, true. Well, I, no, because it will, yeah, it will work, but it will cost lots of money. We will have no more money left. I want, I... But then we lose the money. <laughs> no, we can't lose the money. I'll buy you one. I'll, I'll buy. I'll show you something different tomorrow. Okay. Uh, yeah. Nothing. Here, let's let's close the laptop. Like, no, don't oh, oh, lose oh, oh. the laptop. Oh, okay, okay. I'm Keep it open. Playing. Okay. Mommy, yeah. come on. Yeah, mommy's mommy's gonna get you. Okay. Mommy's gonna get you. Here you go. Careful. Watch where you're stepping. Okay? Careful. Watch careful. where you're careful. stepping. We can't Why get that one, buddy. It's, it's, lots, of money. Get it's we'll lots of money. Lots of money. Be careful. Because we've got you one already today. Remember. Uh, he always wants me to buy games on the iPad. <laughs> oh, okay, where were we? Uh, here it is. Uh, okay. Quick to anger that every Jessica or glance brimming with hostility, beastmen become belligerent and bellicose in the extreme at the slightest provocation. The, the atavistic fury that each beastman harbors in its soul is always but a mere moment away from the surface. But above all, the trappings of civilization that fan the embers of hatred burning within each beastman's breast. Um, uh, the, the sight of a proud flag, a coat of arms, a pristine uniform, or a magnificent statue elicits a powerful reaction for the things of order are an athema to the children of chaos. Woe betide those who, pie, who take pride in symbols of order, for their end will invariably be painfully humiliating. Though beastmen find it easier to destroy than to create, they are the most inventive in the punishments they inflict upon their captives and enact terrible atrocities upon those that they can catch. Don't get caused by a beastman. Uh, death is better. The hordes of chaos. When the ruinous powers stir within the aether, the world trembles. In the turmoil of the gods' waking wrath, the magical realm is riven with storms and the winds of magic blow strong. Roiling out from the collapsed gateway of the old ones to rage with tempestuous fury across the face of the world. As these terrible storms of magic surge and mortal creatures cower, the fabric of reality is stretched so thin it begins to tear and the realm of chaos swells to swallow the world. Its shadow looming large across the civilized lands of the south. At such times, the followers of chaos hear the call of the gods of their gods and gather for war. In the north, as their homelands are lost beneath encroaching darkness, the marauder tribes and their black armored champions are driven southwards, and the winds of magic blowing hard at their backs. In the old world, cultists gather in secret places, readying their weapons and finalizing their intricately laid plans. In the dark forests, howling beastmen form mighty warhead herds, ready to descend upon towns and cities in orgies. What? Of slaughter and destruction. <laughs> what? That's an interesting way to, um, uh, describe that. 
Unfortunately, the denizens of the, of the world, the power of chaos has always waxed and waned. If the world is protected by powerful enchantments and mighty works of arcane wonder, crafts are long ago by sorcerers of supreme ability. Thus, the storms of magic inevitably lose their bluster, the floods of raw magic subside, and the realm of chaos shrinks. This terrible shadow receding from the world, taking with it the armies of the damned that were driven before it. They blend cunning and spite with the savage bestial fury, half man, half beast, yet wholly the servants of chaos. Kairos Ghoul, Quill Master of the Drakwal. Although the great nations of the world are beset by hundreds of minor invasions and raids each year, incursions of such magnitude are rare to find. So far, the great hordes of chaos that arise at such times have always been halted and turned into are turned back by armies of men, elves, and dwarves. But with each incursion, the realm of chaos grows stronger, claiming a greater measure of the world, and the grim shadow it casts over the north grows larger. With each incursion, the civilized lands of the south concede ever more territory to barbarian hordes and savage beasts. Worse still, the frequency of these great incursions is increasing. With every passing decade, the threat posed by chaos becomes greater. Though the change is too subtle for any mere mortal to perceive during their meager lifespan of life as the centuries march past, the doom of the world unfolds. Inexorably, and each generation must, must face peril undreamed of by the one that came before. In civilized lands, the wise and the mad alike have recognized the, the dire signs, importance that presage the return of chaos. They know that the world once more teeters on the brink of ruin, for in the north a great evil rises. That evil has a name carried on the wind and upon the lips of the lost and the damned, as of our cool, the beast incarnate. Oh, okay. What is this? The wolves of the sea. Norse guy. Okay. Interesting. North of the Old World lies the land of Norska, a cold and inhospitable realm of mountains and valleys haunted by all manner of twisted beasts. Yet despite its perilous nature, Norska is a populous land inhabited by hardy and adventurous folk, known by other nations as both canny merchants and bold explorers, and as fearsome warriors and ruthless pirates. Ordered to the south by the icy waters of the Sea Claws, and to the north by the crack and sea in the shadowlands of the chaos wastes. The Norskin Peninsula is a harsh and unforgiving land. To its east lies southern arm of the frozen sea, and east of that the great steeps of Kislev. To its west lies routes to all the seas of the old world, an open invitation to the adventurous spirit of the, nefaring, of the seafaring Norskins. There are no major cities in Norsk, and the country is not ruled by a single king, nor governed by any form of central bureaucracy. Instead, each of the many tribes dominates their own region, maintaining a number of towns, villages, and stockades. Each of these is in turn governed by a chief who answers only to the tribe's king or queen. Uh, these tribes are rarely at peace with one another, constantly raiding the neighbor's lands and holding for resources, and it is common for smaller villages to be invaded, raised and re-established within a single generation. Yet for all their warlike nature, Norskans will unify against a common enemy, and many times in history a tribal council has been called whereby the kings and queens of the various tribes attempt to set aside the differences and unite in a shared cause. Typically, when a, uh, such a council is called, it will be headed by a single ruler nominated from those among, uh, those, from among those in attendance to act as a figurehead. By tradition, this role should fall to the eldest and most venerated king or queen present, but will often be gifted to the ruler or the, of the largest, most powerful tribe, thus avoiding violent disagreement. When the armies of chaos gather to invade the old world, they may... What? Oh. They count many Norskans among their number. The tribes that dwell in the northernmost reaches of Norska stand tall among the midst, amidst the ranks of even the most fearsome Northlanders and are as likely to uh, venerate the dark gods of chaos as they are old gods of man, for their lands lie close to the realm of chaos and are often tainted by its shadow. Raiders and merchants. Long have the tribes of Norska been warlike and bothersome, constantly harassing the nations of man. When Sigma unified the tribes of the Old World and founded his empire, he drove the North Sea, who had settled along his northern coasts, back uh, beyond the, his borders, pursuing them all the way to their native lands, where he bade them return and trouble his people no more. Unfortunately, threats of violence and retribution are taken as challenges by warlike Norskans, and those that resist their raids uh, with the most vigor are viewed as worthy foes and oft revisited. Each year, countless warbands set sail aboard uh, sturdy longships plying the ocean waves in search of rich coastal settlements to pillage and plunder and terrorizing isolated villages that 
eke out their existence from the bounty of the sea. Indeed, such raids are so common along the coast of the Old World that the most nations maintain numerous garrisons to guard against the ravages of Norsecan pirates and protect their people. But the many tribes of Norska are not just raiders, they are great traders and merchants sailing far and wide in search of exotic goods and untapped markets. And they are bold explorers ever seeking new lands to colonize. For this reason, there are many Norsecan colonies dotted across the world, most are peaceful places, populated by travelers and adventurers who choose to sail in a more hospitable climate than the bleak, uh, windswept mountains of the distant homeland. Many become important centers of commerce, valued by mercenaries and merchants alike, and most are vital ports through which much trade passes. However, all attract harbor and Norsecan raiders come to loot, pillage, and make war. Add this to the many, uh, add to this that many Norskans are touched by the mutating power of chaos, often displaying animalistic features or, in rare cases, being capable of shape shifting. <clears throat> Shedding their human form, that is cool, uh, and taking on that of a beast. It is no surprise that Norsecan colonies are seldom popular with natives. Consequently, most far flung Norsecan outposts are heavily fortified against aggression. Most such colonies can be found on the coasts of the Empire, Britannia, and Kislev, uh, the largest of which include Erengrad in Kislev, Mannheim in Nordland, and Skarhad home in Bretonia. Others survive in far distant corners of the world, many months sailing from the treacherous coast of Norska in lands as far flung as Lustria, Pilea Araby, and according to some, far Cathay, Kuresh, and Nippon. Albion. In the western nations of the old world, there are folk stories of the mist, mist wreaths Isle of Albion and the bleak island of Hyrasil. The prominent in all of them are the towering, sanding Standing stones, their surface carved with strange wounds of patterns. Scattered tales speak of the twisted hags that burrow their hovels in the such stones, and the one-eyed, swamp-dwelling creatures that serve them. Such hags are said to walk the path of fate. Paths of fate and dispatch their servants to kidnap unfortunate souls as sacrifices in foul rituals. One day, the tales claim the hags will spread the mists across the world, and the tribes will rule for eternity. Land of ice and snow. I think our light is ready. Let's do it. Okay. Come on. There we go. That's better. What's that, buddy? Oh, there we go. Okay, that's a bit better. We got some light. Okay. Land of ice and snow. North of the empire, the land, the land turns cold and frozen plains, frigid lakes and forbidding mountains stretch out towards the crest of the world and the realm of chaos beyond. It is a land that breeds hardy people who must face both an inhospitable environment and a constant rage from the north. From this land, the kingdom of Kislev was born. If you kill one man, you are a murderer. If you kill ten men, you are a monster. If you kill a hundred men, you are a hero. If you kill ten thousand, you are a conqueror. Kislevite proverb. The kingdom of Kislev. Considered at the northernmost outpost of civilization in the old world, and boasting strength and stability to rival the empire, Kislev has grown rich from trade in the east and south. While its great cities prosper from the wealth harvested from forests and mines, southern men and women think of Kislevites as savage and untruth. Though in truth, they are every bit as cultured and advanced as any human nation. This assumption of savagery derives from their armies, bare-chested horse archers, bare-mounted knights, and ice-wreathed war sleds, all a legacy of their origins in the eastern steppes. Kislev was created when eastern horse tribes, among them the Ongols and Gospodars, came across the welded mountains. The natives of these lands, fierce warriors in their own right, could not resist the newcomers, and like dozens of tribes before them reaching out far to the, re far to the east, they swore allegiance to the Khan Queen and were uh, subsumed into the growing Kislevite Empire. I have no idea what the time is. Let's have a look at the time. It's 
8.20 p.m. So we've been reading for about four and a half hours, is that right? Four hours, 20 minutes almost, yeah. Okay, wow. The Eastern Steppes in the east of Kislev, beyond the world's edge mountains, outposts of the Kislevite Empire, reach all the way to the edges of the Grand Cathay. Here, great cities stand, linking the western and eastern reaches of the Warhammer world, a legacy of the modern, mighty tribal empires built by the Khan Queens of Ulm. In the distant east lies Karak Karakorsi, a great trade city that unifies the steep tribes for thousands of miles around. Further west, near the floating mountains, stands Great Rasputia, the crossroads of the world. Roads from Rasputia stretch far to cities and landscapes across the Warhammer world. West from most of the great cities is Zamoski, gateway to the Oblast. Standing sentinel at the end of the Skull Road, it marks the point where east meets and west meet. Despite the presence of these cities, the eastern steps remain a wild and dangerous place where marauder tribes, hobgoblin raiders, and ogre war bands are a constant threat. Merchants and armies must travel in strength, often forming vast caravans to make the long journey between them. The Ice Queen. Long has Kislev been ruled by the Khan Queens and their offspring. Uh, the current ruler is Tsarina Mishenka Romanov, often referred to as the Ice Queen, an honorific granted the female rulers of Kislev because of their mastery of ice magic. This great power is drawn from the land itself and has been said to connect the queen to her kingdom, allowing her to shape the winds of magic in startling and unique ways. It has always been so with the Khan queens, and history recounts how the goddess Gospodars were led by women as skilled in battle as they were skilled in sorcery. It was this magic that allowed the first queen of Kislev, Miska, to unite the land under her rule. Both her enemies and her own her own people attributed a host of supernatural powers to Miska, most of which were only partly true. Centuries later, Mishenka has the same air of mystery and mysticism surrounding her, the power she leverages to keep her people in line and maintain the far outposts of her realm. Her rice witches often accompany the army of Kislev to battle where their magic can tip the balance with freezing winds, hails of ice showers or frozen, frozen shields. More perhaps than their sorcery, the ice witches are a symbol of Mishenka's power motivation for our soldiers to fight all the harder for their Tsarina. Prince Alexis of Kislev, the young prince of Alexis Romanov is Mishenka's Mishen only son and stands in, next in line to succeed in her throne of Kislev. Though he does not share his mother's mastery of magic, he is an exceptional warrior and a shrewd diplomat. Trained in, uh, trained in lance and blade and as comfortable in the saddle of a horse as the back of a war bear, Alexis has led more than one campaign into the north against Chaos Marauder tribes. Orc and Goblin armies and Norse and raiders, to name a few. To name but a few. Much to his mother's consternation, the prince speaks often of his dreams to personally lead his forces to the furthest reaches of the troll country, expanding the borders of Kislev to the north. When he speaks his thoughts on the kingdom's relationship with the Sigmarite Empire to the south, however, Mishinko is more, more willing uh, Shinka is more willing to listen to her son's ambitions. Alexis has often spoken of a need to help create a unified empire under a single leader, for he foresees a time when the dark gods will march south and all the nations of man must stand as one to oppose them. Unfortunately, Alexis and his mother have yet to find someone with the will or vision to unite the fractured southern peoples. The strength of Kislev lies in you all. The land has called you all here, and it is here that you will put the strength to the test defiant chaos. There is power in this land, and tomorrow it will rule, It will run in all your veins. Use it well, Tsarina Mashenko of Kislev. Okay, this is Cathay now. Okay. Ruled by dragons. Far to the east of the Old World lies the vast empire of Grand Cathay, stretching the, from Warpstone Desert in the west to the far sea in the east, from the hinterlands of Kuresh to the south of the great steppes of the north. The Empire of Grand Cathay has endured and prospered for longer than any other human civilization. Grand Cathay. Cathay is a land of wonders with islands that hang in the air in the sky, airships that glide across the azure heavens, and living statues that stand sentinel over its borders and fortress gates. Cathay predates almost all human civilizations and is by far the most populous human nation in the world. Its provinces, great cities and fortresses spanning thousands of miles of forecasts are forests mountains, plains, and deserts. Despite its geographical size and economic strength, and despite, despite the vast armies and war engines it can muster, the Cathayan Empire is surrounded by enemies and beset 
by rebellion and strife to the south the powerful kingdoms of Ind and fearsome snake men of Goresh threaten its borders while to, while, while to the east elven pirates Nipponese invaders Nipponese just say Japanese freaking hell Nipponese invaders and ancient enemies from beneath the Jane Sea assail to its port cities and coastal towns. In the west, ogres, hobgoblins, and the horrors of the Warpstone Desert cast a shadow over its lands. Though by far the greatest danger to Cathay comes from the north and inexhaustible armies of chaos. The Dragon Emperor. Oh. Long before the coming of the Old Ones, the Celestial Dragon ruled the east. In time, humans populated his lands and came to revere him for his power and wisdom. When chaos flooded the world, the celestial dragons brought together, uh, brought together and protected the tribes of the east. In thanks, the humans took the dragon as their emperor and served him with loyal admiration. At the birth of Cathay, the celestial dragon took a mate, the moon empress, and with her had nine draconic children to rule the lands. Watched over by their father and mother from the capital of Weijin. Weijin. Through long years of stability and patience, Though its enemies are many and its leaders are not always in agreement, the dragons have brought harmony to Cathay. The dragons teach the philosophy of yang and yin, of balance in all things. This goes so far as the emperor and empress themselves, the celestial dragon, representing the embodiment of yang, the power of light, heaven and fire, while the moon empress personifies yin, the power of shadow, spirits and night. Together they are two halves of one whole, just as grand Cathay endures through a perfect balance of all things. The empty throne. In recent times, the great balance of Grand Cathay has been threatened and it faces danger, like at no other time in its long history. For over two centuries, the Celestial Dragon Emperor and the Moon Empress have been absent, leaving the running of the Empire to their children. It is a time of darkness and disharmony for Cathay. Not even the draconic rulers of the Empire seem to know where their father and mother have gone, or more worryingly, if they will ever return. Through the Empire, rebel lords. Oh, Celestial Dragon Emperor and the Moon Empress have been absent for two centuries. Wow. Throughout the Empire, rebel lords and ambitious magistrates scheme to take power, while the countryside has become infested with bandit kings and criminals. In Weijin, the Jade Dragon, one bull, struggles to hold his father's empire together and oversee the Celestial Court and its astromancer cabals with little help from his bickering siblings. In the east, Yin Yin, the sea dragon, looks out across the Jade Sea. Her treasure fleets the traveling east, south and west in search of golden glory. Meanwhile, in the south, Li Dao, the fire dragon, guards the border against invasions from Ind and Koresh, all the while keeping one eye on the mischievous monkey king and the nearby mountains of heaven. In the west, Zhao Ming, the iron dragon, Uh, yeah, in the West, Zhao Ming, Zhao, Zhao, Zhao Ming is a Chinese name. The Iron Dragon indulges himself, consumed by his alchemical research. The Great Bastion in the North, Miao Ying. Just say Yao Ming. The Storm Dragon, favored daughter of her father. The Storm Dragon, favored daughter of her father, defends the great bastion that protects Grand Cathay from the open steps and the chaos waste beyond. A feat of almost unimaginable engineering, the great bastion climbs hundreds of feet above the landscape, its walls and towers bristling with cannon, archers and legions and soldiers. Such is the might of the great bastion that it has never fallen and only been breached a few times in its long history, often as the result of magical cataclysmic seismic events. The secret of its strength comes from its construction. Thousands of years ago, when the people of the old world were little more than primitive, warring tribes, the celestial dragon was fighting to preserve his domain from endless chaos invasions. He foresaw the destruction of his empire at the hands of the dark gods, and knew that in time, even he would not be able to resist the rising tide of invaders. His solution was to gather his greatest engineers and levy thousands upon thousands of his subjects to raise a wall from the mountains in the east the ocean in the, in the west to the ocean in the east. A barrier to stand for all time. As the war grew, the celestial dragon and his children poured their magic into it, so it became more than merely a barrier of stone, wood, and steel, but one of will and determination. 
That is cool. Very, very cool. Dwarves versus goblins here. Battle of Skull Pass, was it? I think that's what that was. Very cool. Love it. The rules. We're finally here. <laughs> oh, what page is this? Jeez. 87, 88, 89, 90. The rules. Page 90. Oh, we're finally here. We're finally reading the rules. Like like more than four and a half hours into this. We're finally reading the rules. This is crazy. Oh, what is the time? Started at four. 8.31. It takes you four and a half hours to read the pages before you get to the rules, roughly. I have, you know, stopped to deal with my son and things like that, but Wow, okay. The rules. <laughs> this section is divided into three parts. The first focuses on some general principles for all players to be aware of. This includes commonly used terms, inventions, dice, and other accessories, as well as explanations of the models, their profiles, and so forth. This is followed by the basic rules as they apply to the most common type of model formed infantry. This means that if you can get to playing, this means you can get to playing as quickly as possible, learning to move, cast spells, shoot, and fight deadly combat with your models. The third part expands upon the basics by introducing more advanced rules for different troop types, characters, weapons, and more. From there, only limits, the only limits are your imagination and your dreams of conquest. Overview of the game. This page summarizes the sequence you will follow when playing a game of Warhammer the Old World and points to you to the relevant parts of the book that explain how each stage works. Master your forces. To play a game of Warhammer the Old World, each player will need an army to command. So the first thing to do is assemble your forces. You can simply use all the models in your collection, but most players use points, values, and army lists to ensure their forces are evenly matched for a closely fought battle. This system is explained in the Warhammer Army section on page 276. Two, to new two scenario. The Warhammer Battle section on page 287 presents six pitched battles. Each of these explains how to play a slightly different type of battle, ranging from a straightforward clash of forces to a fight in a mountain pass or the defense of a watchtower. Players can roll a dice to decide which pitched battle they will play or simply choose one. Set up the battlefield. Next, you will need a battlefield, which can be set up on any flat surface, be it the kitchen table, the floor, or a dedicated war, war games table. The players set up a terrain, set up terrain for their armies to fight over, representing woods, fortified watchtowers, and other features that make up the landscape of the Warhammer world. How to do this is covered in the Warhammer battle section on page 285. Deploy armies. Four. The rival armies are deployed facing each other across the battlefield, ready to fight. Details of how to deploy can be found in the Warhammer battle section. Each of the pitch battle scenarios include a map showing where on the battlefield each player can place their models, and tells which side will take the first turn of the game. Five, to battle. To battle. The players fight at the battle, each taking turns in which the other army will move, shoot, wield, mighty magic, and fight vicious combat. All of this is done using the rules that follow. These rules will, these rules start with the basic rules that apply to all models and cover the standard sequence of moving, shooting, fighting, and more. Each pitch battle also explains how many rounds to play before the end game ends. Aftermath. In the aftermath of the battle, the players must work out which side stands victorious. Each pitch battle explains how to work out who has won the game. In most cases, the victor is the side that has destroyed more of the enemy, and it, so it is often obvious who has won. As the enemy lies in tatters, dead or fleeting. Other battles are decided by claiming objectives, such as seizing enemy banners or capturing a watchtower. Whatever the outcome, only a rematch will give you the chance for further glory or sweet revenge. General principles. Um, okay. Uh, before we get to this, I might stop charging and switch the mic back on. What do you reckon? That way you can hear me better. Let's do it. Okay. Here we go. Mic on. Okay. 
Here we go. Let's do it. All right. I'm plugging this now. Plug, uh, putting the mic in. Four twenty-eight. Four hours and twenty-eight minutes. Okay, here we go. Come on. We can do this. Shoulders through it. Ninety. Uh, what is it? Oh, two hundred and seventy. Oh, we're not even a third of the way through it. Oh, that is crazy. Oh, we're about a quarter of the way through it. What's well, that? Three hundred and sixty. Yeah, we're just over a quarter of the way through this book. We've done about 27%. <laughs> Crazy. Okay. That's the last of our energy drink. And we're a quarter, a quarter of the way through this book. Here we go. Okay. Huh. All right. Next up. Yeah. General principles. Before going further, it is worth establishing that some general principles regarding some commonly used terms, conventions, dice, and other accessories in the game of Warhammer in general. Take backs and changing one's mind. It is not uncommon for a player of any game to occasionally second guess themselves, saying they are about to do something before immediately changing their mind. Yep. Players should be tolerant of this in their opponents as they will likely do it themselves. However, once dice have been rolled for any reason or a move committed to and made Players must abide by their decision. They can no longer go back and change anything that came before the dice roll or the act of moving, moving through units. As a general rule, no unit can move through another unit. Though there are exceptions, for example, a fleeing unit may be obliged to move through another unit. Alternatively, the corner of a unit may have no choice but to move through another unit during a maneuver. In such cases, it is acceptable for one unit to pass through the other and rules will make allowance for this. Measurement. In games of Warhammer the Old World, all distances are measured in inches. Correct. Uh, using a ruler or tape measure and can be measured uh, at any time. Interesting. Distances between models and all other objects, which can be other models, terrain, features, and so on, are also always measured from the closest point on one base. On one base to the closest point, on the other base. See diagram below. That is our little diagram there. Very good. For example, if any part of a model's base is within six inches of a base of an enemy model, the two models are said to be within six inches of each other. Obviously. <laughs> uh, sometimes units will be mounted on movement trays for ease. Nevertheless, always use the model's base and not the movement tray as the reference point when taking your measurements. Directly towards and directly away, a unit may be required to remove directly towards or directly away from another unit or object. To do so, draw an imaginary line between the center of the moving unit and the center of the unit or object it is moving away from. As the unit moves, its center moves along this line. The, dis the distance between two units is measured between the closest points. Therefore, the distance between unit A and B is four inches. The distance between unit A and the dragon, unit C, is 5 inches. That's the diagram. Figure 92.1. 92.1. 1. <laughs> 92 Where are the other figures been? Dice. The Warhammer the Old World uses dice of different types to determine the outcome of various actions and events. These are D6. The most frequently used dice is a regular six-sided dice, marked 1 to 6. Uh, yep, it is common for the six to be replaced by a logo on many dice. D3, the rules may call for a D3 to be rolled, but an actual three-sided dice is not necessary. To roll a D3, simply roll a D6 and half the result, rounding up, rounding fractions up. Artillery and scatter dice. Warhammer the Old World uses two special dice. 
The Artillery Dice, Mark 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, and Misfire. And the Scatter Dice, marked with arrows and a hit symbol, and hit symbols. These are often used together to represent the effects of war machines. Sometimes the Scatter Dice is used with one or more D6 to determine a random direction and distance. Dice rolling. During a game, you will be required to make, any, to make many different dice rolls. The rules will often be uh, use a specific term or abbreviation to describe the dice roll. These are defined as follows. Single dice rolls. If the rules say roll a d6, simply roll a single six-sided dice. Target number rolls. The rules will often require you to roll a specific number followed by a plus. This is a target number roll. If you are required to roll a four plus, for example, a roll of four, five, or six on a d6 would be a success, but a roll of one, two, or three would not. Multiple dice rolls. The rules may require you to roll 2d6, 3d6, and so forth. In such cases, simply roll the number of d6 indicated and add the results together. This is a multiple dice roll. The most important rule, Warhammer the Old World is a complex game, and as such, players will occasionally disagree in their just interpretation of the rules. Should disagreements arise, players are encouraged to look up the rules in question, uh, reach an agreement, and move on. Should this prove impossible, a roll-off should determine whose interpretation will apply for the remainder of the game. What matters more than any rule is that players enjoy their game and their rivalries remain friendly. Yes. But, you know, with typical Warhammer geeks, uh, this, is, this can be uncommon, unfortunately. A lot of insecure people uh, play games like this, which sucks because it gives a stigma around the game. But moving on, modifying dice rolls. To modify a dice roll, simply roll the dice and then add or subtract modifiers shown, effectively changing the result of the roll. If the rules ever instruct you to divide a dice roll, any fractions are rounded up unless the rules state otherwise. Modifiers are applied after division or multiplication. Natural rolls. The term natural describes the actual number shown on a dice once it has been rolled. In other words, a natural roll is the result before any modifiers are applied. Rolling off. The rules may call for players to roll off to do this, each player rolls a dice, usually a d6, and the highest score wins. In the case of a tie, roll again, unless otherwise instructed. Rerolls. In some situations, the rules may allow you to re-roll a dice. This is exactly what it sounds like. Pick up the dice and roll it again. You must accept the result of the re-roll, even if it is worse than the first. No single dice can be re-rolled more than once, regardless of the source of the re-roll. If you re-roll a multiple dice roll, you must re-roll all of the dice unless the, uh, the rule granting the re-roll specifies otherwise. Oh, our flame template, three inch blast template and five inch large blast template. Well, the small, three inch small blast template. Permission of photocopy for personal use only. Copyright Games Workshop Limited 2023. Cool. Templates. In Warhammer the Old World, templates are used to represent the effect of certain weapons. Blast templates. A blast template is around 3 inch or 5 inch in diameter. A flame template. A flame template is a teardrop shaped template approximately 8 inches in length. Getting a bit of a crease there now. Um, okay. These templates are used to determine which models are hit by an attack that has an area effect or blast radius. And if, if an attack uses a template, the rules will explain how to position it and uh, how it might scatter. Risk of being hit to determine which models risk being hit by a template. Hold it in place and look to see which models, base, models bases lie underneath it. Any model whose base lies completely underneath a template or partially underneath the central hole of a blast template is hit automatically. A model whose base lies partially underneath a template is hit on a roll of d6 or 4 plus. Of 4 plus. Scatter. The rule may call for an object to be placed and scattered. To do so, place the object on the battlefield as instructed by the rule. Roll the scattered dice to determine a direction and any other dice required by the rule to determine a distance in inches. If a hit, it is rolled on the scattered ice. The object does not move. Leave it in place and resolve the rest of the rule. If an arrow is rolled, move the object the distance in inches indicated by the roll of the other dice in the direction indicated, ignoring intervening terrain units, etc., unless the rule states otherwise. With the object's final position determined, resolve the rest of the rule. Figure 95.1. The scattered ice shows a hit, so the blast template does not move. The D6 roll is ignored. 
figure 95.2. The scatter dice shows an arrow, so the blast template is moved in that direction, shown on the D6. Hmm. Model profiles, page 96. The Citadel miniatures used to play the games of Warhammer the Old World are referred to as models in the rules that follow. Models represent a variety of troops, each with its own skills and capabilities. To reflect this, each model has its own characteristics profile. Characteristics profile, each model in Warhammer the Old World has a profile of nine characteristics. Soldier of the Empire. All the movement stats, all the stats are there. Cool. These are used to describe the various attributes of different models or characteristics are rated on a scale of 0 to 10. Uh, they cannot go below 0 and only in the rarest of cases will they rise above 10. These characteristics are movement. M. This shows the number of inches a model can move on the battlefield under normal circumstances. For example, a man with movement of 4, M4, can move up to 4 inches. Weapon skill. This defines how skilled a warrior is with their weapons or how determined and vicious a monster is. WS. Ballistic skill. BS. Ha. BS. Before Sigma. This shows how accomplished a model is with ranged weapons such as bows or handguns. Strength. S. Strength gives a measure of how strong a model is and how easily it can hurt an enemy it has struck in combat. Toughness. T. Now this is a measure of a model's ability to resist physical damage and pain and reflects such factors as the resilience of a fleet creature's flesh and its ability to shrug off injury. Wounds, W. This shows how much damage a model can take before it succumbs to his injuries. Most human-sized models have a single wound. Large monsters and mighty heroes able to withstand more damage usually have more wounds. Initiative. This indicates how fast the model can react in combat. Initiative dictates the order in which models fight. I. Uh, ad attacks A. This, this shows the number of attacks a model makes in combat. Most models have a single attack. Elite troops, monsters, or heroes may be able to strike, strike several times and will usually have more attacks. Leadership, LD. Uh, why don't they just say L? I don't know. Anyway, leadership shows how courageous, determined, and self-controlled a model is. A creature with low leadership characteristic is very unruly or cowardly to say the least. Split profiles. Some models have two or more rows in their characteristic profile, often with gaps in each, shows a dash. Each row represents a different model combined together to a single profile. For example, one row might represent a rider. The next their mount, split profiles are explained in greater detail in the advanced rules section. Okay, characteristics of zero. If a model has characteristic, a characteristic of zero, it has no ability whatsoever in what the characteristic represents. This is seen most often with ballistic skill, as many models simply lack the ability to make any form of ranged attack. If any model or object has a weapon skill of zero, then it is unable to defend itself in combat, and any blow struck against it will therefore automatically hit. If at any time a model's strength, toughness, or wounds characteristic is reduced to zero, it is slain and removed from play. Characteristic tests. Uh, mm, 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 mm. Mm. A model will sometimes be called upon to make a characteristic test. Uh, such a test could be made against any characteristic a model has. For example, a toughness test is a characteristic test. To make a characteristic test, roll a d6 and compare the result to the relevant characteristic, characteristic on the model's profile. If the result is equal to or less than the value of the characteristic, uh, the test is passed, equal to or less than. However, if the result is greater, the test has fa been failed. Where a model or unit has more than one value for the same characteristic, use the highest value. Uh, automatic pass and fail. When making characteristic tests, roll a natural, uh, a natural roll of a six is always a failure. A natural, what? Hang on a second. To make a characteristic test, roll a d6 and compare the result to the relevant characteristic on the model's profile. If the result is equal to or less than the value of the characteristic, the test is passed. Oh, okay, yeah, so a 6 would be a fail. Okay. Uh, and a natural 1 is always a success, regardless of any other modifiers. Additionally, if the model have a, has a characteristic of 0 or negative, it automatically fails the test. 
Leadership tests. At various times, a model or unit might be called upon to make a leadership test or to otherwise test against leadership in some way. To make a leadership test, roll 2d6. If the result is equal to or less than the model's leadership value, then the test has been passed. If the result is greater than the model's leadership value, the test has been failed. This will all too often result in the unit fleeing, as described on page 132. Huh. Yeah, well, we're getting to page 132. It's not even halfway. Whenever leadership is used, a unit that contains models with uh, different leadership values will always use the highest warriors naturally to look for the most steadfast of the number for guidance. Automatic pass and fail. When a leadership test, mm, a leadership test of uh, a natural roll of 12, i.e. rolling a double six, is always considered to be a fail, regardless of any modifiers it might apply, whereas a natural roll of two, i.e. rolling a double one, is always considered to be a pass. Modifying characteristics, the rules will often call for characteristics to be modified. To do this, simply add or subtract the modifier shown uh, to the characteristic, effectively increasing or decreasing the value. Other model information, in addition to its profile, a model's rules include other information vital to the game. What this is varies from model to model, and in many cases, not all of the following information will be included for every model. Not every model can use magic, for example. Uh, points value. Almost every model will have a points value given within its profile. Points values reflect a model's worth within its army. Most models have a basic points value that increases as various opti optional items of equipment. Weapons, armor, magic items, for example, are added. By adding together the points values of all the models you have selected, you find the total points value of your army. Knowing this enables players to play evenly matched battles. Points values and the rules for building an army are explained in greater detail in the Warhammer Army section on page 276. Troop type. All models have a troop type given as part of their rules. There are five broad categories of troop type. Infantry, uh, cavalry, chariots, muscles, war machines, each of which is further divided into subcategories. Additionally, some models have the word character in brackets after their troop type. This denotes that the model is a character one of the brave and powerful heroes that lead an army. Troop types and their rules are explained in brief on page 104 and in greater detail in the advanced rules. Characters are explained in greater detail in the character section on page 202. With very few exceptions, all models used in a game of Warhammer the Old World should be mounted upon a square or rectangular base, the dimensions of which are given here in millimeters. Sometimes a range of sizes will be given. In such cases, the base the, b the base the model is provided with is the correct base to use. Unit size. This tells you how many models of this type form a unit as described on page 100. Most often this will be presented as a number followed by a plus symbol. Uh, five plus, for example, indicating that a unit made up of this type of model must contain at least five models. Mm -hmm. uh, in some cases... Whoop. In some cases, this may be a number range, 5 to 30, for example, indicating that a unit made up of this uh, type of model must contain at least 5 models, but no more than 30. In other cases, most notably the case of characters, chariots, or monsters, this will be presented as a simple number, usually a 1, telling you exactly how many models make up the unit. Armor value. Most models wear armor, and the type of armor they wear determines their armor value. See page 220. However, in the case of... I already bought you two things today, buddy. Yeah, well, tomorrow, buddy. There's always tomorrow, okay? However, in the case of large models with multiple riders or crew, uh, such as monsters and chariots, an armor value is not always easy to determine. To avoid confusion, and if appropriate, such models would have an armor value given with their rules. Base sizes, designer's note. As stated above, all models used in a game of Warhammer the Old World should be mounted upon a correctly sized shaped base. However, uh, many players will have their collections older models, the base sizes of which can vary. Whilst it is possible to play a game of Warhammer the Old World without needing to rebase such models in match play events, players are required to use correctly based models to ensure all aspects of the game are as fair as possible. To assist with rebasing an existing collection, separate bases are available as part of the Citadel Miniatures range. Equipment. Almost all models carrying equipment of some sort, from a simple sword or axe to an array of arms and armor. The equipment a model carries will be listed and is factored into its points value. 
Many models, particularly monsters, will have natural weapons listed as equipment, their claws, teeth, and even breath weapons being the weapons they carry into battle. The rules for many of the weapons and armor carried and worn by models can also can be found in the Weapons of War section on page 212. Magic. In Warhammer the Old World, many models represent powerful wizards, able to bend the winds of magic to their will. Whilst not all models are able to wield such powers, those that can have this information within their rules. This details the laws of magic they can choose spells from and their level of wizardry. Magic is explained in greater detail on page 106. Okay. Options. Many models have a number of options given. This includes a number of weapons they may be armed with, upgrades to their armor, and so forth. In the case of these, those models that form units, most have the option to upgrade some of their number to become commanded or command models. See page 198. Special rules. In addition to the special rules well, associated with their troop type, well, many models have one or more special rules. These fall into three broad categories. Universal special rules. These are rules that appear in all armies. A full list of these can be found on page 166. Well, if a model has more than uh, one or more universal special rules, their names will be listed as part of its rules. Army special rules. These are special rules unique to the army the model belongs to. If a model has one or more army special rules, their names will be listed as part of its rules. Unique special rules. Some models have special rules unique to them. If a model has one or more unique special rules, these will be listed as part of its rules. Note that an army and unique special rules are included within each army list. Magic items. Some models, notably named characters, are equipped with their own unique magic items. Where this is the case, the model, uh, these items will be described and their rules given along with the models. Unique equipment. Some models are equipped with items that are unique to them. Equipment not found on any other models. In such cases, these items will be described and the rules given along with, their, with the models. Okay. Forming units. The models that make up your army must be formed into units before battle commences. Ideally, when writing your muster list, as described on page 276, a unit must consist of several models of the same type that have banded together and adopted a specific formation. Additionally, single powerful models such as a character, a chariot, or a dragon, a war machine and its crew, and so on, are also considered to be a unit. Therefore, whenever the rules that follow refer to units, this also includes units of one mold. Formation types. All units must adopt a formation. The type of formation a unit adopts will influence how it acts in battle, how it moves, how it fights, and so on. Each type of formation has its own rules. The types of formation a unit can adopt are indicated by a special rule of the same name. Models with more than one such special rule may choose their formation during deployment and may change it and adopt a different formation by reforming during the game. See page 125. Close order formations are by far the most usual. Hmm. Therefore, the... Uh, the core how to play rules focus on such units. Examples of more unusual types of formation include skirmish and open order, and the rules for which are covered in the advanced rules section. Additionally, some army lists introduce special formation types unique to them. Whew. Close order formation. A unit arrayed in a series of serried ranks is said to be in a close order formation. A unit in close order consists of two or more models that are arranged in base contact with each other, edge to edge, and uh, front corner to front corner, as shown in figure 100.1. Cool. All models in such a unit must face in the same direction. In addition, the models must be arranged into a formation that consists of one or more horizontal rows called ranks. One or more, huh? Mm-hmm and a number of vertical rows called files. From this formation comes the term rank and file. As far as possible, there must be the same number of models in each rank. Where this is not possible, it must be the rear rank that has fewer models. Once formed into a unit, the models move and fight as a single entity for the entire battle. Very good. Okay. Unit shape. 
The shape of a unit in close order is also important as, un as such units gain bonuses in certain situations. Oh, look, we're on page, this is always page 100 done. We're on page 101 now. 100 pages read. Woo! Based upon this, such units can be said to be in combat order or in marching column. Combat order, a close order formation that is wider than it is deep, i.e. that has more models per rank than per file as shown in figure 101.1, .1, or that is square, i.e. has the same number of models per file as per rank, is said to be in close I I combat order. Such units are able to count a rank bonus in certain, certain situations. Rank bonus, if a unit in close order formation is wide enough, it can claim a rank bonus of plus one for each rank behind the first, up to the maximum, maximum determined by its troop type. How many models a rank must contain to claim a rank bonus as well as the maximum rank bonus a unit can claim is determined by its troop type. See pages 104 and 188. Hmm. Certain special rules may increase rank bonus, the rank bonus a unit can claim beyond the maximum normally allowed by its troop type. That's cool. That is cool. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I heard it was only plus two. Maybe it can go higher than that. Note that this bonus can be claimed for an incomplete rear rank as long as there are sufficient models in it. However, if your unit has become disrupted, it cannot claim a rank bonus. Okay. Uh, combat result bonus. Whilst in combat order, a close order formation may claim a bonus of plus one combat result point. See page 151. Marching column, a unit that is deeper than it is wide, that has more models per file than rank, as shown in figure 101.2. Mm, okay. Is said to be in a marching, is said to be in marching column. A marching column cannot claim a rank bonus and cannot make a charge move, but may triple its movement characteristic when marching. Oh, that's cool. See page one, two, three. Nice. One, two, three, triple. Disrupted units. Disruption represents a unit having lost some of its cohesion. A unit becomes disrupted if it is engaged in the flank or rear by an enemy unit with a unit strength of five or more. It ends its movement with a quarter, 25% or more, of its models within difficult terrain, or if it is straddling a low linear obstacle. A disrupted unit cannot claim a rank bonus. Note that enemy skirmishes, see page 184, do not cause disruption. Okay, figure 101.1. .1. This unit is wider than it is deep, i.e. it has more models per rank than it has per file. Uh -huh. Therefore, this unit is said to be in combat order. This unit is deeper than it is wide. It has more models per file than, per, than it has per rank. Therefore, this unit is said to be in marching column. Removing casualties. Throughout the course of a game, models will suffer wounds from enemy attacks in combat from shooting from magic spells and so on. Some of these wounds will be saved by a model's armor, but others will not. For each unsaved wound a model suffers, it loses one wound from its profile. When a model is reduced to zero wounds, it becomes a casualty and is removed from play. Wow. Single, model wo single wound models. Most models have only one single wound on their profile. When this is lost, they are removed from the battlefield as a casualty. Multiple wound models. Some models have more than one wound on their profile. Should a unit of such models lose wounds, you must remove as many whole models as possible. In other words, wounds are lost by a single mo a model unit until its wounds characteristic is reduced to zero. Wounds are then lost by the next single model and so on. You cannot spread the loss of wounds throughout the unit to avoid casualties. Of course. For example, a unit of ogres, each with three wounds on its profile, dub three, 
loses five wounds, one ogre will lose all three of its wounds and be removed as a casualty. And one ogre will lose two wounds, leaving it with only one wound remaining. Cool. Removing casualties from units. Uh, when removing casualties, models are always removed from one end of the back rank. Uh, either left or to right, or from right to left, as the owning player prefers, ensuring where possible that the remaining models are adjacent to one another, as shown in figure 102.1. Stepping forward, although models are removed from the back of their unit, very often casual the casualties will have fallen elsewhere, usually in the front or fighting rank. Removing models from the back of a unit represents warriors behind the front rank, stepping forward to fill the gaps in the front rank. However, a model cannot make any form of attack shooting or combat during a phase in which it stepped forward. It is too busy clambering over the fallen bodies of its comrades. Single rank units. If a unit contains only a single rank, casualties must be removed evenly from either end of the rank. Oh, there goes our light again. Oh. That's annoying, isn't it? Yep. Okay, figure one or two. Whew. Well, what if we turn off one of these lights? Does that make it better? Not really, I still got panderized, don't I? Yep. Oh well. Whatever. Okay. 103. Model and unit facing. Most models have a front, flank, and rear arc based on the direction they are facing. These arcs are used to determine what the model can see and to determine the direction of an enemy charge. The model's front, flank, and rear arcs extend out from the corners of the base at 45 degree angles, forming four 90 degree quadrants as shown in figure 103.1 below. A unit, unit's facings are determined by the facing of its consist, constituent models. Models can only draw a line of sight to things that lie within their vision arc, unless stated otherwise, models have a 90 degree vision arc corresponding to their front arc. Figure 103.1, front, flank, flank, rear, flank, front, flank, rear. Whether a unit consists of one model or many, its facings are determined by its constituent models as shown here. Very good. Uh, line of sight, you will often need to determine if one model or unit has a line of sight to another. To check a line of sight between models, stoop down to look from the model's point of view. If a straight uninterrupted line can be drawn from within the model's vision arc to any part of the other model, there is a line of sight. If no such line can be drawn to the other model due to intervening terrain or without crossing over or through another model, there is no line of sight. A model is always within its own vision arc and always has a line of sight to itself and its unit. If at least one model in a unit has a line of sight to at least one model from another unit, that unit can see the other unit. Note that models and units always block line of sight, therefore it is normally only the models in the front rank of a unit that have line of sight. Okay. Obscured line of sight. Line of sight may be uh, partly obscured by terrain features or by other models. In such cases, uh, the other model or unit is said to be in cover. To check if a model or unit is in cover, stoop down to look from the first model's point of view. If the other model or unit is fully visible, they are not in cover, i.e. they are in the open. If up to half of the other model or unit is obscured, they are in partial cover. Uh, if more than half the other model or unit is obscured, they are in full cover. Hmm. The benefits of partial and full cover are discussed in more detail under the rules for shooting on page 139. Troop types at a glance. As mentioned previously, all models have a troop type. These, along with the type of formation units of such models adopt, determine how they function throughout the rules, as well as providing insight into the role uh, such models fulfill upon the battlefield. Troop types and their rules are explained in greater detail, detail in the advanced rules on page 188. 
Uh, the following pages present some brief but important information needed to better understand the core how to play rules that follow. Categories of troop type. There are five main categories of troop type, each of which is further divided into subcategories. For example, uh, particularly large infantry fall into the monstrous, monstrous infantry subcategory of infantry. In such cases, when the rules refer to infantry units, monstrous infantry must also follow the rules, those rules unless, as an exception, is stated for monstrous infantry. The model's troop type determines the minimum number of such models a rank uh, must contain to claim a rank bonus. The maximum rank bonus a unit of such models is able to claim in the unit of strength of, a, of such a model as shown on the page opposite. Infantry. Uh, infantry includes all units of foot troops, be they goblin, men's, men, ogres, trolls, or any of the myriad Warhammer races fighting on foot. The infantry forms the backbone of most armies and is split into four subcategories, regular, heavy, monstrous, and swarms. Cavalry. The term cavalry refers to any riders mounted on war beasts, commonly war horses or similar creatures. It can also include war beasts on their own as packs of animals, which will often function in a manner more similar to cavalry than infantry. Cavalry is split into four subcategories, light, heavy, monstrous, and war beasts. Uh, chariots. A chariot is usually a wheeled vehicle, uh, wheeled war vehicle drawn into battle by beasts of some kind and crewed by warriors armed to the teeth. Uh, this category can also include large objects such as mobile altars that are pushed along or carried. Ow. Chariots are split into two subcategories: categories, light chariots and heavy chariots. Monsters. Monsters are the largest beings of the Warhammer world, creatures so powerful that they usually roam the battlefield alone. In spite of this, due to their size, they function at close order unit, as close order units uh, rather than uh, close order unit. What? Close order units rather than skirmishes. Okay, this category includes dragons, griffins, and so on. Monsters are split into two subcategories: monstrous creatures and behemoths. War machines. War machines such as cannon and bolt throwers are so pow are powerful units on the battlefield able to pulverize whole regiments, breach stone walls, or even slay fearsome monsters with a single well-placed shot. This is a broad category with varied rules that cover the many different weapons to be found in the Warhammer world, the most commonly seen of which are dealt with in their own section. See page 222. Troop type table. Okay, page 105. Here we go. This table summarizes the most important information for each troop type. More details given in the advanced rules section. Referencing this table will help you better understand some of the rules contained in the core how to play rules. Troop type table, troop type infantry, regular infantry, yep, heavy infantry, monst monstrous infantry, okay. It's a table, yep, cool. Mm. Heavy chariots are unit strength five per model, light at three. Monstrous cavalry is th unit strength three per model. Damn. War beasts are only one. Swarms are three per model. Monstrous infantry are three per model. That's cool. Very nice. Oh, they also have their maximum rank bonuses, which is only two for the regular infantry. That's crazy. That's crazy, man. I don't like that. It should be plus three. Okay, note that this is the minimum number required to claim a rank bonus. Ranks can contain more or fewer models as you wish, but in order for a rank to count towards rank bonus, it must contain at least this many models. Uh, so regular, five, hev heavy, four, monstrous, three. Okay, to be one rank. Light cavalry, five, heavy, four, monstrous, three. War beast, five. Light chariots. Oh, you can have... Ranks of light chariots, three, that's cool. All right, uh, note that in some, came, some cases, the maximum rank bonus a unit can claim can be increased by special rules. Cool, the maximum rank bonus a, u, a unit can claim can also be reduced by its formation, by spell effects or by terrain. Unit strength, sometimes you may be required to work out the unit strength of a unit 
there are, no, there are a number of reasons you might need to know this. For example, to determine if one of your units is outnumbered by an enemy. Mm. Simply counting the number of models does not account for the sheer power of large and ferocious creatures. Unit strength represents this well. To determine unit strength, simply count the number of models currently in the unit and multiply this by the unit strength per model as shown in the troop type table. Out in the shade and woad spade dwelt the murderous beast, vitaling on the sack for homes, gore laden with his feast, stalkering between the leaf and glade, preying upon the weak, glutting the hardy and the poor, and dim dining on the meek, dining on the meek. Nursery tale common in Nordland from the tale of Thomas Wanderer. Magic. The Warhammer world is an intrinsically magical place. In battle, ma in battle, magic is a force and a real and potent as a sword blade. Its use limited only by the imagination and skill of the wizard that wields it. Magic can be a subtle force, infusing allies with strength and valor, or enemies with frailty and dread. More commonly, however, wizards unshackle the raw power that lies at the heart of magic's chaotic nature, summoning hungry firestorms or devastating bolts of eldritch power. It is therefore only right that magic should form a core part of the game of Warhammer the Old World as well. Wizards are able to cast spells of different types throughout the turn, and players must protect them accordingly, ensuring they are able to cast the right spell at the right moment, or to thwart the casting attempts of their rivals. Let's have a look at the time. What is the time? 9.17. Whew. Okay. Been recording for five hours now. Reading for five hours. Wow. Jeez. Huh. That being the case, explaining how magic works early on is important, and following the pages do and the following pages do just that. New players can skip over this section for now if they wish, focusing instead on the more mundane rules and returning to this section once a few games have been played. Wizards. Only beings that possess awesome mental might can even hope to bend the powers of magic to their will. Mm. Fire up. Lesser persons would be consumed in an instant, their souls torn apart by terrible energies. In Warhammer the Old World, all models that can cast spells are known collectively as wizards. Although specific armies might use other terms, you may see names such as sorcerer, shaman, or fear. For example, all but these and others are considered to be types of wizard. Levels of wizardry. Naturally, not all wizards are equal. Mastery of magic increases through dedicated practice and occasionally through sheer luck. To represent this, wizards are divided into four degrees of ability called levels of wizardry, often shortened to simply level in the rules that follow. The higher the wizard's level, the greater the knowledge of magic. Level one, wizards of the first level are those of humble ability. Level two, wizards of the second level are experienced spellcasters. Level 3, Wizards of the 3rd level are great sorcerers of a kind rarely seen. Level 4, Wizards of the 4th fourth, fourth level are the mightiest of all wizards, the very equal crowned monarchs within the realms of sorcery. Laws of Magic, the laws of magic are lists from which wizards generate their spells. Each law of magic represents a particular approach towards the study and use of magic, giving each its own character reflected by the spells within it. Different wizards have access to different laws of magic. Accompanying wizards. Accompanying every wizard's profile, you'll find the law of magic they know. In some cases, it will be stated that they know spells from a single given law of magic. Whilst in others, it will be stated that they know spells from one of a number of given laws of magic. Where this is the case, you must choose one of these laws when writing your mustard list. See page 276. The laws of magic most commonly seen in the old world are presented on page 319. Spells and spell generation. Players randomly generate spells for each of their wizards before armies are deployed. If your army contains more than one wizard, you may generate spells for each in an order of your choosing. Each law of magic contains seven spells, six, six numbered, one to six, and a seventh signature spell. To determine the spells of your, wiz your wizard knows, roll a number of d6 equal to their level of wizardry, re-rolling any duplicate results. The results show which spells your wizard knows. If you wish, your wizard may then discard one of the randomly generated spells and instead select the signature spell of their chosen law of magic. 
any number of wizards in your army, army may do this. That's great, level four wizards, no four spells, that's awesome. Spell categories, spells fall into six categories. These determine during which phase of the game they can be cast. Hmm, no more magic phase. That's cool though. Uh, enchantment. These spells empower the caster's allies in some way. Enchantment spells require that a target can only target friendly units. Most often they affect friendly units, but may occasionally have an effect on enemy units. Casting the same enchantment spell more than once on the same unit during the same turn has no further effect. Hex. The opposite of enchantment spells, weakening the enemy in some way. Hex spells require that a target can only target enemy units. Uh, quite... Can, that, that require a target can only target enemy units. Most often they affect enemy units, but may occasionally have an effect on friendly units. Casting the same hex spell more than once in the same turn unit during the same turn has no further effect. Note that bonuses and penalties from different hex and enchantment spells are cumulative, but cannot take ca any characteristic above 10 or below 1. Conveyance. These spells enable wizards to enhance movement or transport units from one uh, from place to place. Conveyance spells that require a target can only uh, target from the units. A unit cannot be affected by the same conveyance spell more than once per turn. Magic missiles. These are sorcerous projectiles hurled at the foe. Magic missiles can only target enemy units and the wizard must have a line of sight to the target. A successfully cast magic missile automatically hits the target. There is no need to make a roll to hit. Magical Vortex. These are roiling globes of magical energy that travel across the battlefield. The Magical Vortex does not require a target. Instead, it uses a round template which is placed on the battlefield, not touching the bases of any models and with its central hole within the range given by the spell. Once placed, Magical Vortexes remain on the battlefield unless they move off of it. Some magical vortexes move at the start of each turn. If a magical vortex ever ends such a move over a unit, continue to move it in the same direction until it can be placed on the battlefield, not touching the bases of any models. Assailment. These spells are deadly attacks that, c that strike the foe without warning. Assailment spells can only be cast by wizards that are engaged in combat and can only target enemy units that the caster is engaged in combat with. A successfully cast assailment spell always hits its target there is no need to make a roll to hit. Casting spells. When a spell can be cast, when a spell can be cast depends on its type. Enchantment and hex spells can be cast during the conjuration subphase of your strategy phase. Conveyance spells can be cast at any point during the remaining move subphase of your movement phase. Magic Missiles and Magic Vortex, Magical Vortex spells can be cast when a wizard is chosen during your shooting phase. Assailment spells can be cast uh, when a wizard fights during any combat phase. A wizard can only attempt to cast each of their spells once per turn. Wizards that are fleeing cannot cast spells. Unless stated otherwise, wizards that are engaged in combat can only cast Assailment or Range Self spells. To cast a spell, a wizard declares which spell they wish to cast and its target. Choosing a target. Unless otherwise stated otherwise, the following rules apply when choosing a target. The target must lie within the wizard's vision arc, but the wizard does not need a line of sight to the target. The target must lie within the spell's range. Spells cannot target units engaged in combat. Hmm. Really? What if you are casting an assailment spell when you're fighting. Uh, okay. Note that different spell categories and some individual spells waive some of these rules and or introduce others. Oh, that's good. Range self spells. Spells with a range of self do not require a target instead of being focused on the casting wizard. Some such spells have an aura of effect measured from the caster as previously mentioned, a wizard can cast a range self spell whilst engaged in combat. Casting roll, casting result and casting value. To cast a spell, you must make a casting roll. To make a casting roll, roll 2d6. This represents the wizard's attempts to draw magical power from the aether and shape it to their will. The casting wizard's level is then added to the result of this roll to give a casting result. For example, if a level two wizard makes a casting roll of one and six, the casting result 
would be nine. One plus six equals seven for the casting roll, plus two for the level of wizardry. Keep the dice in front of you for the moment. The scores will be needed if your opponent makes a dispel attempt. Each spell has an associated casting value. Spells with higher casting value have greater effect, but require more power. If the casting result uh, equals or exceeds the, cast, the spell casting value, the spell is successfully cast. Uh, though your opponent may subsequently dispel it. If the casting result is less than the casting value, the spell is not cast. Uh, magic resistance. Some models have magic resistance. Special rule. Making them resistant to the magic of their enemies. The casting roll of any spell, including bound spells, that targets an enemy unit that includes one or more models with this special rule, suffers a modifier, as shown in the brackets after the name of this special rule shown here as minus x. Note, note that this special rule is not cumulative. If two or more models in a unit have this special rule, use the highest modifier. Okay. Miscasts and perfect invocations. Should a wizard mispronounce a single word, the magic they are wielding might shatter its bindings in a burst of energy. At other times, the wizard may channel the winds of magic with near perfection, and, at, and the magic will burst forth irresistibly. Perfect invocations. If a natural double six is rolled when making a casting roll, the spell is cast regardless of its casting value or any modifiers that may apply to the casting roll. A perfect invocation cannot be dispelled. Cool. Irresistible force is back. Miscast. If a natural double one is rolled when making a casting roll regardless of the casting result, it has been a miscast. And unless stated otherwise, it is not cast. Roll immediately on the miscast table below to see what fate befalls your unfortunate wizard. Miscast table. 2d6 result. 2 to 4, dimensional cascade. The summoned magic breaks free, creating an ethereal tornado. <laughs> Center a 5 inch blast template over the wizard. Every model, a friend or foe whose base lies underneath the template, risks being hit, as described on page 95. And suffering a single strength 10 hit with an AP of negative uh, 4. Wow. Uh, what's an AP? I don't remember reading that. Did we read that? Nope. We'll read about that later. Strength 10 hit with an AP and 84. Jeez. 5 to 6. Calamitous detonation. Roiling magic explodes from the wizard in a flash of light. Center a 3 inch blast template over the wizard. Every model front of where his base lies underneath that template risks being hit. As described on page 95 and suffering a single strength 6 hit with an AP of negative 2. So they're pretty much the same. One is just bigger and stronger than <laughs> the other. Seven, careless conjuration, the most common result. The wizard mispronounces a syllable, causing the spell to backfire, knocking them to the ground. The wizard suffers a single strength four hit with an AP negative one. Okay, so just hurts himself. Eight to nine, barely controlled power. The wizard manages to control the magic, but at the expense of great power. The, the spell is cast at its casting value for the purpose of dispel attempts. However, you cannot attempt to cast any more spells for the remainder of the current turn. Okay. 10 to 12, power drain. With a deafening boom, the summoned magic is unleashed and an unnatural calm descends. The spell is cast with perfect invocation. Oh, okay. So you miscast and you get irresistible force anyway. However, you cannot attempt to cast any more spells for the remainder of the current turn. I don't like this miscast table. It's, I mean, it's simple. It's not diverse enough. You know, in, in sixth edition, a wizard would get blasted in a random direction and funny stuff like that. This just doesn't tell as good a story. Yeah, I don't like this miscast table. Whatever. Bound spells. Some models have bound spells which may be contained within a magic item or, a given, or given by a special rule and which they can cast in the usual manner. If a power level is given, this is added to the result of the casting roll to give a casting result. If no power level is given, nothing is added. Uh, subtract the result of the casting roll is itself the casting result. When, a casting, when casting a bound spell, there is no risk of a miscast or chance of a perfect invocation. You may, what? Bound spell, oh yeah, 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 okay. You may attempt to dispel a bound spell. You 
You may attempt to dispel a, down, a bound spell as usual. Magic items that dispel or destroy spells work as normal against bound spells. When dispelling a bound spell, there is no risk of being outclassed in the art. See page 1110. Model can only cast a single bound spell per phase. Possessing a bound spell does not make a model a wizard. Okay, cool. That makes sense. Oh, how many more pages of this have we got? Okay, we're almost there. Dispel. Whenever your opponent casts a spell, you can make a dispel attempt, unless, of course, the spell was cast with the perfect invocation. The type of dispel you attempt will affect its chances. Types of dispel. Before making a dispel attempt, you must first decide if one of your wizards will attempt a wizardly dispel or if you will trust a fate and attempt a fainted dispel. Wizardly dispel. To attempt a wizardly dispel, nominate a single wizard in your army that is within the spell range of the wizard that can cast a spell. The spell range varies depending on Upon the level of wizard nominated, level 1 and 2 wizards have a dispel range of 18 inches, level 3 and 4 wizards have a dispel range of 24 inches. Wizards that are engaged in combat that are fleeing or are not on the battlefield cannot be nominated. Fated dispel once per turn if you do not have any wizards able to make a wizardly dispel attempt, or if you wish to avoid the risk, you may instead attempt a fated dispel. Dispel roll and dispel result. To dispel a spell, you must make a dispel roll. To make a dispel roll, roll 2d6. This represents either the efforts of a wizard to counter enemy magic or the twists of fate that can see the winds of magic suddenly dissipate. If you are attempting a wizardly dispel, add the wizard's level to the result of the roll and uh, to give a dispel result. If you are attempting a fated dispel, nothing is added. Um, negative the result of the dispel roll itself. The result of the dispel roll is itself the dispel result. If the dispel result exceeds the casting result, the uh, spell is successfully dispelled and immediately ends. If the dispel result is equal to or less than the casting result, the dispel attempt has failed, the spell is not dispelled. Okay. Uh, outclassed in the art and unbinding. Sometimes, no matter the skill of the casting wizard, the winds of magic prove fickle and a spell is destined to unbind. At other times, a wizard can be so outclassed by their opponent's skill that they are themselves bombarded with magical energy. Unbinding. If a natural double six is rolled when attempting any type of dispel, the magic unbinds and the spell is dispelled and immediately ends, regardless of the casting result. Note that a perfect invocation cannot be dispelled even by an unbinding. Oh, okay. Outclassed in the art. Uh, if an astral double one is rolled <laughs> uh, when attempting a wizardly dispel, the wizard is outclassed in their opponent by their opponent's skill. Roll immediately on the miscast table to see what fate befalls your wizard. Changing references from cast to dispel and from perfect invocation unbinding. Okay, spell resolution. Once a spell has been successfully cast, and if the enemy has failed there. Uh, dispel attempt or not even made a dispel attempt the casting is complete and the spells effect is now resolved Each spell in Warhammer the Old World provides all the information you need spell duration Many spells are cast instantly and their effect is worked out straight away in such cases the spell has no further effect until cast again However, some spells last uh, Last for longer than this for one or more phases or turns for example some spells expire at the end of the casting player's current turn, whilst other spells last until the start of the next round, expiring at the beginning of the casting player's next uh, start turn or sub-phase. Remains in play. Some spells are marked remains in play. Such spells uh, stay in effect indefinitely when cast. They only come to an end when the caster is slain. Um, yep. Uh, ca Caster Slain chooses to end the spell, which they can do at, any, at the start of any sub-phase, or leaves the battlefield. The Casting Wizard can continue to cast other spells, but not the same Remains in Play spell, as it requires only a little concentration to keep a Remains in Play spell going. Uh, okay, then we've got... Dispelling Remains in Play spells. If not immediately dispelled when cast, you may attempt to dispel a Remains in Play spell cast, by your opponent during the conjuration subphase of any of your subsequent turns. To do so, you may attempt either a fated dispel or wizardly dispel, provided the wizard making the attempt is within the spell range. Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's great. I'm glad they have the spell ranges now. That's great. Uh, uh, remains in play spell. What? A range of the wizard that casts a spell. 
Remains in place spells do not retain the energy of their casting, and so you do not need to beat the original casting result if attempting to dispel in subsequent turns, but rather the minimum casting value given in the spell's description. Ah. Perfect Invocations. A Remains in Place spell cast with a Perfect Invocation cannot be dispelled immediately, but may be dispelled in the Conjuration subphase of a subsequent turn as described above. Uh, I reckon they should have got rid of that rule. Uh, wizards and Armor. Generally speaking, Wizards dislike Armor. Its stifling bulk creates a deadening aura about the Wizards physical body that binds their mage sight, blinds their mage sight, and makes it all but impossible for them to manipulate the winds of magic. To represent this, a wizard cannot wear armor or carry a shield. Should a wizard ever do so, they are unable to make any casting of the spell rolls. This penalty applies to all armor and shields, magical or otherwise, but does not include biting, which is worn, which is worn not by the wizard, but by their mount. Note, however, that there are some exceptions. Certain special rules, such as Chaos Armor, found in the Warriors of Chaos Army list, make a wizard exempt from this penalty. Similarly, some suits of magic armor are crafted in such a way as to be exempt from this penalty. Lovely artwork there. We've got, looks like that's an Orska or Orks? Oh no, Goblin Wolf Riders versus High Elves, I think. Yeah, cool. Beautiful. Next page, please. How to play the core rules. I thought we just read that. Oh man, okay, page 114. The following pages cover the core rules of the game, starting with an explanation of the turn sequence. You will go on to discover how your units move, shoot and fight, deadly combat against the enemy, how to rally your troops and much more. For the most part, this section focuses on how units of close order infantry perform, though as we have learned, there are a great many different troop types and formations. For those troops to adopt, where necessary, the rules will reference these things and point you towards where to find a more complete explanation in the advanced rules. Note that the following pages introduce many terms that are explained later in greater detail. So if you are not yet familiar with the game, be prepared to do a little, little flicking back and forth as you read through this section. Okay, cool. Hey, this is, this is great, right? This is, this is cool, yeah. The pages are stopped, you know, flopping over. We're going to turn off this mic um, because our phone might die. <clears throat> okay. All right, very good. How are we doing for temperature of the phone? Okay, not too bad. Not too bad. Yeah, cool. How are we doing for time? How long have we been recording for? That is crazy. Five and a half hours. Wow. Whew. This is the longest video I will ever make. Oh, okay, here we go. All right, <clears throat> turn sequence. Battle is a chaotic thing. Units of bellowing warriors charge and counter charge, hacking at the foe with axe, sword, and cleaver. The ground trembles to the hooves of galloping cavalry, archers blacken the skies with arrows and horsens. Puissant sorcerers wield devastating magics. A game of rounds and turns. A game of Warhammer the Old World is broken down into a number of rounds. During each round, each player takes one complete turn, so that by the end of the game, both players will have played the same number of turns. Players alternate taking turns until the battle is over. Whenever a rule refers to a turn, it means one player's turn. If a rule encapsulates both players' turns, it will specifically state round. Time is 9.40 p.m. Whoa. Uh -huh. We have been recording for a very long time. I'm just going to straighten up this camera a little bit. I don't like where it's at at the moment. Yep. There. Cool. There we go. Shuffle more over to this side, so I'm in the middle. 
Cool. Okay. First turn. Which player takes the first turn? Uh, of the game will be determined by the scenario being played. Usually this is decided by rolling off, although it can be decided in other ways. Game length. Most games last for six rounds, but sometimes a game can last for seven rounds, or be over and only five. In some scenarios, the game length varies. Active and inactive player. A game of Warhammer the Old World consists of a number of rounds, during each of which each player takes a turn. During your turn, you are referred to as the active player, and your opponent is referred to as the inactive player. The turn sequence. Each player's turn is split into four phases, each consisting of four steps referred to as subphases. These subphases are explained in greater detail on the following pages. This, what, the strategy phase. During the strategy phase, the active player attempts to cast enchantment or hex spells and makes use of certain special rules before attempting to rally fleeing units. Any fleeing units. The movement phase. The movement phase starts with the declaration of charges and charge reactions, then the movement of charging units. After this comes compulsory movement. Finally, any remaining movement is carried out and conveyance spells are cast. The shooting phase. During the shooting phase, the active player shoots with those units in their army and then armed with missile, missile weapons with their war machines and attempts to cast magic missile and magical vortex spells. The combat phase. During this phase, units fight deadly hand-to-hand -hand melee and wizards attempt to fend off their attackers with assailment spells. Units that have lost combat may be driven back or become broken or flee. At the end of this phase, once all combats have been resolved, the active player's turn ends. The strategy phase. During the strategy phase, the active player begins to enact their plans for the turn ahead. Key to this is the wizard's Key to this is wizards channeling and manipulating the winds of magic and commanders rallying their forces through strict orders and or inspiring words. The strategy phase sequence. Work your way through the sub-phases shown in the primer in the summary below. The units in your army can generally act in the order you chose within each sub-phase, providing uh, that you complete one sub-phase before moving to onto the next. The start of the turn. The rules will often Call upon a player to make certain tests or perform specific actions at the start of a turn. These things are done now. Okay. Command. Some characters have special rules that may represent bold heroes seeking to inspire their comrades or fabulous abilities granted by magic items. These special rules are used now. This is not really saying anything, is it? <laughs> it's not really telling me anything. The con Conjuration. Many wizards use their magic to aid their allies in battle, others use it to inflict terrible curses upon their enemies. Known respectively as enchantment and hex spells, these spells are cast now. Rally fleeing troops. As warriors fall, many units turn tail and flee. During this sub-phase, you have a chance to rally any fleeing units. Uh, those that are successful will return to the fray. Those that are not will continue to flee. Start of turn. Some units will have special actions they have to perform or tests they have to make at the start of the turn. Such rules will be... Yeah, such rules are not common and their details will be clearly stated in... Oh. These details will be clearly stated um, in the model's rules. Such actions are performed and tests made during the sub-phase in an order chosen by the active player. Sometimes a scenario may require you to make a test at the start of each turn or pause to determine if a victory condition has been achieved before playing on. These things are also done now before the turn begins in earnest. This sub-phase should also be used as a moment in which to think between turns, during which you can remove stray casualties, erring dice, and other bits of gaming uh, detritus that have accumulated. Often players will have questions to ask their opponent, such as how a special rule works or what a magic item does. This is the perfect time to ask such questions and an opponent should never begrudge giving answers during this natural pause in the action. Oh, that's funny. Uh, uh, command. During this sub-phase. Yeah, wow. Powerful abilities, both magical and mundane, are unleashed in the form of special rules. The active player chooses one of their models, usually a character that is not fleeing and that has one or more special rules that can be used during the command sub-phase. The player states which special rule, if any, they intend to use, and if necessary, which units will be affected. 
before making any test required. The active player then repeats the process for all models in their army that have any special rules that can be used during the command sub phase. Ugh. Okay. Note that unless stated otherwise, a model can only use a special rule once per command sub phase. Conjuration. Many wizards are able to cast enchantment spells to the benefit of friendly units. Other wizards are able to cast hex spells, hindering the enemy in some way. The active player chooses one of their wizards that is not fleeing. If the wizard knows any enchantment or hex spells, the player may attempt to cast them now. If the spell is cast successfully, the inactive player may then make it a spell attempt. The active player then chooses another wizard, repeating the process for all of the wizards in the air army. Rally fleeing units. During this sub phase, the active player must attempt to rally any of their units that are fleeing by making a rally test for each such unit. The rally test to, uh, to make this to make a rally test, choose a fleeing unit and test against its leadership characteristic as described on page uh, D7. Uh, if this test is failed, the unit has been unable to rally and it continues fleeing. If this test is passed, the unit has successfully rallied. Then the active player chooses another fleeing unit, repeating the process until all fleeing units have had a chance to rally. Rallied units, a unit that passes a rally test regains composure and returns to the fight. Uh, upon rallying, a unit may immediately perform a free reform. See page 125, the unit cannot charge during this turn and counts as having moved for the purposes of shooting, but can otherwise act as normal. Insurmountable losses, if a unit has suffered a large Number of losses, the remaining models may lack the intestinal fortitude required to return to the fray. Any unit that has been reduced to below half, 50% of the starting number of models, suffers a negative one modifier to its leadership when attempting to rally. Any unit that has been reduced to below a quarter, 25% of its starting number of models, can only pass this rally test on the roll of a natural double one. Fleeing units. Units that fail to rally will continue to flee during the movement phase as described on page 132. Movement phase. Mastery of the movement phase is vital to victory on the battlefield. It is in this phase that you will attempt to outmaneuver your foe by moving archers into positions from which to dominate the battlefield, advancing cavalry along a flank to exploit enemy weaknesses and positioning regiments to intimidate the enemy before charging boldly into combat when the time is right. As movement is such a vital part of the game, this section is broken down into two parts. The first gives an overview of the movement phase itself. The second explains movement in greater detail. As always, if you're not yet familiar with the game, be prepared to spend some time checking other sections of the rules as you read through this section. The movement phase sequence, as with other phases of the game, the movement phase is broken down into four sub-phases. Work, you work your way through these in the order shown below. The, Units in your army can act in whatever order you wish within each subphase, providing that you complete one subphase before moving on to the next. Declare charges and charge reactions. The active player declares which of the units will charge, nominating one unit at a time and indicating which enemy unit it will charge. Once all units, once all charges have been declared, the inactive player declares and resolves each charge unit's charge reaction. Charge moves. Once all charges have been declared and all charge reactions have been resolved, the active player moves their charging units in an order of their choosing. Compulsory moves. Sometimes a player has no choice over whether or not to move a unit. For example, a fleeing unit is obliged to make a flee move. All compulsory moves are made during this subphase. Remaining moves. During this subphase, the active player advances their battle line, moving those units that did not move during the charge moves or compulsory moves subphase. The kin bands must march to war, blood must be spilt. The one inch rule, there is a one rule of movement that applies throughout the game, the one inch rule. Quite simply, quite simply with the exception of units engaged in combat, no unit can end its movement within one inch of any enemy unit. Often a unit will have to move within one inch of another unit during its move. This is perfectly acceptable, provided that at the end of the move there is one inch between it and the enemy uh, units. At times, once movement is complete, players have to nudge. Players may have to nudge units further apart by the smallest amount possible. To maintain this rule, this is also perfectly acceptable. Both players should agree on how best to do this and ensure neither gain any unfair advantage. Here's a nice picture of a dryad.
Very nice. I like it. I really like it. It's a lot. Okay. Declare charges and charge reactions. At the start of your movement phase, the first thing you must do is declare which units of any will charge. Units are not normally obliged to charge unless a special rule states otherwise. Charging is the only way for a unit to move itself into combat with the foe. If you want to engage an enemy in combat, then you must charge them. You cannot simply move into combat without having first declared a charge. To declare a charge, you must indicate which of your units is charging and which enemy unit it is going to charge. A charge, is, a charge unit is often referred to as the charge target. When you declare a charge, one or more of the models in your unit must be able to draw a line of sight to the charge target and charge the target must and the charge target must lie at least partially within the charging unit's front arc. You are always allowed to measure the distance between your unit and the potential uh, charge target before declaring the charge and should take into account any terrain that might slow the unit down. See page 125. As this might well affect your decision whether or not to charge or to declare a charge. Charge movement is explained a greater deal on page 126. Who can charge? Uh, not all units can charge. Units uh, that are already engaged in combat, that are fleeing, or that rally during the strategy phase of this turn cannot declare a charge or make a charge move. Units that are in marching column can declare a charge, but not cannot make a march, uh, cannot make a charge move. What? Units that are in a marching column can declare a charge, but cannot make a charge move. Well, that doesn't make any damn sense. Uh, in rarer cases, units may be prevented from either declaring a charge or making a charge move by a special rule or effect. Um, how does it make sense that you can declare a charge but not make a charge move? I don't get it. What? Charge movement is explained a greater deal on page 26. I guess we'll get to that. Uh, cool. So, um, additionally, a unit cannot declare an impossible charge, i.e. one that it cannot possibly complete, either because the enemy unit lies beyond the charge's maximum possible charge range, see page 21, or because intervening obstructions make it impossible for the unit to make a charge move that allows it to move into contact. Note that if such an, such an obstruction is another unit, there is a chance that the intervening unit will move out of the charge's way before charge is completed. The charge is possible and therefore can be declared. Remember that you still need to see the target to declare the charge though. Charging more than one unit. Normally a unit can only declare a charge against a single enemy unit. However, should a unit be unable to charge its intended target without making contact with one or more other enemy units, a charge must also be declared against each of those units. In such cases, each charge unit is considered to be a charge target, and each must declare and resolve its own charge reaction in an order chosen by the controlling player. Charge reactions. Oh, you know, shroud the eyes, shroud the soul. Turn to face the east. Respect the dead when Moore's bell tolls or await the famed beast. Funeral verse popular in Stirland. Charge reactions. Once the active player has declared all of their charges, the inactive player declares a charge reaction for each of the charge targets. There are three charge, tar uh, charge reactions available to the inactive player. Hold, stand, uh, and shoot and flee. Hold. The unit opts to stand its ground and receive the charge. This is the usual response for units that do not have missile weapons, or those units that favour their chances in the fight ahead. The fleeing units cannot hold. Units already engaged in combat when charged must hold. Any unit that forgets to declare a charge reaction will hold. Stand and shoot. If a unit is armed with missile weapons and can draw a line of sight at the charging unit, it may declare that it will attempt to stand and shoot. Um, mm -hmm. Measure the distance between the two units. If the distance is less than the movement characteristics of the charging unit, the charged unit is unable to raise its weapons in time. Wait, what? If the distance is less than the movement characteristic of the charging unit, okay, unable to raise weapons in time, must either hold or flee. In 
instead. Otherwise, even if the distance between the two units is greater than the maximum range of the charge unit's weapons, the charge unit will shoot at the charging unit. See page 137. Once this shooting has been resolved, the charged unit will hold and await the charging unit. Charging units are not required to make panic tests. See page 160. Fleeing units and units already engaged in combat. You know what? Fleeing units and units already engaged in combat when charged cannot stand and shoot, of course. Flee. Any unit that is not already engaged in combat may flee as a charge reaction. Units already fleeing must flee when charged. When a unit chooses to flee from a charge, it flees directly away from the charging unit. Move the unit about its center, see page 125, so that it is facing directly away from the center of the charging unit. After pivoting, the unit makes an immediate flee move. Okay? Should a fleeing unit not run far enough, it may be run down and destroyed by the charging unit, see page 129. Charge reactions model charging unit. So a unit can only stand and shoot in response to one charge per turn, even if charged by multiple units. Once all charges have been declared, the inactive player can choose which charging unit to stand and shoot at. The unit will then hold against the other charging units. If a unit charged by, a multi by multiple enemy units chooses to flee, it will flee directly away from the enemy unit with the highest unit strength. If two enemy units have the same unit strength, randomly determine which the unit flees directly away from. Note that in its haste to flee from one charging enemy unit, a unit might flee through another enemy unit. See page 133. Okay. Charge moves. Okay. Charge moves now. With charge reactions declared and resolved, it is time to see whether or not the charges are successful. Work through charges one at a time in an order decided by the active player, completing each before moving on to the next. Determine charge range. How far a unit can charge is based on its moving characteristic. However, because the charge represents warriors rushing forward at speed, units can charge further than their basic movement characteristic. To represent this, as well as the caprices of fate, a unit's charge range is determined by first making a charge roll. To make a charge roll, roll 2d6 and discard the lowest result. Random charges are back. The highest result is the result of the charge roll. If both dice roll the same result, discard either. Of course. <laughs> the result of the charge roll is then added to the unit's movement characteristic to give the unit's charge range. Wow. Let's practice that, huh? Let's roll 2d6. I'm about 2d6 right here. Let's see what would happen. Let's say I've got a movement of 4, and I'm going to roll 2d6 right here. What do we got? Oh, I discard the 1 and I get the 5. So I move an extra 5, so it's 9. So it's actually better than double. Okay, so I can see how that would be kind of fun. I can see how that would be fun. Okay. Uh, with its charge range um, established, the charging units make makes its charge move. If the charging units has inf insufficient movement to complete its charge move, it is unable to reach the enemy and it instead makes a failed charge. See figure one two one point one, which uh, we'll do soon. The charge move. Moving a charging unit is often a complicated procedure. For this reason, the charge move itself is covered in greater detail on 126. Okay. Uh, after the basics of movement and movement maneuver have been explained. Maximum possible charge range. A unit's maximum possible charge range is determined by adding 6, the highest possible result of an unmodified charge roll, to its current modify. Uh, current movement characteristic, taking into account any modifiers that might apply to its movement characteristic. 
Failed charge. A unit that makes a failed charge has started towards the enemy, but it is unable to cover the distance. The warriors in the unit simply lose impetus. If a unit makes a failed charge, it moves directly towards the target at a distance equal to the result of the charge roll, reeling as required. We go one, two, one, point one. Unit A has declared a charge against Unit B. Unit A's movement characteristic is 4 and a charge roll of 1 5 has been made for a total range of 9 inches. Alas, Unit B is 10 inches away, so the charge has failed. Unit A must now move 5 inches, the highest result of the two dice rolled. Okay, very good. Generally speaking, a player can move their units however they wish within the confines of the rules. However, sometimes units behave of their own accord. All compulsory movement is carried out in this subphase after charges have been resolved, but before other movement takes place. Fleeing units. Units that have failed to rally during the strategy phase will continue to flee during the compulsory move subphase. Fleeing units must be moved at the beginning of this subphase before moving any other units that are obliged to make a compulsory move. Moving a fleeing unit is often a complicated procedure for this reason. Fleeing itself is uncovered in greater detail on page 132. Always pushing it back after the basics of movement maneuver have been explained in more detail. Other types of compulsory movement. Other units that move in the compulsory move subphase follow the normal movement rules unless stated otherwise. Any special rules that apply to units that have a compulsory move will be described within their rules. For example, some units have a random movement characteristic. In other cases, a unit might be obliged to move in a specific direction or even in a random direction. Whatever the case, any compulsory moves that are resolved now after all fleeing units have moved, these compulsory moves can be resolved in any order the controlling player wishes. For many moves, with all charges and compulsory moves attended to, you can now move the rest of your army. While it might lack the drama of charging or the jeopardy of compulsory moves, the remaining move subphase is no less important. During this subphase, players maneuver their remaining units in order to set up charges for future turns, as well as attempt to deny any future charges their opponent will wish to make. This is also the time to maneuver missile troops and wizards so that they have suitable targets, seize important areas of the battlefield, and so on. Finally, conveyance spells can be cast at any point during this subphase. Note that units which are fleeing that charge this turn or that move during the compulsory move subphase cannot move again during this subphase. Their movement for the turn has already been completed. Movement in detail. Moving an army is an important and often decisive part of the game. When opposing commanders are well matched, move and counter move can be complex and challenging as the rival army is search for an advantage. One, two, three, here we go. The section begins with the rules for basic movement and maneuver before delving into the intricacies of charging and fleeing. Finally, you will find an explanation of how different types of battlefield terrain can hinder or even halt movement. Basic movement, the most basic move any model or unit can make is to move forward a number of inches up to its movement characteristic, as shown in figure 123.1. If there is more than one movement characteristic within a unit, the entire unit moves at the rate of the slowest model. Units of rate and rank and file are cumbersome and find it hard to change direction. Models and units must move forward in a straight line unless performing a maneuver. Figure 1.2.1.2.3.1 distance a model moves is measured from the front of its base. The model is then moved in the front of its base, placed in line with the end of the tape measure. Marching. Most units are able to march, allowing them to move rapidly across the battlefield. A marching unit can double its movement characteristic, while a marching uh, unit can wheel to change, wait, a wheel to change direction. While some, while some marching unit can wheel to change direction, but cannot perform any other maneuvers. However, a unit that marched in the movement phase cannot shoot during the shooting phase, including casting magic missile or magical vortex spells. Note that whilst in marching column, a close order formation may triple its movement characteristic when marching. Ooh, that is cool.
enemy sighted units are often unwilling to march when the enemy is close. If you wish a unit to begin a march move whilst within 8 inches of an enemy unit, ignoring enemy units that are fleeing, it must first make a leadership test. If this test is failed, the unit refuses to march but may move normally. If this test is passed, the unit may march. Note that if a unit attempts an enemy sighted test in order to march and fails, it is considered to have marched even if it, its controlling player then elects to not move the unit at all. There are six types of maneuver to choose from. Wheel, turn, move backwards, move sideways, regest the ranks and reform. During its movement, a unit may perform a single maneuver. Regardless of the maneuver performed, no model can move uh, more than twice its movement characteristic. Wheel. Wheeling is the best way of making an alteration of the direction a unit is facing while still being able to advance. The wheel the leading edge of the unit moves forward, pivoting around one of its front corners, shown in figure 124.1. When a unit wheels, every model counts as having moved as far as the outside model. Once the wheel is complete, you may use any movement the unit has remaining. Uh, unless it is charging, the unit can wheel more than once during its move and can alternate between moving forward and wheeling. 2. Turn. To execute a turn, all the models remain in place but turn 90 degrees or 180 degrees to face their side or rear. For every 90 degrees it turns, a unit uses a quarter of its movement characteristic. When a unit turns, all models in complete rank simply turn on the spot. Any models in an incomplete rear rank are moved to the rear of the new formation. When a unit is turned to face its side or rear, any command models it contains, see page 8198, are automatically placed into the new front rank. If there is not enough space in the front rank, such models are placed in the second rank. Okay, seeing so these figures here, four to four point two. Yeah, cool. That's just turning. Bam. Cool. You know, I just pivoted pretty much. From its initial position, 1 to 4.2, the unit may spend a quarter of its move to turn 90 degrees, as shown in figure 1 to 4.3. Or half its movement to 180 degrees, as shown in figure 1 to 4.4. Move backwards. The unit can move backwards as well as forwards, but tend to shuffle carefully rather than try purposefully to represent this unit that moves backwards with half its movement. Characteristic uh, move sideways. Units that move can units can move sideways as well as forward, but do so with caution in order to maintain their formation. To represent this, a unit that moves sideways must half its movement. Uh, uh, okay. Redress the ranks. Uh, units can redress the ranks by moving models to or from their rear ranks to decrease the or increase the number of moles in their front rank. A unit may use half of its movement characteristic in order to deduct up to five moles from its front rank. Uh, see if you want to five for one, or to add up to five moles to its front rank. Redress the ranks. Yeah. Half of its movement. So you could just make line hammer, right? Make line hammer. Oh, you hit terrain. Okay, readjust the ranks. And then keep moving if you have moved left. And then once you pass it, redress, redress the ranks again and then charge. Because line hammer. Uh, okay. Models in the remaining ranks are then rearranged to match the number of models in the front rank and maintain a correct formation. Remember, there must be the same number of models in each rank, only the rear rank may have few models. This unit uses half of its movement to reduce its front by five models. As a result, it goes from 10 wide to 5 wide, gaining an extra rank. This unit have, uses half of its movement to increase its frontage by five models. As a result, it goes from 5 wide to 10 wide. Reform. A reform represents the most complex of maneuvers a unit can perform on the battlefield, but on the tabletop it is quite straightforward. Reforming allows a unit to sacrifice its entire movement in order to both pivot uh, about its in its center to change its facing by up to 180 degrees and rearrange its ranks and files as required to either change its formation or to adopt a different formation. Pivoting. 
Sometimes the rules will require a unit to pivot, usually about its center. This is exactly as it sounds. The unit is not performing any of the movements previously described. Instead, it spins on the spot using its center as a pivot point, ignoring the presence of other units or terrain whilst it does so. The ends of the world, it is important to note that the edge of the battlefield does not represent the end of the world. It is perfectly acceptable for a corner to, of a unit to cross beyond the edge of the battlefield during a maneuver, provided the unit is able to, uh, to end its movement completely upon the battlefield. I don't remember reading that you need a 6x4 table. You don't? Interesting. Okay. Uh, the charge move. As, as mentioned previously, moving a charging unit can often be quite complex. Oh, finally we're on page 126. This is because a charging unit is obliged to fulfill certain criteria. A charging unit must endeavor to bring as many models as possible within its front rank into base contact with models in the charge unit. A charge unit must move by the shortest route possible to reach its charge target. A charging unit must move forward in as straight a line as possible. After moving, a unit that charged must ensure that it is aligned against the charge target. Maneuvering during a charge, unless stated otherwise, a charging unit cannot perform a turn, move backwards, move sideways, readjust the ranks or move forward, maneuver during its charge move. However, a charging unit must endeavor to bring the maximum number of models from both sides in base contact, which will often require some degree of maneuver. To facilitate this, the charging unit may wheel once at any point during its move, but as shown in figure 126.2. Okay, so 126.1, yep. Horses are charging, declare charge, wheel. Wheel first and then go straight, and then align. Hmm. Okay. Maneuvering during a charge. Unless that otherwise a charging unit cannot perform a turn, move backwards, move sideways, resist ranks or forward forward during a charge. However, a charging unit must endeavor to bring the maximum number of models from both sides into base contact which will often require some degree of maneuver. To facilitate this, a charging unit may wheel once at any point during its move. That's shown in figure one, two, six, one, two. Wheel once, charge, align. Uh, okay, note that a charging unit does not have to complete its uh, wheel if doing so would cause it to make a failed charge or would prevent the completion of a charge declared by another unit. Once a charging unit has completed any required wheel, it completes its movement, moving straight ahead towards the charge target and stops as soon as the two units touch. Aligning to the enemy, usually moving a charging unit in the manner described will leave it. Charge unit based kind of at a peculiar angle with an odd gap in between. The real battle warriors would quickly move to attack their enemies and in so doing close the gap, which is exactly what happens in the game, close the gap. Once the, once the charging unit contacts the charge target, it must perform a second free wheel, if required, uh, to bring its front facing flush contact with the facing of the enemy unit that has been charged. In, in, as shown in figure 126.4. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so we're on page 127. Sometimes your unit will be able to charge in the flank and rear of an enemy. This is particularly beneficial because an attack from an unexpected direction gives you an advantage to combat. The charging unit's position. When the charge is declared, uh, determines whether it charges into the front, flank, or rear of the enemy unit. A unit's position in relation to its potential charge target is determined when the charge is declared. If the charging unit is in the charge target's front arc, when the charge is declared, it charges in that front in unit's front arc. As, the, as units generally begin the game facing each other, this is the most common situation that will arise. However, if the charging unit is in a flank or arc, of its charge target when the charge is declared, it charges into the inch flank. If the charging unit is within rear arc of the charge target when the charge is declared, it charges into the unit's rear. Resolving uncertainties. Uncertainties. Sometimes a charging unit will straddle two arcs. In such cases, count how many models in the front rank of the charging unit lie within each arc. If there are more models in one arc, the unit is considered to be in that arc. If it is still unclear, the charging unit is considered to be in the arc that gives at the least advantage in terms of combat results, see page 151, for example, if you can determine whether a charging unit is in the flank or rear arc, it is in the flank arc. Unit A has been charged by units B and C. Unit B is completely within uh, unit A's front arc. However, straddles, however, straddles unit A's flank and rear arc, three of the models in unit C's flank arc are in the flank arc, whilst only two models are in the rear arc. 
Uh, unit C is therefore considered to be in unit A's flank and will charge accordingly. Yes. Unusual situations charging. Unusual situations can arise as units charge. The following phases attempt to deal with these. However, should a situation ever arise that cannot easily be resolved, players should agree with one, with one another upon the most logical course of action and avoid getting bogged down in overly long debates. Unable to align. On occasion, a charging unit will be able to make contact with its charge target, but unable to align to it because something lies in the way. In such cases, the charge target should align itself against the charging unit. If this is not possible, simply leave a gap in, the, in either case. The charging unit has made a disordered charge as shown in figure 128.1 and figure 128.2. Disordered charge unit that has made a disordered charge does not gain the initiative modifier for charging. See page 146. Okay. Uh, unit A charges unit B. It wheels to bring as many models as best kind of possible to avoid the terrain before moving in. Uh, after making contact uh, with unit A, cannot align to unit B. The terrain is in the way unit B then wheels to align. Not being as wide as the unit, it moves past the terrain, the gap is closed. Alright, so charging through terrain, a uh, charging unit must move by the shortest route possible when it, uh, to reach its charge target, therefore the charging unit will uh, often be obliged to move through difficult and dangerous terrain or across lonely obstacles. This is perfectly uh, uh, acceptable, but a charge made through any form of terrain is more difficult and often much slower than a charge made across open ground. Before making a charge, Charging units charge roll and check to see if any part of the unit will move through difficult or dangerous terrain or across the low lane obstacle when it makes its charge move. So that unit must discard the highest result when making its charge roll rather than the lowest. It will suffer a negative one modifier to its movement characteristic to a minimum of one when making its charge move. Finally, if a unit ends its charge move with a quarter, 25% or more of its models within difficult terrain or straddling a low lane obstacle, it becomes disrupted and can reclaim a rank bonus. Hmm. Okay, charging a fleeing enemy. When a charge unit turns tail and flees, the charging unit has two options. Attempt to run down an enemy that flees it, or attempt to redirect this charge. Running down the foe, once the charge has been has completed, its charge target has completed its flee move, the charging unit makes its charge move as normal, and the charge unit comes in contact with the fleeing unit. Uh, it will wheel to align as normal. Caught by the enemy, the fleeing unit is hacked to pieces and immediately removed from play. The charging unit may then attempt to reform by making a leadership test. If this test is failed, the unit is unable to reform. If this test is passed, the unit may make a free reform. In either case, the unit cannot move again this turn. If the charging unit does not make contact with the fleeing unit, it moves forward its full charge range. It has not made a failed charge. The charge target ran away. Redirecting a charge. Once the charge target has completed its flee move, the charging unit may attempt to redirect its charge if there is an eligible alternative charge target, as shown in figure 129.1. Hmm. Okay, charging unit one. Which the charging unit could have declared a charge against. Oh, yeah, this can be mm -hmm. against at the beginning of the phase, the, a unit that has been revealed by the movement of the fleeing unit. If the charging unit wishes to redirect, it must first make a leadership test. If this test has failed, the unit must attempt to run down the fleeing unit. If this test has passed, oh, okay, so leadership test first, okay. If the test is passed, a unit, the unit may redirect, immediately declaring a charge against its new target. But, oh, it's 1020. Wow. Uh, the, the target of a redirected charge does not have the time to stand and shoot. The only charge reactions available to it are hold and flee. Should flee, the charge cannot be redirected again. When a, charging, uh, when a charge is redirected, the original charge target is not run down and will flee to safety. A charge cannot be redirected if there are no eligible alternative charge targets. 
Unit A declared a charge against Unit B, which chose to flee and fled three inches. That's it. Charge cannot be redirected if there are no eligible alternative charge targets, obviously. Unit A declared a charge against B, which chose to flee and fled three. Wow, look at that, it all rhymes. Once Unit B has completed its move, Once unit B has completed its move, fleet move, unit A attempts to redirect the charge against unit C. To do so, makes a leadership test. Unit A passes this test with ease and free to redirect against uh, unit C. So you just, real, it should just like move, right? I don't know, maybe not. Real, boom, boom. Very good. Multiple charging units, when two or more units are charging in the same mark of a single enemy unit, they are considered to move simultaneously. Both units must try to bring the maximum number of models from both sides in base contact. Multiple charge targets, any unit may be unable to charge its intended target uh, without making contact with other enemies. In such cases, the charging unit must declare a charge against all enemy units in contact, and each is able to declare its own charge reaction. If the charging unit is unable to align itself to all of the enemy units once base contact, once contact has been made, those enemy units Ch uh, the charging unit can align against them, against must themselves align against it. The charging unit counts as having made the sort of charge uh, described on page 128 against any unit that was obliged to align against it. Units A and B have both declared charge against Unit C. They use a movement to ensure the maximum of the room okay. Unit A wishes to charge unit C, however, due to with the unit A cannot do so without contact with both units B and D. Unit A therefore declares a charge against all three and all three declare their charge reactions. Once unit A has moved, it's unable to align against B and D, therefore B and D alone must align to unit A. Unit A is considered to have been to sort of charge. Ah, okay. Against units B and D, but not C, okay. Oh man, oh, okay. Accidental contact, sometimes particularly during the push and pull of combat, uh, units make accidental contact with enemy units. Should this prove unavoidable, there are several ways to resolve this. If a unit is contacted in its front arc, and if it is not itself already engaged in combat, the unit may either commit to combat, Aligning against the enemy unit that made accidental contact with it. Um, another unit counts as having charged in both the fight with initiative order. Give ground 1 through 4 to avoid being drawn into unwanted combat. However, if a unit is accidentally contacted in its flank or rear arc, um, or is itself already engaged in combat, its only player must move it. If necessary, any units is in combat with a side by the minimum amount necessary to ensure it's both one inch away from that accidentally contacted it and still engaged in its own combat. Hmm.
Accidental contact when running down the foe. Charging unit that shows me run down a fleeing charge target may make accidental contact with another enemy unit. When this happens, the charging unit is considered to have redirected its charge against that unit, as described on page 129, and the fleeing unit escapes. If the charging unit makes accidental contact with two or more enemy units, treat it as you would a unit charging multiple charge targets, as described previously. Okay, accidental contact during a charge. A charging unit might find its path unexpectedly blocked by another enemy unit, usually one that has fled from another charge. If the charging unit is able to wheel to avoid the unit and complete its charge, it should. If this is not possible, or if doing so will cause a failed charge, the charging unit has two options. It can halt its charge, or it can continue ahead, halting a charge. The charging unit wishes to halt this charge. It is moved towards. It is moved towards its charge target as normal, stopping one inch away from the unit that has blocked its path. Halt the charge is on a failed charge. Continuing ahead, if the charging unit chooses to continue ahead, the outcome will depend on the enemy unit. If a charging unit makes accidental contact with a fleeing enemy unit, it will wheel to a line as normal. The fleeing unit is considered to have been run down by the charging unit. It is immediately removed from play. Charging unit's movement comes to an end and, due to the confused circumstances, cannot attempt to reform. If a charging unit makes accidental contact with an enemy unit that is not fleeing, simply treat the charging unit as having redirected its charge into that unit. Okay. Oh. Flee! Units flee for many reasons. Uh, units that fail to rally during the strategy phase will flee in the compulsory move subphase. Others will flee from charging enemy and so forth. When the unit flees, it abandons all formation and heads to safety by the most direct route possible. Direction of flight when a unit flees, the, um, the direction of its flight will be determined by what it causes to flee. In most cases, this is an enemy unit. Units that fail to rally will continue in the direction of their earlier flight. Rarely changing direction. Fleeing from an enemy unit, when the rules call for an enemy to flee, directly fly from an enemy unit, pivoting the flee, uh, pivot the fleeing unit about its center that is facing directly away from the center of the enemy unit that it's fleeing from, as shown in figure 13201. After pivoting, the unit makes an immediate flee move, as shown in 132.2. Uh, yep. Unit A is fleeing from unit B, therefore unit A pivots. Yes, okay. Fleeing as a compulsory move. Units that fail to rally during the strategy phase and continue to flee during the compulsory move subphase, the move phase will continue along the previous path. When a unit flees a, as a compulsory move, it moves straight ahead in the direction it is facing. But how far do they move? To determine how, there we go, the flee move. How far, to determine how far a fleeing unit, unit moves, make a flee roll after pivoting it, if required. To make a flee roll, roll 2d6. The result of this roll is the distance in inches that the fleeing unit moves. Wow. A fleeing unit moves straight ahead in the direction it is facing. Must move the full distance rolled, even if doing so, even if doing so would take the unit off the battlefield. May change direction by pivoting only if required to move around impossible terrain. Destruction of a fleeing unit. Should any part of a fleeing unit move into contact with or cross beyond the edge of the battlefield, the entire unit is removed from play and counts as having been destroyed. Fleeing through friendly units. As fleeing units have broken formation, they are able to move through friendly units without stopping or slowing. If the Flee move would result in the fleeing unit ending up on top of a friendly unit that carries on fleeing straight forward until it is clear of the unit and will halt. Okay. Uh, fleeing through enemy units. Sometimes a fleeing unit will run through an enemy unit. This is obviously extremely perilous. To represent this, uh, once a fleeing unit's movement is complete, make a peril test for each model in the unit that moves through an enemy unit. Uh, Turn a fig one through three one to make a parallel test roll a d6 and a roll of a four plus the model escapes that incident. One on a roll of one through three, the model struck by the enemy loses a single wound. 
if the flee move would result in the fleeing unit ending up on top of or within one inch of an enemy unit, it carries on fleeing straight forward as an, until it is one inch away um, from the enemy unit that will halt. Note there is no limit to how many parallel tests a unit may be required to make during a single game. Figure one, two, three point one. A unit must flee. Unit A must flee through enemy unit, causing eight moles to make a feral test. Hmm. Okay. Fleeing through terrain, a fleeing unit moves through difficult, dangerous terrain without suffering any negative modifiers to its movement characteristics, or must make any dangerous terrain tests required. See page one two five. Should a fleeing unit come into contact with impossible right terrain, it must pivot around its center in order to move around about the shortest possible route. The greater the danger, if a unit is required to flee directly away from two or more enemy units at the same time, it will flee directly away from the enemy unit with the highest unit strength. If two enemy units have the same unit strength, randomly determine the unit which the unit flees from. The limits of endurance, no matter how determined the coward, there is a limit to how far a model can run. A unit can only ever make one flee move per phase of the game, should a unit ever be required to make a second flee move during, the, during a phase in which it has already fled, it does not pivot if required to do so and will flee zero inches. Give ground and fall back in good order. The rules will often call for units to give ground and fall back in good order. Most often they will do this after losing a round of combat on or after suffering heavy casualties from enemy shooting. Give ground a unit that gives ground does so reluctantly maintaining its formation while attempting to put a bit of much needed distance between itself and the enemy. When a unit gives ground it moves two inches directly away from the enemy or unit units that cause it to give ground without turning, pivoting or otherwise uh, changing it in facing in any way, stopping immediately should it come in contact with another unit or terrain or if continuing to move would bring it within one inch of an enemy unit. Fall back in good order. When a unit falls back in good order, it is beating a hasty retreat, but has not yet lost all courage and is able to quickly rally its fighting spirit. A unit that falls back in good order moves exactly like a fleeing unit with the following exceptions. When making the fleet roll, a unit that falls back in good order rolls 2d6 and discards the lowest result. If the dice roll is the same result, discard either. Um, uh, a unit that falls back in good order automatically rallies at the end of its flee move. Described on page 117. Humble stuff, movement. Movement rules are comprehensive and detailed. Despite this, there will always be situations where something is unclear. Conveyance spells. If any of the active players wizards know any conveyance spells that they may attempt to cast them at any point during the remaining move subphase, uh, loan models, loan models such as characters, monsters, or chariots, or units, and move as such, different formations. The rules in this section deal with the units and cause all the formation units and different formations may move differently. These formations are explained in greater detail on page 182. Jeez. Moving off the battlefield, except in the case of fleeing units, um, as discussed previously in pursuing units, BNC page 157, no unit is permitted to move off the battlefield. Okay, yep. Uh, reinforcements, a unit that enters the battlefield as reinforcements does so during the compulsory move sub phase, it is placed with the rear arc in full contact with the battlefield edge, upon which edge and where will depend upon the rule that triggers its arrival, facing towards the center of the battlefield. A unit that enters as reinforcements cannot march in counters having uh, moved for the purposes of shooting but can otherwise move normally during the remaining move sub phase. Terrain is covered in more detail in the battlefield terrain section. For now, it is sufficient to explain that the terrain is divided into seven categories open ground, hills, difficult terrain, uh, difficult and dangerous and impassable terrain, leading obstacles including both low and high and woods. This page focuses on how certain types of terrain into movement players should discuss before the battle begins, which category which category of terrain feature falls into. Open ground and hills, any part of the battlefield not taken up by terrain feature is open ground. Otherwise, unless otherwise agreed, hills are open ground. Open ground is not a peed movement at all. Difficult terrain, if any part of the unit moves through difficult terrain, that unit suffers a negative one modifier to its movement characteristic to a minimum of one. This uh, modifier is applied 
whether the unit begins its movement into difficult terrain, passes through difficult terrain uh, during its movement, or ends its movement in difficult terrain. In addition, a unit that ends its movement with a quarter, 25% or more of its models within difficult terrain, or stranding a low linear obstacle below, becomes disrupted. Low linear obstacles. For the purposes of movement, low linear obstacles are uh, less than two inches high, such as walls, hedges, and treated as difficult terrain. Dangerous terrain. Oh, uh. Dangerous terrain hinders movement just like difficult terrain. In addition, make a dangerous terrain test for each model in the unit. Uh, that either begins uh, its movement in dangerous terrain or passes through dangerous terrain during its movement or ends its movement in dangerous terrain. To make a dangerous terrain test, roll a DC 6 on a roll of 2 plus, the model successfully negotiates the dangerous terrain without incident. On a roll of 1, the model has suffered a terrible wound, so it loses a single wound. Uh, note that a model must make a dangerous terrain test for each separate dangerous terrain feature it encounters during a single move. Impossible terrain. Impossible terrain is said to be able to move through that it cannot be crossed. During the course of the battle, units must go around the impossible terrain. High linear obstacles for the purpose of movement. High linear obstacles, i.e. two inches high or more, such as a castle wall, are treated as impassable terrain. Uh, woods. For the purpose of movement, woods are treated as difficult or dangerous terrain, as agreed by the players. Battlefield decoration. Some terrain features are so small that while they may provide a vital objective to the scenario, they cannot be reasonably ex be expected to interfere with movement. Models can clearly move through very small decorative elements of terrain, less than two inches. Okay. Ah, shooting phase. During the shooting phase, your army lets you fly with the missile weapons at its disposal, be they humble bows, fantastical war machines, or devastating spells. Most armies will contain a unit or two of archers, war machine, or a wizard that knows uh, various deadly spells and will use these to thin the enemy ranks. Other armies will field masses and masses of mile missile units, intending to seize victory in the shooting phase by obliterating the enemy at long range. This section covers the shooting rules for common weapons and the majority of troop types, including wizards and Bukas magic. Uh, missile or magical vortex spells, such as described on page 107. War machines and other more peculiar devices of destruction are explained in greater detail in the own section, see page 222. However, the most colossal trebuchet is governed by many of the same rules as the humble bow and arrow, so it is worth reading this section before unlimbering your organ gun. The shooting phase sequence, just like the other phases of the game, the shooting phase is broken on its four sub phases. However, unlike the strategy and movement phases, the shooting phase sequence is allowed uh, in full, each for unit, uh, one at a time. Six hours, ugh. Simply choose a unit in your army, then complete all four sub-phases in that unit uh, order shown opposite. You may then choose another unit, repeating the process of all units have had a chance to shoot across spells. Choose unit, declare target, the active player chooses a unit in their army that is able to shoot, and then they check the unit's range and light of sight. Any potential targets to claim its target for all hit, the active player rolls to hit for the shooting unit. Sometimes not all models will be able to shoot, and of course, as you can, certain modifiers may need to be applied to that to roll to hit. Roll to wound and make armor save for each successful roll to hit. The player makes a roll to wound. Of, uh, for each of these rolls that cause a wound, their opponent may be able to make an armor save roll. Remove casualties and make panic tests for each unsafe wound cause the target. Uh, to lose one wound, models reduce zero wounds are removed uh, as casualties, if enough casualties, uh, oh, we'll have to make a panic test, okay. Roll to hit, to determine uh, whether a model hits its target, must roll to hit, make a roll to hit, roll a d6, for each model that's shooting, look up the target number needed to uh, target the table below, any dice, Equal to beat the target number shown after applying modifiers to hit the target. Ballistic skill, beat six to roll. We got a one, six plus to hit, two, five plus three, four plus three, four, yeah. Fast dice rolling, speed the process up and rolling the dice one is time for each model. Count how many models in your unit are shooting and roll a batch of that many dice. If there are models, you might prefer smaller batches. However, if your unit contains more models, uh, that have different characteristics such as ballistic skill or models that are equipped with weapons that are different. Uh, profiles, target numbers, hit wound, and may or vary. In such cases, uh, you must roll different batches of dice, making it clear to your opponent what each batch represents and the target number you 
Need rolls of a natural one, regardless of warrior skills, shots can go Ori when making a roll to hit. A roll of a natural one is always a fail, regardless of modifiers. BS of six or higher, if you want BS is because I re you should re roll, it should fail to shoot. Oh wow. So if you roll two ones in a row, you miss with a ballistic skill of 10. That's cool. Uh, tip modifiers, many better f uh, conditions can reduce the accuracy of shooting. These are represented by a series of modifiers that apply to the rolls to hit. Uh, tip modifiers for shooting are cumulative, uh, when, except when noted otherwise, the most commonly entered into tip modifiers that others may also apply. Moving and shooting, firing long range, seeing and shooting, target behind partial cover, target behind full cover. In case of models BSF 6 or higher, these modifiers only applied in the first dice roll. Now that it is quite possible for modifiers to be applied to some models in shooting, uh, when this happens, simply resolve two or more shots separately. Roll to wound and make armor saves. For each successful roll to hit, a uh, hit has been caused on the target, however, hitting the target. Okay, this is how to wound chart to hit chart weapon strength. Yeah, cool, so for strength. Does target toughen to plus to, uh, to wound? Yeah, cool. Uh, determine how many hits cause wounds and then make a roll to wound. Yep, okay, to wound. Too tough to wound if your strength is six or more, lower than the target's toughness, you cannot wound them. They're simply too tough. Hmm. Yeah, if you're if it's four and this is ten, you can't wound the bastards. Uh, make armor saves. Oh, if you were in a battle without the protection of armor, it's represent this your opponent can make an armor save roll for each wound caused by your shooting to make an armor save roll while the D6 for the wounded model and compare the result to the model's armor value if the if the armor save Roll equals or exceeds the model's armor value, the model is saved by its armor and the wound discarded. If the result is less than the model's armor value, the model's armor has proven effective and the roll is unsaved. More than one save, the model can make both an armor save roll and ward save and make its armor save roll first. If this is failed or modified to the point at which the model cannot pass it, the model makes its ward save. And then only one ward save can be attempted and then different ward saves can be combined together if the model has more than one ward save, simply use the best. Gods are great, but only a fool would forego sturdy armor and trust their life to a god. Boy, I bear find that priest of her son. Okay, some cool wood elf right there. Uh, Root casualties and make panic tests. Unsafe wounds are applied to the target unit, causing models to remove his casualties. If unit loses enough models, it will have to take a panic test. I uh, will have to uh, fall back and flee. Remove casualties. These unsafe wounds are applied to the target. Each causing one wound to be lost. Describe on page 102. When a model is reduced to zero wounds, it becomes a casualty removed from play. This uh, continues until there are no more unsafe wounds to be applied to the unit. No need to hysterics. A unit is only required to make a single panic test during any shooting phase. For example, if a unit loses more than one quarter of its number to shooting from one enemy unit, but it passes its panic test, it will not have to take another panic test during the shooting phase, even if it suffers more casualties from another enemy unit. This is because while shooting is rolled one at a time, uh, in reality, units would shoot more or less simultaneously. If you're listening to me watching the, uh, reading this rule book, I am just skimming through this book at this point. I've read all the way up to the end of the movement phase stuff, and now I'm just skimming through it. Um, so yeah, if you are listening, good for you. That is amazing that you're listening this far into the video, uh, but I'm just gonna skim through the rest of this book because I am about to pass out, it's ridiculous. Resolving unusual attacks, uh, some unusual attacks or special rules may inflict hits during the strategy or movement phase, such as a result uh, using the steps outlined in the sub-phase 3 and 4 of the shooting phase. The combat phase. Ugh. With the foe outmaneuver, the combat phase. With the foe outmaneuvered and weakened by spellcraft and shooting, it's time to finish the job. The combat phase is when your warriors hack, slice, and bomb their way through enemy ranks. A successful combat phase can complete change the fortunes your army had. If you're prepared well in your earlier phases, victory is likely to be your reward. Uh, end of turn, once all combat phases are uh, went, you know, uh, the combat phase sequence. Uh, choose and fight combat. Active player chooses the combat and starting with the models of the highest initiative attacks are made, wounds inflicted and casualties removed, then surviving models with low initiative. Repeat this process until all models involved in the combat have fought. Calculate combat result, break test, and then follow, follow up and pursuit. So we've got calculate combat result with the fighting done. Work out which side has won the combat, no way how much, unless the combat is a stalemate, one side will have lost by one, two or more combat result points. Break test each unit on the losing side of the combat must make a break test. The outcome of this test determines whether the losing gives ground, falls back in good order, or the test down and flees. Hmm. 
Okay. Uh, follow up in pursuit. Units on the winning side of the combat can choose to follow up an enemy that gives ground to pursue an enemy that falls back in good order or breaks or to restrain from pursuit. Uh, in a turn, once the combat is resolved, the active player a turn ends. Play then passes the active player and the turn begins. And as each turn ends, a new one begins. It is worth making a note of how many turns and rounds have been played. Okay. Oh, choose and fight combat. Yep. Roll the hit, roll the wound. Uh, who can fight? Any units that are in base contact with one or more enemy units are engaged in combat. Each individual uh, engagement between two or more units is referred to as combat. The active player chooses one combat to resolve in full, referred to as fighting around combat. This process is repeated to all combats have been fought. Who can fight? It is rare that every model in the unit is able to fight. Usually only models in a fighting rank can fight. Whilst the models behind them press forward, ready to take the place of the fallen. Base contact. Any model that is in base contact with an enemy model can fight, even if the enemy model is in contact with its flank or rear, or, or even if the model's base is only touched the corner. The fighting rank. When two opposing units are engaged in combat, any row of models, be it rank or file, that has one or more models in base contact with the enemy is called the fighting rank. Every model within the fighting rank can fight. This represents models in that row, but not in base contact with the enemy encircling the foe. And thus, Lionhammer was born. Oh, Lionhammer, it's ridiculous, it doesn't even make sense. Uh, this represents models in that row, but not in base contact with the enemy encircling the foe. Huh. Okay. Supporting attack. Some models are equipped with some weapons that allow them to make supporting attack. To make a supporting attack, a model must be directly behind a friendly model that it that is itself in the fighting rank. However, supporting attacks cannot be made, made to a unit's flank or rear, nor can they be made by a model that is itself in a fighting rank. Units A and B are engaged in combat. Every model in the front rank of unit A and several models in the front rank of unit B are in base contact with enemy models. Therefore, the front rank of each unit is the fighting rank. Although not every model in the front rank of unit B is in base contact with an enemy model, those that are not would in reality encircle the boat rather than stand by and watch. Therefore, every model that, has, that belongs to the fighting rank of unit B can fight. Okay, where are we up to now? Um, we got how many attacks? Yeah, hang on, I wanted to read that properly. I would rather them like encircle the enemy uh, straight away, you know. Whatever. How many attacks? When a model fights in combat, it makes a number of attacks. How many is how many is determined by its attacks characteristic and its and its proximity to the enemy? If a model is in base contact uh, with an enemy model, it makes a number of attacks equal to its attack characteristic. If a model is able to fight but it is but is not in base contact with an enemy model, it can make only one attack uh, regardless of its attack's characteristic. Strikes first, models initiative, you have charging units, charging the enemy gives considerable advantage, uh, which is increased when charging the enemy's uh, first. Every model within charging unit modifies its initiative characteristic for the remainder of that turn to a maximum of 10. Hmm. Uh, charging an enemy in their front arc, plus one initiative per full inch moved. Cool. To a maximum of plus three. Enemy in the flank or rear arc, plus one. Per full inch move to a maximum of plus four. Hmm, so sometimes the charged unit can still go first if they are like ridiculously initiative. Okay, multiple units in combat. Yep, we got that. That's cool. Roll to hit, two hit chart. Fast dice rolling, rolls of a natural one, rolls of a natural six. We got to hit chart, we got our to wound chart on this page, rolls of natural one, roll to wound. Um, we've got make armor saves. If the armor save roll equals or exceeds the model's armor value, the model is saved by its armor and the wound is discarded. If the model is less than the model's armor value, the model's armor has proven ineffective and the wound is unsaved. Determining armor value. The value of a model's armor is determined 
by the equipment it carries. Uh, this work that this is work the artist described in the shooting section on page one four one. We got note that as with shooting, if you roll different batches of dice when rolling to hit, you must continue to roll dice in the same batches when rolling to wound. Yeah, cool. Okay. Oh, it's the old skeleton artwork. I like that. Very nice. Of that, remove casualties. Each unsaved wound is applied to the target unit, causing one wound to be lost. As described on page 102, when a model is reduced to zero wounds, it becomes casualties removed from play. This continues as all the remaining unsaved wounds be applied to the unit, or there are no models remaining to be removed as casualties. Uh, stepping forward and closing in. Oh. Fight on with the casualties removed. Check to see if there are any models with a lower initiative still to fight in this combat. Okay. Standards overkill. Well, standards warriors fight. Uh, standard. If your unit includes a standard bearer, you may claim a bonus of plus one combat bonus point. Woo! Battle standard. If your unit includes a battle standard bearer, you may claim an additional bonus of plus one combat bonus point. Um, cool. Flank, flank attack. Uh, you get plus one. Rear attack. You get plus two. Cool. High ground. Now, if your unit occupies a higher position than that of the enemy, if you're fighting along the crest of a hill, you can claim plus one, plus one bonus. Overkill. Um, if a character is fighting in a challenge, kills their opponent, causes more unsafe wounds than their opponent has range remaining, then for each excess wound, you may claim bonus plus one, up to a maximum of five. Challenges are a special type of combat fought between characters and covered characters in section page 210. Uh, many special rules confer additional bonuses. Yep. Close order formation that is in combat order mm. may claim a bonus of plus one combat res point. Any special rules that confer such bonuses will detail criteria that must be met. Who is the winner? Once both sides have calculated their combat results, you will be able to determine the winner of that combat round. Um, they will have to make a break test. If both sides have the same score, the combat is draw, the units remain locked in place. Uh -huh. Combat results in multiple units in combat. If possible, it is indeed likely that more than two units will become engaged in a single combat. When this happens, calculating the combat result can become quite complex. This page attempts to offer some clarity to uh, confusing situations. So, okay. Rank bonus in multiple combats. When you have several units engaged in combat, you do not count the rank bonus for all of them. Instead, you only count the rank bonus that grants the highest number bonus combat results. For example, if you have two units engaging a single enemy in combat, uh, one of which has a rank bonus of plus one, the other has a rank bonus of plus two, you may claim a bonus of plus two combat result as that is the higher. Oh, that kind of sucks, doesn't it? Yeah, it does actually. Okay. Nice. Toon Kings artwork there. Very nice. Advanced rules. Okay. This section contains the advanced rules. Everything covered in the core, how to play rules is explained here. Alright, very good. Uh, this includes the universal special rules for the most commonly seen formation types other than formed infantry, in-depth descriptions of the different troop types. Special rules. What are special rules? Uh, when a creature has an ability that deviates in some way from the core game rules. Yep. Okay. We got universal special rules, we got army special rules, we got unique special rules, we got uh, rule priority, cumulative special rules. Um, cool, let's uh, read that. For example, if a model is under the effects of a spell that grants it armor bane and carries a weapon that has armor bane, the model would be considered to have armor bane 3. Hmm. Okay. Page 166, we got a dragon flame, flame tip template here. Breath weapon, a model with a breath weapon core, you can use it once per round during the shooting phase of its turn and place the flame template with this board end of the intended target and its narrow end, touching the model's base edge anywhere along its front arc. Breath weapons cannot be used when making the standard shoot charge reaction, or when the model is engaged in combat. Mm, okay, armor bane. If a model with this special rule rolls as a natural six when making a, a to wound roll, uh, the armor piercing cast characteristic of its weapon is improved by the amount shown in brackets uh, after the name of this special rule, shown here as X. Okay. If a natural 6 is rolled when rolling to wound with a weapon that has an AP of, in the armor bane of 1, its AP counts as being negative 1, 
attack Gala, right? Uh, when making an armor save against that wound. Okay. I thought strength negated that. Oh well. Chariot runners, close order. Yeah, uh, we got unit consisting of models with a special rule made up to close order formation on page 100. Counter charge. Mm, uh, okay. That's cool. Counter charge special rule. Imperial. Treat all terrain as open ground for purposes of movement. You cannot end your movement inside a passable terrain. You can pass through it. Uh, ethereal creatures can be wounded by magical attacks. Characters that are not ethereal can not join units that are vice versa. Drilled! Hmm, some regiments spend endless hours training to perform complex maneuvers. Unless it is fleeing, drilled unit may perform a free redress to ranks maneuver immediately before moving. Once this maneuver is complete, the unit moves as normal. In addition, a drilled unit can march whilst within 8 inches of an enemy unit, without first having to make leadership tests. Note that any character that joins a drilled unit is considered drilled as well. Uh, drag along. Great war engines may be dragged to battle by hordes of infantry. A model with a special rule that begins moving with one inch of friendly unit. Troop type of unit can, uh, that is not fleeing. That contains ten or more models may replace the movement characteristic of the unit. Detach. A unit with this special rule can be fielded as a detachment. Cumbersome. Weapons with this Special rule cannot be used when making a stand and shoot reaction. Evasive. Once per turn, when this unit is declared a target during the enemy shooting phase, it may sh choose to fall back in good order and flee directly away from the enemy shooting at it. Cool. Uh, extra attacks. A model with this special rule has a modifier to its attacks characteristics in brackets. If this modifier is determined by this, uh, the roll of a dice, roll when the model's combat is chosen during any choose and fight combat subphase. Pass cavalry. Uh, if all the models within a unit arrayed in open order formation have a special rule, the unit may perform its quick turn even if it's marched. Uh, see that on page 183. Fear. Models with this special rule cause fear. If you declare a charge, um, uh, you have to make a leadership test. If the test has failed, you can't charge. Uh, if you pass, you can. If a unit is engaged with an enemy uh, unit that causes both fear and has a higher unit strength when its combat is chosen during uh, any choose and fight combat subphase, you must make a leadership test. If this test has failed, any models in the unit that direct their attacks against the fear causing enemy suffer a negative one to hit. A uh, feigned flight, if this unit chooses to flee as a charge reaction, it automatically rallies at the end of its turn. That is cool. First charge, if this unit's first charge begins successful, the charge target becomes disrupted until the end of the combat phase turn. Alright, we're going to skip. And we're going to unstable. Wow, there are so many special rules. <laughs> Warp spawn. A model with this special rule cannot make a regeneration save against a wound caused by a magical attack. In addition, characters of warp spawn cannot join units that are and vice versa. Unusual formations. Okay, we've got a heap of unusual formations here. Uh, that is great. Okay, look. I think we're just going to jump here now. Um, Oh, page 282, Regimental Units and Detachments. Okay, that's a detachment special rule. Regimental Deployment, Regimental Leadership. We've got Regimental Psychology. There are so many rules here. Um, oh, wow. Look at that. That is the Warhammer 6th edition artwork <laughs> for the box set. Beautiful. Beautiful artwork. Love that. Realms of magic. The raw stuff of magic enters the world directly from the realm of chaos flowing through the vast interdimensional gates at the world's poles. These gates were created by the old ones in an age long past, served both as doorways through which the godlike old ones could come and go between worlds 
and a means by which to draw magic into the world and harness its power. Long ago, a great cataclysm caused these gates to collapse. Ooh, wow. Uh, releasing a deluge of raw magic upon the world so great that it instantly overburdened the delicate ma ma machinations of the old ones. In a moment, the geomantic web, the lattice work of the mystical pathways built into the fabric of the world to fuel and control their world, shaping engines shattered and wide cracks formed in the foundations of the old ones wax. The laws of magic. Ho, oh, here we go. Wizards are a formidable force in the battlefield, able to wreak indestructible uh, incredible destruction weaken or strengthen other warriors or summon terrible beasts to fight at their side. The rules for using wizards and casting spells in your games have already been covered in detail in the magic section, found on page 106. On the following pages you will find uh, the laws of magic, lists from which the wizards generate their spells. Each law of magic represents a particular approach towards the study and use of magic, giving each particular character reflected by the spells within it. Different wizards have access to different laws of magic. Every wizard's rules include the laws of magic they know. In some cases it will be stated that, that they know spells from a single given law of magic, whilst in others it will be stated that they know spells from one of a number of given laws of magic. Where this is the case, you must choose one of these laws when writing a muster list. Spells and spell generation. Each player randomly generates spells for each of their wizards before armies are deployed. If your army contains more than one wizard, you may generate spells for each in an order of your choosing. Each law of magic contains seven spells, six numbered, one to six, and a seventh signature spell. To determine the spells of your wizard knows, roll a number of d6 equal to their level of wizardry, rerolling any duplicate results. The result show which spell your wizard knows. If you wish, your wizard may discard one of the, these randomly generated spells and instead select the signature spell of their chosen lore of magic. Any number of wizards in your army may do this. Ugh, okay. Spells fall into six categories. These determine which, uh, during which phase of the game they can be cast. Yep, all of them. We've got battle magic. Interesting. What? The lore of battle? They don't say lore of fire anymore, it's just like battle magic. Uh, okay, so we got Hammer Hand, which is a signature spell. That's cool. We got Fireball, Curse of Arrow Attractor. Oh, it's cool. They got seven. Seven spells in each lore of magic now. In the heat of battle, Mighty Wizard summoned columns of fire to burn through the enemy. We got Fireball, Curse of Arrow Attraction, which is a hex, Pillar of Fire, we've got Arcane Urgency, we've got Oaken Shield, and we've got a Curse of Cowardly Flight. Ooh, I like it. Demonology. <laughs> it's no longer lore of this, lore of that, it's just, it's demonology. The Summoning. Missile. We've got Steed of Shadows. What is this? Those that make study of the realm of chaos, that twisted and warped nether world in which the ruinous powers reside, known as known as demonologists. These cursed souls are drawn to their study in the vain hope of gaining ma ma mastery of the demonic denizens of that realm and turning their power against the chaos gods. Seldom are such noble intentions realized, for those that converse with demons are inevitably corrupted why they whispered lies. Steed of Shadows. Cool. It's convenience. Gathering Darkness. We've got Demonic Familiars. Demonic Vessel. We've got Vortex of Chaos. And a Demonic Vigor. That, uh, cool. Yeah, cool. Dark Magic. We've got a Doom Bolt spell. This is like Dark of Magic, is it? Once in the pure magic flowed into the world, whole and sully unsullied, it was unnatural force. A natural force under the control of a race of bold godlike beings with the coming of chaos was with the change as a darker, more unstable form of magic was unleashed in the mortal realm, one which refused to be chained by the hand of mere mortals. Doom Bolt. Word of pain. 
Nice. Theme of Corruption, Infernal Gateway, Phantasmagoria, Battle Lust, Soul Eater. Damn. Elementalism, Storm Call, Flaming Sword, Plague of Rust, uh, Summon Elemental Spirit, Earthen Ramparts, Wind Blast, Travel Mystical Pathway. High Magic. Oh, this is the high up stuff, okay. Drain magic. Wow, nice. Walk between worlds. Yeah. Till the side of your next turn, self plays the caster in any unit they've joined. Gain the ethereal and reserve move special rule. Fiery convocation. Tempest. Corporeal unmaking. Fury of Cain. Shield of Saffron. Illusion, Glittering Robe, Mind Razor, Shimmering Dragon, Column of Crystal, Confounding Convocation, Spectral Doppelganger, Miasmic Mirage, The Dwellers Below, Deathly Cabal, Unquiet Spirits, Spiritual Vortex, Curse of Years, Spectral sea Steed, Spirit Leech. That was Necromancy, by the way. Yeah, Necromancy. Next we have, wow, magic. Fist of Gork, haha, <laughs> classic. All more. All right, now this is a different one. Okay, it's a blast template. In response to the Shaman's frantic and hopping, gesticulating, a great green fist materializes from the air and wallops the foe. Vindictive Glare, Hand of Mork. Oh yeah, you can teleport them, right? Just spell can be target friendly characters. Can target characters engage in combat. You may immediately move the target from the character uh, from the battlefield and replace it anywhere within 2d6 inches of its original location. Uh, yeah, cool. Hmm, interesting. Oh, flicks a hero across the battlefield. That's fun. Bad Moon Rising. Woo! Evil Sun Shining. Here we go. Foot of Gork. There's a massive green foot on the battlefield and it seems to be moving. Uh, remains in play. Place a large uh, five inch blast template so that its central hole is within 15 inches of the caster. Whilst in play, the template is treated as dangerous terrain. The template moves 2d6 in a random direction. That's awesome. During every start of turn subphase, any unit, friend or foe, uh, that touches suffers d3 strength 5 hits. <laughs> d3 plus 3 strength 5 hits and an AP of minus 1. Very cool. Armor piercing, that's what it means. AP is armor piercing. Magic items. Whoa, we got lots of magic items here. Ex com extremely common magic items. What? Arcane items. Enchanted items. Mm, magic weapons, magic armor, talismans, magic standards, enchanted items, arcane items, limitations, uniqueness, and characters. Famous and powerful individuals from the Warhammer world and characters have access to finest equipment. A named character may carry two or more items from a single category. Note that named characters may also be equipped with truly unique magic items. That means there will be named characters. They will have characters. People were saying there are no characters, but they will be. That says it right there. Named characters. Single use magic items. What's in a name? The magic items listed on the following pages often have a name that describes them quite specifically, but this does not mean the model has to carry away that exact item. For example, in the hands of the General of the Empire, it would make sense that the sword was striking to resemble the fine rapier, but when wielded by an orc or boss, the same rapier would look out of place. It's perfectly ex acceptable for the model of uh, an orc or orc boss equipped with the straw of striking to carry a large good brutal cleaver instead. What matters is that the points have been paid. Okay, that's fine. Okay, magic weapons. We got Ogre Blade. Oh. We got Sword of Battle. Jewelist Blades. Dragon Slaying Sword. Headsman's Axe. 
spell eater axe giant blade sort of swiftness berserker blade sort of might biting blade sort of striking burning blade magic armor armor of destiny benazzling helm armor of silvered steel we got spell shield okay talismans dawnstone talisman of protection pain master's coin we got some cool sounding items here a war banner mm -hmm. blazing banner flaming attacks cool Rampaging Banner. Reroll its charge roll. Raise a standard. Armor Bane. Ooh. Banner of Iron Resolve. Gives you the stubborn special. Ooh, I like it. We've got enchanted items of Wizarding Hat. The Flying Carpet. That's cool. Healing Potion. Wow. During the command subphase of the turn, the bearer of the healing potion can consume it. The model immediately recovers D3 lost wounds. That is very cool. Um, well, they got a lot of common like magic items now. This is great. Arcane items, wand of jet. You can apply a plus one modifier to any of your casting or dispel rolls. However, should they roll any natural double, uh, the wand of jet is destroyed. Oh, wow. Okay, we've got a law familiar. Uh, you do not generate your spells randomly. You choose which spells you want to know from your chosen law. That's cool, only 30 points. Very nice. Quick reference, turn summary. Each player's turn is split into four phases. The strategy, movement, shooting, and combat phases. Casting and dispelling spells. Casting a spell, to cast a spell, roll 2d6, and oh, this is, this is all you need. Why do they give us 300 plus pages of, of stuff? This is all you need, as well as those special rules. Dispel, a cast, dispelling a spell, when your opponent casts a spell, you can make a dispel attempt uh, to dispel a spell, roll 2d6. If, it's, if it's attempting a wizardly dispel, at the spelling a wizard's level. Uh, if the result is equal to or higher than the casting roll, the spell is dispelled. If a natural double six, the spell is dispelled regardless of the casting result. If a natural double one is rolled, the dispel attempt fails, roll on the miscast table. Wizardly dispel, a wizard that is not engaged in combat, is not fleeing, and is within range may be nominated to attempt a wizardly dispel. Level one and two wizards have a dispel range of 18 inches. Level three and four wizards have a dispel range of 24. Faded dispel, once per turn you may attempt a faded dispel. There is no range limit on uh, Beta dispel attempts. Woo! Can you make two dispel attempts? One wizardly and one faded? I don't know. Uh, miscast table, 2d6 results. Uh, yep, we have the miscast table. We've read that earlier. Mm -hmm. Uh, then we've got strategy phase. The strategy phase is broken up into several sub phase sub phases. Start of the turn, page one one six. Um, resolve any special actions or make any tests that need to be resolved or made at the start of the turn. Resolve any abilities of characters that are not fleeing. Conjuration wizards controlled by the active player can cast enchantment spells or hex spells. Rally fleeing troops, the active player attempts to rally their fleeing units, any that fail continue to flee. Movement, the movement phase is broken up into several sub phases, declare charges and charge reactions, the active players declares, declares charges indicating which of the units are charging and which enemy unit is being charged. The charging unit may must be able to draw line of sight uh, to the unit it wishes to charge. Units that are in a marching column engage in combat or fleeing combat cannot charge. Uh, standard charge reaction when charged, the unit can declare one of the several charge reactions. Hold the unit, stand, ground, receive the charge, stand and shoot. The unit fires its missile weapons, flee the unit fight directly away from the charging unit, pivot the unit about a sentences. After pivoting, the unit immediately makes a flee move. If it, a unit is already fleeing, it must declare this reaction. Charge moves to complete a charge. Determine the charge range, move charging unit. Uh, fair charge if the distance is insufficient. Uh, to reach the target, it's um, it's a failed charge. Charging a fleeing enemy when a char when charging a fleeing enemy, uh, if the charging unit makes contact with the fleeing unit, it's destroyed. If the charging doesn't make contact, it just moves its full charge range. All compulsory moves are made during the sub phase. Remaining moves 
marching, you can move up to double your movement triple if you're in a marching column. You may wheel to change direction but cannot perform any other maneuvers. If a unit wishes to march while within 8 inches of a, an enemy unit, they must first pass a leadership test maneuvers. During this movement, the unit may perform one of the following maneuvers. Wheel, turn, move backwards, move sideways, readjust the ranks or reform. Shooting phase. Choose unit and declare target. Roll to hit. Ballistic skill. You got a little table there. And then you got roll to wound and make armor saves. And you've got remove casualties and make panic tests. Misfire tables. There you go, you got a misfire. Stone throw a misfire table destroyed on a one. The, we the weapon cannot take the strain. Bits of wood and metal debris are thrown into the air and the stone tumbles to the ground. The mole is destroyed and removed from the play. That sucks. Our function, one of the crew has become caught in the firing mechanism. The problem can be fixed, but only partially by dismantling the weapon, the crew member, or both. The crew immediately loses one wound. Wow. One of the crew has become caught. <laughs> That's funny. The crew immediately loses one wound, the model fails to shoot this turn and cannot shoot before the end of the next round. Wow. Twain, something has snapped. This is a rather minor mishap, but one that will require plenty of elbow grease and strong language to repair. The model fails to shoot this turn, okay. Black powder misfire table destroyed. Mm -hmm. Weapon explodes with a thunderous noise, leaving a hole in the ground. The model is destroyed. Uh, malfunction, the charge misfires, terminally inconveniencing one of the crew and knocking the war machine over. It can be right, but it will take time. The crew immediately loses one wound. The model fails to shoot this turn and can't shoot the next turn. It's just the same. Five to six, pfft, the fuse has gone out. As far as mishaps go, it's not very serious, but one of the crew will not be fit. Yeah, it's the same. It's the same result. Stone throw or a black powder, it's the same result. Okay, combat phase, choose and fight combat. Um, choose combat and determine who can fight. Charging an enemy in their front arc. Yep, in their rear flank arc, roll to hit, roll to wound, make armor saves, remove casualties. Okay, follow up, uh, what casual, calculate combat result, break tests, follow up and pursuit, restrain and reform, Follow up pursuit overrun. If a unit is wiped out, its enemy at rate may overrun making by making a pursuit move directly forwards. It's the index. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's the index. Alright, look, we do not need to read the index, okay? Alright, there we go. It's done. It's done. Well, you know, I read, well, I cannot believe how much of this I actually read. In how many hours? How many hours is that? It's been like seven hours. Oh man, seven hours of reading. Ridiculous. Seven hours of reading. The time is 11.18. Um, whoa, okay. Look, I think uh, I'm done. I'm done. So. How far did I get? So I read all the way up until the end of movement. The movement section, which was page 100 and... There we go, on that, yep. And then go back to, okay, shooting, yeah, okay. So I read all the way up to page 135. <laughs> that is it. Page 135. That's how far I read. Um, the rest of it, I did not read it word for word. I just read uh, like the, the main titles, you know, bits and pieces, uh, just to get through it all. But there you go. Oh, because I am completely effed and cannot finish this book tonight. It's just absolute insanity. Oh, my book was damaged in the plane coming over here. That's kind of annoying. 
trying to fix it, but that's all right. It's still good. It's still a great book. Okay, there you go. Warhammer the Old World. Oh, the back cover. Let's read the back cover. It is a dark age, a bloody age, an age of strife and, of, and war, of chaos and sorcery, and amidst all the fire and fury, it is a time, too, of mighty heroes, of bold deeds and great courage. Warhammer the Old World is the game of fantasy battles. It is a game unlike any other in which you command mighty armies of painted citadel miniatures, relying upon your tactical ingenuity to achieve victory. This book contains the information you need to get started in this engaging and engrossing pastime and to become the conquering general of a fantasy army. The World of Legend, a comprehensive history of the Warhammer world and an introduction to the many races and armies that wage eternal war for dominance over it. The core rules from the general principles through the movement and manoeuvre to unleashing hails of arrows at your foe and finally smashing your enemies aside in deadly close combat. The advanced rules, rules for rare and potent troops such as war machines, chariots, monsters and mighty heroes, each adding ever more depth to your games, realms of magic an explanation of the winds of magic and rules for we wielding a wide range of devastating and devious spells. Armies of the Old World, a showcase of beautifully painted armies from the talented painters of the world famous heavy metal team. Well, they're still around, huh? Warhammer Battlefields, rules for organizing your collection of painted models into an army and for setting up the battlefields in which your armies will wage war. Printed in China and distributed by Games Workshop Limited. Willow Road, Nottingham, NG7, 2WS UK, European Address Games Workshop Limited, Irish Branch Unit 3, Lower Lippy Street, Dublin 1, D01, K199, Ireland, designed in the UK, English language, Citadel Miniatures, Forge World Miniatures, Warhammer.com. <laughs> and we're not going to read the barcode on the back. Oh, wow. We're done. If you have survived to the end of this video or just skip to the end of the video, whatever, thanks for being here guys. Thanks for watching this. We will be bringing some epic narrated old world battle reports to this channel, just like I used to do with the fantasy reports. So stay tuned. I'll be making a video about the future of this channel and the plans we have and all those sort of things, okay? All right, see you in the next one. Let me hit that record button. We're done. Good night.